The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. I'd like to call this Tampa City Council meeting to order. If we could have roll call, please. Carlson. Hertek. Here. Clindenin. Here. Henderson. Present. Vieira. Here. Miranda. Here. Meniscalco. Here. We have a physical quorum. All right. Uh, to begin, I have a memo from Councilmember Carlson's office that he will not be present for this evening's hearing. Uh, we received and filed that memo this morning. Do I have to do it again? Uh, so getting a motion second. to receive and follow the memo from Councilmember Vieira, second from Councilmember Moran. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Ms. Doc, we have to do some cleaning here. So please yes, silence good. your cell phones. Good evening, Chairman and Council, LaShawn Doc Development Coordination. And if I may clear the agenda for this evening. Um, item number one is TA CPA 2228. The applicant is requesting a continuance of this item to July 20th, 2023. So at 501 p.m. All right. We have a yes, Mr. Shelby. Uh, I don't know if there's anyone here who, who needs to speak to that continuance. If you could so inquire, we could find out. If All right. Is. is there anybody that wishes to speak on the continuance of item number one? And again, that date and time, please. To July 20th, 2023 at 501 p.m., please. Anybody here to speak on the continuance only? Hearing none, may I have a motion? Uh, we have a motion from Councilmember Vieira, second from Councilmember Miranda. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, item number if two. I'm, if I can, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. Yes. Martin Shelby, City Council Attorney. Just a reminder to those people who might be interested in that, um, um, that is uh, the only notice you will be receiving uh, of that uh, date, again, July 20th, 2023, 5.01 p.m. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Council. The next item to clear from the agenda is item number two, which is REZ 2276. Um, the applicant is requesting a continuance of this item to um, August 17th. Okay. We have uh, the applicant here. If the applicant wishes to say anything. Uh, good evening, Council. We need time to review and uh, revise our site plan, 
and it also requires an additional DRC with city staff. So the city staff has given us the date, uh, estimated date of, of August 17th, so we can go back, have the DRC, make the corrections, and then bring it back to council. We also would need you to waive the 180-day uh, time <coughs> limit that's uh, associated with this petition. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments? I hear and see none. Do we have anybody in the public that wishes to speak on item number two? This is for the continuance only. No, it's not quite. Wait, wait. Uh, if you are going to speak on, well. Yeah, so this one should be open, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Let's, they they uh, all should make, be open, frankly. Make a motion to open so items moved. one through eight. Motion for <coughs> Council Member Vieira, second from. Council second. Member, Council Member Miranda, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, since this is uh, quasi-judicial, um, if you could please raise your right hand, those that are going to speak, we'll swear you in. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear? All right, anybody that's going to speak on the, uh, anything on the agenda, we're going to do this a, a few times tonight because there's so many people, but please stand, raise your right hand. Yes. It's non yeah. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth and nothing but the truth? Yeah. All right. First uh, speaker for public comment. Do you need me to restate the request? Well, after public comment. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, City Council. My name is Sandy De Diego Sanchez, and I'm the um, Vice President of the Army Gardens Civic Association. And this proposed building is within the Armory Gardens District. I have to say that I am perplexed. How can this agent continually be allowed to delay, delay hearings? I understand a delay for medical reasons, but I do not understand a delay when the agent and the other people in his firm are not paying attention to what's going on within this file. There are three certified agents assigned to this property, to this rezoning. The firm disrespects the city council and they disrespect the neighborhoods, not just Armory Gardens. City staff has put more than 100 hours between his first design, the second design, the one that's before you now, and now he's going to go for a third design. How much money has he caused the land development department to spend uselessly because his firm is not paying attention? The agent and his partners have been in business for decades. They know about the waivers, they're required, they know about the inconsistent issues on Early on, the city, city staff marks them in red on the site plans. There are issues within the file that shows if there's an issue with waste management, transportation, or any other issues. They're in different memos, memos but on the site plan throughout the Isella the whole time. If I hadn't run into someone at the grocery store yesterday afternoon, I wouldn't known about this continuance. I had to stop 14 people from coming down here. That was the potential of being maybe seven parking tickets that needed to be paid. I put out $150 just for color prints to do this presentation. Besides the waste of our time, we would have incurred all these expenses, and it is not the money, but it is the inconvenience and the disrespect from this agent. Maybe if the agent was required to pay back the salary expenses the city has incurred on this project, and the community expenses, he might be more alert. His business and his district set for someone else's money might help him understand the inconvenience that he caused. What if he had had to reimburse the 25 or 50 people that came in here tonight for something else? The fact is, he has the audacity to request the 180-day restriction waiver. It shows his attitude of entitlement. He continues to disrespect this council. Please do not waive this penalty. If the agent doesn't like the penalty, then let him withdraw and come back in 180 days. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Hey, good evening. My name is Stephanie Pointer. Um, I concur with Sandy. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm a little concerned about this because at least a year ago, I need to go back and find it. Carol Ann Bennett asked 
for please, city uh, council. Wait, Sorry. we can't see it on the monitor. Oh, please, yes, please show okay, it. Go ahead. This is in the last, uh, what, four or five months? The eight, con eight continuances. One missed notice from somebody who's been doing this most of my life since I was an adult. Um, but I'd like to point out that about a year ago, maybe even more, Carol Ann Bennett called in and she said, I'd like to see us see a 72 hour continuance request. And Abby Feely and Ryan Manassi was still working here then, so that, that's kind of an indicator. They came up here later and said, we'd like to see it be a week. I have to agree. If we are last minute Lucy's on everything, and every time we, have, we ask for a continuance, I mean, really, that, do we, are we supposed to never have a life? There's money being paid on that end, but our staff have reported a staff report. They've, they've prepared a staff report. You all have read those staff reports. Everybody's time has been wasted over and over and over again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else for public comment? All right, sir, do you have any uh, rebuttal or response before we make the motion? Um, council, with, with all due respect, we were working with the staff up until the last minute, and it was the staff who determined that we could not go forward because the changes could not be made between first and second reading without going back to DRC. Um, and we were only advised of that this week, and that's when I filed the letter of request for a continuance. So as soon as we knew, uh, we filed the request, and I respectfully request that we be reset, and the staff was the one who gave us a date. It said it was August 17th, um, and that we had to waive the 180 days. So we respectfully request that you provide that opportunity for us. Thank you. Council Member Hurtak. Um, Ms. Dock, can you talk to us about that? Yes, thank you, Council LaShawn, Doc Development Coordination. So this item um, was set for, of course, hearing today. The applicant um, contacted me um, last week and stated that they wanted to make certain changes to the site plan to address certain overlay requirements. The changes that were desired to be made cannot be made between first and second reading. So that was expressed to the applicant. The applicant then at that time decided that they would request the continuance. Um, so that way, they, the changes will require another DRC, the changes to be made. So it was at that time that the applicant decided to request a continuance. So it was either the case would move forward the way it is presented with the report that you have before you, or the applicant requests a continuance to go to DRC again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? <coughs> no. Yes, sir. Mr. Michelini. Uh, no, thank you, Council. We, we've been working with the staff and uh, just realized that we couldn't make the changes between first and second reading. So it wasn't a last minute thing. It's, we tried to make the changes and we were told we couldn't make them until we go back to the city DRC. So we respectfully request your indulgence on this one. Thank, thank you. you very much. What is the pleasure of Council? Yes, sir. Um, <coughs> I, I just out of curiosity, and, and, and you'll, if you'll indulge me uh, in this regard, um, how many folks here came here specifically for this item number two it, by raise of hands? Excuse me, but the 14 no. people, I uh, called them off. No, it, and, and, and thank you, Ms. Sanchez. And that's, I just wanted to make sure that people weren't here uh, who, who um, uh, uh, didn't, didn't find out about the continuance that, cause, and, and thank you for that. I, I, I appreciate that. No, just out of curiosity. Thank you. Yes, sir. Councilman Clendon. Ms. Scott, so if this motion tonight failed and the changes can't be made between first and second reading, what are the, the uh, applicant's options? So yes, LaShawn Doc Development Coordination. The um, application could be heard tonight if it is the decision of council. Um, it will be presented as you have before you in the site plan and the staff report provided to you. or it would be continued. Um, so let me step back a moment. If it is heard tonight, the way it is presented, and the applicant wanted to make the changes they desire to be made, it would come back to you again for first reading. 
do it. We would hear the case tonight. Instead of the next case being the second reading, it would become the first reading again. And then we'd have the second reading. Anybody else? Okay, thank you. What is the pleasure of counsel? Is there a motion? <coughs> motion to grant the continuance or not? If I may ask a question um, uh, to uh, Mr. Shelby, what, what are the legal standards so for purposes of the public and ourselves we're dealing with here? <clears throat> Excuse me, in terms of the applicant, equity given to the applicant versus uh, those individuals who have spoken the legal standards, if, if, if they go forward and somehow they suffer allegedly prejudice, whatever, you could advise us of that. Well, clearly you've been informed that the applicant wishes to make changes, so at some point in time, what you're hearing is not, in effect, what would be actually something that is requested ultimately by the applicant. That would affect the course of the hearing, obviously. So what you'd spend, if you, would, if you were to hear it tonight, what you'd be hearing is not, is not what would be coming, and, and you've already been told yeah. that. The other thing is, the, other, the only other option, and, and Ms. Doc didn't mention it, is rather than go through that process, that the other option is to withdraw it, but then that also delays things and it requires an additional filing fee. And what this does is it allows them to go through the design review. This is something that if council wishes to, from a policy perspective, we can discuss this at a later date. It's not appropriate at this time, um, but obviously um, my recommendation uh, clearly is you would not be hearing the case that would ultimately be coming back again in some form or fashion. So I would recommend at this time, I believe this is the first continuance. Is that correct, Mr. Michelini? Uh, Ms. Doc? Ms. Doc? That's correct. Yeah. Oh. I, one of yeah. the things, let me just add this. We didn't want to have a first reading, make changes, and then come back and have another first reading. So we were trying to save the council three hearings instead of, instead of two uh, in the event that the project was approved. And if I may, Mr. Chair? Yes. Yeah, and, and again, and I asked that of Mr. Shell because I, I always on these situations, and I and I, I, I understand, um, you know, sentiments expressed, things like that. I'm, I'm, I'm very understanding of that, et cetera. But I always like to go with um, the uh, uh, objective standards that we have set by our council and whatnot. But thank you. Also, one, one other thing, Mr. Chairman, council recently um, uh, changed its rules to allow for an automatic continuance for a first reading, but that presupposes that they get the information in time to be able to have that decision made to be able to present it to council and then therefore it would be count, uh, granted as a matter of right if it was able to make that deadline, Thank just for future you. reference. Thank you very much. Anybody wish to make a motion? I'll make that motion. The motion is to continue from council member Vier. Do we have a second? Second. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that. We'll, it's going to be August uh, 17th at 5.01 p.m. And again, again, to members of the public, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, that that is the notice that you will be receiving. There will be no additional. Oh, actually, that's a question. But no, that being August, it's about three months away, um, unless council sees a reason to, to, to re-notice it, to incur the cost and time of re-noticing. This would be the notice at this time that the public would receive for the date and time of the continuance. Yes, ma'am. See, that's the part I'm not okay with not recontinuing it or not re-noticing because I feel like the public um, really should be, should, should get more notice. Yeah. Um, Wait, so I, so I would. Can we stop wasting so much time on continuances? We have a very busy night. Thank I, you. I, and and I, if, may I, if I may, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, with, uh, and I'm sorry, and I in effect interrupted you. Go ahead. Yes, go ahead. I, go ahead. Um, so I would uh, just, I would like to add to an amend to say, yes, we'll continue. However, mm -hmm. we are going to ask for the applicant to re-notice. I have fine. no objection. We, See, we, have, we have no objection. Excellent. Have, that's there so, you go. You, I, it's incorporated 100%. Mm -hmm. Mr. Shelby. Yes, and that also as part of your motion, please include the waiver of the 180-day requirement. Yes. Thank uh, you. Councilwoman Hurtak's request, which was very wise and made your suggestion. And, um, and Mr. Michelini, you have agreed to the re-notice. Yes. Yeah, so we didn't expect the date to be so far off, uh, except your other agendas are full. And so, you know, it wasn't that we were trying to push it so far out that no one would know. And we have no objection whatsoever to re-noticing. So we have a motion from Councilmember Vieira to continue this to August 17th at 5.01 p.m with the 180-day waiver and that the applicant will be re-noticing. Do we have a second? Second. second. 
We have a second from Council Member Clendenin. All in favor? Uh -huh. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you thank, very much. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Item number eight. Um, yes, the next item to clear from the agenda is item eight, which is REZ 2313. This case is a missed notice, and if this could be removed from the agenda. Move to remove. We have second. a motion to remove item number eight from the agenda. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Council Member Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much. Yes, Thank sir. you, Council. Um, might I recommend uh, that to sort of help the public and us, instead of clapping tonight, there's another strategy people using of snapping does not interrupt as much. Greatly appreciate. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Item number three. Yes, Council. LaShawn, Doc Development Coordination. And so our first item. I'm sorry. I'm no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want to be able to say, Council, at the outset of tonight's meetings, I just want to, hearings, I'm sorry, to remind you of the uh, requirement to disclose any ex parte oh. communications before the start <coughs> of each hearing. I'll make so, sure to ask. And then, and then the reason for that is the opportunity for uh, all parties to know about that during the course of the hearing and respond to it if necessary. So I would ask that you do that and also at this time to receive and file all written communications which have been made available for public inspection um, to be entered into the, the uh, record received and filed at this time. Do we have a motion to receive and file all written <coughs> communications? Motion from Councilmember Hertag. Do we have a second? Second from Councilmember Miranda. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. Anything else, sir? For item number three, as we're about to hear, if there's any disclosures for ex parte communications, to please disclose them now. Does anybody have any ex parte communications? Councilmember Vieira. Yes, sir. Um, I la Yesterday evening, I, I received a text, which I immediately turned over, from a gentleman by the name of David Berman, who's a very nice gentleman on this, um, on this item. And I uh, sent it on over, and it's been disclosed. I don't know if. And do you wish? to be able to say what the sum and substance of that sure. communication uh, is? Sure. As I recall, I saw it very, I was at a concert late last night. And uh, it was fun. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, it was encouraging me to support it. And I responded that I cannot substantively engage with you as this is a quasi-judicial matter. I wish you well. And I'm sending this over to the city. And that's Thank you. it. Um, and, and one last thing, and maybe I, I'm, I don't want to um, be too cautious, so to speak, but it's good, which is number one, I believe Ms. Mandel is going to be the counsel for the applicant. I want to disclose that she's my counsel uh, on the HART board, uh, just for purposes of the public. And I see Chris Berg here, who's also involved, he used to be my legislative aide. I just, I don't think that's a conflict, but I just do that in the spirit of openness. And just, I'd ask you, just for the purposes of the record, with that being disclosed, can you be fair and impartial? Absolutely. Will you be fair and impartial, and will you base your decision on the evidence in the yes, record? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Yes, sir. Mr. Clin Councilman Clinton. I have uh, several disclosures. One, um, I have several close personal acquaintances that are um, part of this hearing tonight, and I believe they'll probably be testifying this evening. Uh, one is a, a two are neighbors of mine, uh, and coming out of a hotly contested campaign, uh, I, I was on both sides of this issue. I have many supporters on both sides of this issue that we've had these discussions in the past prior to being elected at city council. And during the campaign, I attended a meeting at the Garden Club where this was an issue of that meeting. And yes, I can stay fair and impartial during the course of this meeting. Yes, sir. Councilman Moran. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. In, in my case, I have uh, told my aide some time back that if you see a name that you think was going to appear before me and they want to meet with me, now I've had some requests in the past and I've told them I don't meet with no one that's got anything <coughs> coming. I don't want to raise my white hand and say something and maybe forget something that was said, then we got a problem. So I'm, some are here now and some may not be here, uh, but uh, mostly are the presenters and some of the neighbors, so I just don't meet with you on anything that's coming up even before it's filed. So get that known that I will not meet with anyone on one side or the other side. I've already said that to the eight. Thank you very much. That takes care of all the hand raising and the confessions that are not needed at times. Thank you. Anybody else? No. All right. Do you need a motion for anything else? No? We're good? All right. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Council LaShawn Doc Development Coordination. And our first item this evening is item number three, which is REZ 2293. This is for the property located at 2713 Bayshore Boulevard. Um, the applicant is being represented by Julia Mandel. And the request is to rezone the property from PD, a place of religious assembly, 
um, which was approved in 2005, to PD, residential multifamily, and place of religious assembly. Um, and before I turn it over to the Planning Commission to give their report, I just want to provide the background um, just for the benefit of council and for the public. Um, so initially this application was submitted and it was um, submitted with a um, companion comprehensive plan amendment. That plan amendment um, was a request for the um, future land use designation of R50. So on December 1st, 2022, both cases were continued to January 12th, 2023. At the January 12th public hearing, Tampa City Council remanded the CPA back to Planning Commission. This rezoning case was never opened and both cases were continued to June 8th, 2023 to the Tampa City Council public hearing. On February 2nd, 2023, the applicant withdrew the comprehensive plan amendment request. The applicant completed public notice again and the rezoning case was set for hearing on today's date on May 11th, 2023. The applicant is no longer requesting a comprehensive plan amendment and is moving forward with the rezoning with consideration with the future land use which exists on the site, which is R35, residential 35. And with that, Council, I just want to give a brief background on the case. I'm going to turn it over to Danny with the Planning Commission to give his report, and then I'll come back and give my report. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, this is Danny Collins with your Planning Commission staff. Our first case is in the South uh, Tampa Planning District and more specifically in the Bayshore Gardens neighborhood. <clears throat> Fredball Park is the closest public recreation facility located one block north of the subject site. This portion of Bayshore Boulevard is served by Heart Route 14. The route provides service to the Britton Plaza and the Yukon Transfer Center. The subject site is within the Colsa Izzard area and it's within the Level A evacuation zone. We, uh, okay. Sorry, we couldn't see it for a moment. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> here is an aerial map of the subject site and the surrounding properties. You'll see the subject site is outlined in this purple color. It is at the uh, northwest corner of West Barcelona Street and Bayshore Boulevard. Bayshore Boulevard runs along eastern portion of the site. Um, there are uh, single family attached uh, residential uses directly to the south of the site as well as um, to the, uh, the west and northwest of the site. Um, there is an apartment uh, unit uh, complex uh, to the north of the site. Um, and then you have some uh, rec open space <coughs> um, just to the north of the subject site. Um, there are um, towers, residential towers, up along uh, Bayshore Boulevard. And then over um, one couple blocks south of the subject site, um, you have some uh, non-residential uses just off Bayshore Boulevard. <coughs> Here is the adopted future land use map. Um, the adopted future land use is residential 35. Um, it's, uh, it allows for consideration of medium, uh, medium density uses, uh, including multifamily, um, single family attached uses, and as well as uh, detached single family uses. Um, uh, churches, uh, such as uh, what is be, was currently on the site can be considered in that designation. Um, directly to the north uh, and south of the subject site is that residential 35. Um, you have R83, which is a heavy, um, is a high density uh, residential land use category directly to the north, um, northwest of the site. And then you have some CME 35 designated parcels um, to the west and southwest of the subject site. Um, that category um, encourages a mixed use development pattern. Um, the Planning Commission staff reviewed the application and found the, the request comparable and compatible with the surrounding area. Residential 35 designated parcels are generally north of West Beta Bay Boulevard, east of South Isabella Avenue, and south of Rubidex Street. This is the existing density of these R35 designated parcels is 14.27 dwelling units per acre, and that's based on 15 sample sites. Um, this density is 40% of the density anticipated under the R35 designation. Approximately 4.7 acres uh, to the west and northwest of the subject site our parcels, um, our parcels designate a residential 83. This area has an existing density of 16.12 dwelling units per acre, and that's based on five sample sites, or 19% of the density that's anticipated under the residential 83 designation. Given the density and, t and intensity anticipated in this area of the city, the surrounding area can be considered underdeveloped. 
Um, additionally, there are several towers, towers within proximity of the site um, along on Bayshore Boulevard. Um, the Bayshore Presbyterian Apartments, a 15-story multifamily development, is also to the west and northwest of the site on South Isabella Avenue. There are sev several 15- and 18-story towers near the subject site along uh, Bayshore Boulevard and several tower, taller structures north of the subject site on Bayshore Boulevard. <coughs> Planning Commission staff finds that the request will not alter the character of the surrounding area. The comprehensive plan seeks to promote uh, pedestrian connectivity along Bayshore Boulevard. Sidewalks are provided along all Jason public rights of way and a pedestrian connection is provided from the main lobby um, of the apartment building uh, to the sidewalk on Isabella Avenue. Additionally, the applicant proposes internal pedestrian connections and a crosswalk from the place of religious assembly entrance to the sidewalk, um, to the sidewalk on um, Barcelona Street. Though the proposed pedestrian connections will help ensure pedestrian safety and accessibility, there is a proposed security fence that runs along the east boundary and a portion of the southern boundary of the site. The applicant should ensure that gates are provided where any sidewalks and fences meet to ensure the place of religious assembly is accessible to, to pedestrians. Um, the request supports many of the policies in the comprehensive plan as it relates to housing the city's population. As stated previously uh, in our report, uh, the surrounding areas developed uh, well below the density anticipated in this area of the city. The Tampa Comprehensive Plan encourages new housing on vacant and underutilized land to ensure an adequate supply of housing is available to meet the needs of Tampa's present and future populations. The request will provide additional housing choices in the Bayshore Gardens neighborhood. <clears throat> Finally, the subject site is within the coastal hazard area and the coastal planning area, specifically evacuation zone A. As such, the applicant must uh, work with the City of Tampa and other regulatory agencies to ensure any residential development mitigates its impact on shelter space during the development review process. Based on the above considerations, the Planning Commission staff finds the request consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies of the City of Tampa Comprehensive Plan. That concludes my presentation. I'm available for any questions. Any questions for the gentleman? No? Nope. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am? Thank you again, Council LaShawn, Doc Development Coordination. And this item, Council, which is um, REZ 2293, this PD request will allow for the existing place of religious assembly um, to remain on site. And it um, also includes a 50 unit residential um, multifamily um, tower, which will be constructed. So the site plan identifies on the site the existing temple, which contains 18,014 square feet. Um, it was built in 1969. The temple building will remain in its current location and a new residential um, multifamily structure is proposed along the west of the site, um, which I'll um, show you shortly on the site plan provided. The proposed residential tower contains structured parking on levels one through three. Amenities are provided on level four, um, including a health club, game room, business center, pool, spa, and lounge, and residential units are um, provided on levels five through 29. The proposed maximum building height is 329 feet. Um, the existing temple will remain at its current height, um, which is at a maximum height of 30 feet. Um, the, par the proposed uses require 167 parking spaces and 201 parking spaces are proposed. The site um, has a future land use designation, as Danny has mentioned earlier, of the um, R35, residential 35, which allows up to 30 dwelling units per acre, or up to 35 dwelling units per acre with a bonus agreement. Um, the applicant has entered into a bonus agreement to provide the um, additional seven <coughs> units on site, um, given the size of the property. So the bonus provision agreement and the amount of $144,480 is paid in order to achieve the additional unit count and to come in with the existing residential 35 land use category. And what I'd like to do, Council, is put up for you on the ELMO the actual site plan. I'm going to zoom in a little. This is too far. Hold on just a second. Just to show you the development. So on the site plan, this is Bayshore. This is Bayshore Boulevard. This is Barcelona Street. This is Isabella Avenue. So this is the north. So this is the existing temple building on site. That's the footprint of that temple building. This is parking proposed. So one um, point of entry, um, vehicular entry on the site is from Barcelona. And you would enter this way. And there's surface parking that's located here and parking located here. And then you can also access the site on the west where there is a circular drive and arrival. 
The residential building is located here on the site within that location. Here are the existing elevations for the site. I'll show you the top. So this is um, the um, elevations that you will see provided. Let me zoom in a little bit on it. And then this is also the other elevations, the other side. And then let me show you also the zoning atlas, the zoning map for the site. So this is an aerial of the site. The site is outlined in red. And this is the existing PD. Um, and you can see just located just south of the site, you have your residential 75, your residential multifamily zoning further south. You have um, southwest of the site, um, a few PDs. And then you have um, CG and residential multifamily zoning, which continues north to the west and northwest of the site. And then north is your residential single family zone. Um, this is the site which is located here along Bayshore. Um, so you can see the different um, zoning districts that surround the site itself. Then I have pictures of the site to show along with the surrounding areas. So this is the site on Bayshore. Let me zoom out a little because some of the pictures are a bit larger. So this is actually the entrance of the site as it currently exists. This is another view inside the site. This is the parking which um, exists for the site. This is another view. This shows looking north within the site. This is west of the site. This is on Barcelona. This is the view um, looking northeast on Isabella. This is the residential multifamily that exists um, west of the site. This is north of the site, the Garden Club. This is north of the site. This is as you move further north. This is the park, Fred Ball Park. This is um, directly south of the site. Um, you can see the property line jogs along the south, and so that is directly to the south. And then this is also south. This is across Barcelona. This is southwest of the site. This is at the corner of Barcelona. And this is um, also south. This is at Santiago. And one last picture, this is south of the site. Um, this is at Beta Bay, just to give you an idea. The development review and compliance staff reviewed the request and found the request inconsistent. Um, you'll see within the report the findings of inconsistent um, relating to the um, natural resources um, waivers requested on site. So what I'd like to do um, for a moment, Council, is just to Turn it over, let Jonathan Scott with transportation just review a couple of things related to transportation. Although they do not have a finding of inconsistent, it's just to put on the record some of the things that they have reviewed with this application request. Then I'll turn it over to Erin, um, and she'll come up and report to you her findings from Natural Resources. <coughs> After which time, staff is available for any questions you may have, Council. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Good evening, Jonathan Scott, Transportation Planning. <coughs> transportation found it uh, consistent. Um, we reviewed the application. It did not require a traffic analysis. The applicant did provide a traffic memo, which provides trip generation information. The project actually results in a decrease of traffic based on ITU standards, which stands for the Institute of Transportation Engineers. Now, that was based on the approved use of a daycare and religious assembly and the proposed use of multifamily. Now the access for this site has been previously approved for the religious assembly and the new use of the multifamily does not require a waiver uh, since it's residential. So the existing use for the date for the uh, religious assembly is existing and then the new proposed use, the new local street access is not uh, required for that. Just to, let you all know that. And I'll turn it over to Erin to cover the natural resources.
Good evening, everyone. Aaron Mayer, Development Coordination. Uh, I'm going to go over some of the issues with items related to the natural resources finding of inconsistent. So here before you on the overhead is the site. Um, I'm just going to call out again. So here to the east is Bayshore. Up to the north property line is the is the Tampa Bay Gar the Tampa Garden Club. To the west is Isabella, and the south here is Barcelona. <clears throat> And this is the existing temple right here, and this is the proposed new multifamily building. <coughs> so here, these red circles with X's in the center are depicting the proposed non-hazardous grand tree removals right here. There are three of them, um, and they are all within the existing parking area right now. And then there is one, the green circle over here along Bayshore is a grand live oak that is uh, proposed to be retained a non-hazardous grand live oak. <clears throat> so on this image, I'm going to show you just some of these, some of the trees that are being proposed to be removed. So you're, we're looking southeast at the site, and you can see the Hillsborough Bay in the background here. Um, you can see tree number 36 is a 50-inch DBH uh, live oak, rated C4 and worth 14 mitigation trees, and just for new council members, the the better, the like an A is the best rated tree, which you almost never see. And the lower the number, the better. So um, this is a C4. So that's a, it's a good condition tree. Um, just to the southwest of that is tree number 38. It's a 35 inch uh, DBH, which is diameter at breast height as well. Rated B5, it's a live oak and it is worth 22 mitigation trees. So the three grand trees proposed for removal require 49 type one mitigation trees. Um, and there's little area on the site to accommodate all of these large and wide canopy shade trees. Uh, Natural Resources has requested an additional grand live oak to be preserved. Um, the applicant has not redesigned the structure to accommodate an additional grand tree and has submitted, it, submitted reasonable reconfiguration to support the removal. Uh, and in, in addition to the Grand Trees waiver, this is, this is the Dark Moss Arborist Inventory, and um, the waiver requested is to, re to retain 20% of the trees on site. Uh, the code requires a 50% tree retention for a non-wooded lot over one acre. Uh, most of the trees to be preserved are found down here in the southeastern corner of the site, which are no construction is taking place. The parking lot and the driveway are being realigned along Barcelona, uh, which is requiring some of these removals of grand trees and, um, and some different reconfigurations of the parking lot. So back to the site plan, I also just want to point out up here, this is a proposed retained tree. So this is a 30 inch shared a uh, 30 inch diameter um, at breast height live oak and it's a shared tree with the garden club so we were a little concerned initially that this was going to be a great impact to this tree so natural resources requested additional information the applicant they they provided additional information they submitted a tree preservation plan and a shade study which perhaps their arborist uh, may speak to um, and they, they have included, they are going to encroach in the, into the tree's protective radius by five feet, which is allowed by code to use alternate construction methods. Uh, they have proposed to place um, the parking lot on the bottom floor on grade and use permeable material to encroach that far. And they've also notched out the building on the second floor to accommodate the crown of the tree. And then let me just show you so this is, um, this is tree 75. This is the shared 30 inch DBH live oak, which is two inches less than a grand tree by the city's code. So it's, it's a large tree, um, but you can see, so this is facing south, um, looking like from the garden club south. And then to the right, the photo on the right is looking east and you can see there is um, some crown, you, the crown extends here it will require some minor pruning to accommodate the building. Um, and 
this is currently like where the buffer will be placed. So, um, yeah, so in summary, Natural Resources has found the project inconsistent due to the grand tree waivers and the tree retention requested. And if you have any questions, I'm here for you. Thank you very much. Any questions from council members? I see none. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Now to the applicant. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have questions. For, actually, you know, I'll wait till the. Okay. Good evening, Council. Uh, for the record, my name is Julie Mandel with the law firm of Gray Robinson, uh, 327 uh, East Jackson Street, Tampa, Florida. Um, I'm uh, happy to be here tonight. I'm glad to bring you a real easy case so that you can enjoy your evening. Um, but no, in all, in all candor, congratulations to all the new council members. And, and yes, this is an emotional case. And I just want to say on the outset that I have had an opportunity to speak with many of the folks in this room. And um, all conversations have been consistently respectful. And we may not agree, but, but I, I do appreciate everybody's work and, and, and what they put into this. I have a PowerPoint. I, I'm terrible at PowerPoint, so we'll see how this goes. But um, <laughs> it's on the screen, so you can very good. Uh, staff did a nice job presenting the case, so I, I won't get into too many details. But I do think one of the most important things to understand about this this matter it, it is a little bit different than many of the other cases you see. This is this is a partnership for development. This is an opportunity to retain. Uh, the synagogue, Road of Shalom, on this site while still allowing a development potential that it has under its current comprehensive plan. As I said, this is a partnership for development. Um, what we're seeking as part of this application is to retain the synagogue as well as develop uh, a condominium tower, a luxury condominium tower limited to 50 units. Uh, this will provide some financial support to the synagogue. Certainly, um, a lot of these cultural institutions have gone through an era where they don't necessarily have the same resources as they used to. Congregation Road of oh, uh, before, before I get into that, I do want to make a statement for the record as it relates to the height, because there was some confusion over the height. Uh, when we submitted the site plan, the site plan showed a, a top of building height of 329, and that is the height of the building. It also accommodated for the mechanical uh, structures that you typically see on a roof. Um, we re really should have not had that on the site plan because there's a, a code provision that relates to that, and it needs to fall under the code. That change, if we get there, will be made between first and second reading to clarify that. But I did want to make that statement for the record so that everybody understands that the top of this building and the height is limited to 329 feet. As I've said, this is, this is a, a partnership, and we have, this has really been a close relationship between my client, the related group, as well as Congregation Road of Shalom. I'm gonna ask at this point that uh, Lloyd Stern, who is the president of Congregation Road of Shalom, uh, come up and kind of explain how we got to this point of seeking this development approval. Will this gentleman be speaking now? As now, well at public he's, no, now. he's speaking oh, he's as part, part of, the of the case and part of the presentation. And just so you know, I'm not asking for any additional time. You get to hear from a lot of people. Thank tonight. you very much. Yes, sir. Lloyd Stern, um, 22351 Turkey Rose, Lander Lakes, Florida. Uh, good evening, members of Tampa City Council. My name is Lloyd Stern. I'm the current president of Congregation Road of Shalom where my family have been members for over 30 years. I stand before you today to speak about the importance of the sale of our parking lot and construction of Relays Towers in the par Tower in the parking lot of Congregation Road of Shalom, the oldest conservative synagogue in Tampa Bay and, only, and the only one in South Tampa. Before I tell you about the importance of this land sale as it relates to the future, let me share with you a little about the importance of the Jewish community in the interwoven fabric of Tampa. Tampa has a very rich Jewish heritage going back to the 1800s with familiar names such as Oppenheimer, Wolf, and the Wall families who were all very successful Jewish merchants and key members of the community in Tampa Bay's early years. Rudder Shalom was established in Tampa, Florida in 1903 and this year we're marking our 120th birthday. Our first building was in Ybor City on Palm Avenue. Ybor was home to over 30 Jewish merchants and a synagogue on Palm Avenue that Rodolf called home for 30 years. 
as the congregation's needs grew, a more permanent home was needed. We found the land on 2713 Bayshore Boulevard and built our new spiritual home in 1969. The same year, the Garden Club, our neighbor, first occupied their building next door. Rodef and the Garden Club have continued to have a great relationship <coughs> with the sharing of each other's parking lots as needed. Part of the intention of the sale is to sell the parking lot that is next door to their parking lot so we have funds for major repairs in the future and do not have to sell our property in years to come. By developing where Related is proposing to build, it will guarantee that a large structure will never be built next to the gardens <coughs> of the Garden Club, therefore protecting the Garden Club, since Rodef has agreed in writing to never build anything larger than the existing footprint and same height where the synagogue sits today. Rodef is proud of many things from our past to our present and with the right decisions for our future. We were proud when we were early to embrace both equality for men, women within Judaism, with Bernice Wolf becoming our first female president over 30 years ago. We are also proud of being home for many people that not only identify as Jewish, but also identify as LGBTQ, Hispanic, Black, just to name a few. Rodef continues to be home for people that want to worship together, mourn together, and celebrate many simchas, which are joyous events, together. <coughs> we are proud of our community work that includes cleaning up the bay, supporting the hungry with meals on holidays, and the high tea, which brings women together of many different faiths and backgrounds at Rodef every year. Hundreds of thousands of people drive by every year and see our building with our large menorah 30 feet in the air as a beacon of vibrancy of Judaism in Tampa. We hope with the money realized from this land sale that this beacon shines bright for hundreds of years to come. Please join me and many other members of the community in supporting this important project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Before I get back into my presentation, can you let me know how much time there is remaining? Oh, eight minutes. Okay, very good. Thank you. If we can go back to the PowerPoint, I'm going to uh, try and get through these pretty quick because I think um, you have a lot of the information as it relates to the project. This is the current configuration showing the preschool temple in the parking lot. This is the proposed configuration, and I think it's important to note that the synagogue is using both its existing structure and the first uh, floor of the parking for its parking needs so that we won't have uh, an issue with parking for the synagogue. This is uh, uh, showing the amenity deck, and I think that, that a couple things to note, especially as it relates to its um, a view of the garden club, which I know is an issue. Uh, this amenity deck is about 45 feet, so directly next door to the, proper, to the garden club property rises up 45 feet, at, uh, approximately 45 feet, and then it shrinks in. And when you, where you see the, the, the remainder of the amenity deck that shows uh, the area for the gym and all of that, that's where the tower is. So it's slimmed down and it moves up. It is, the tower portion is approximately 43 feet from the property of the Garden Club, and it all faces to Bayshore. We have many site enhancements, one of them being that we are set back as far as we can, both from Bayshore and from the Garden Club. We are improving and adding additional, uh, a tremendous amount of additional landscaping on the, on the uh, pedestrian access points and, and beautifying the sidewalk areas. I know that that's an important issue for this neighborhood that doesn't necessarily have the best uh, views of walking. As you've heard from Jonathan Scott, this actually will decrease uh, traffic according to the ITE. I know that that's always hard to imagine for the neighbors, but the technicality is, is that you're replacing a, a daycare with 120 students with a 50 unit residential tower and with the synagogue remaining. This is, this is really important and I think that this needs to be stated and understood especially by new uh, council members because this is the reality of development on Bayshore. On Bayshore, there is a special street setback where buildings can come up to, you can ask for waivers, but without a waiver, 63 feet on center line of Bayshore. So you can develop a lot on Bayshore and bring your building 
up to that, that far up to Bayshore. Right now, the existing synagogue, you saw pictures and probably many of you have driven by, is 103 feet from the center line of Bayshore. So it's set a little farther back than it's obligated to do under code and also what any new development can do. The tower, the, the, the structure, both the, the, the parking area and the, the tower portion under this plan would be set a minimum of 240 feet back from Bayshore and a maximum of 330 feet back from Bayshore. I know that there's going to be a lot of concerns re regarding privacy as it relates to the wedding garden. This plan sets that tower way back. You've got 50 units, 25 on each side. So you've only got, the argument is, is you're going to have all these people looking at you. You've only got 25 on one side of the building units that are set up and very far back. In addition, you can see that the synagogue will remain, so that keeps that buffer. You've got trees in that location. And in addition, you are said that the wedding garden is set directly on Bayshore. So I understand concerns about noise, but there's an inherency of traffic up and down Bayshore. You've got uh, you know, bike riders, you've got walkers, and then you also have motorcycles. You've got other cars that play loud music. So that is part of what happens on Bayshore. And I also want to bring this forward because I think it's important. You have four community uses right now on Bayshore. They all have similar or more intense land use classifications for redevelopment. This truly offers an opportunity to reimagine co-locations at those locations in this kind of similar format. And I also know, and I, and I think this is an incredibly important point, because I understand a lot of the frustration in the South Tampa community about development, the feeling like there's so much development happening. But you heard this from your planning commission, and you heard this from your staff, and you can see it directly on the map. This area of Bayshore for decades has been planned for higher density development. That is not a decision you all have made. It's not a decision your predecessors have made. These are decisions that have been made years ago, a long time ago. Those are the decision points that have to be looked at and managed in this process. And we are developing in a manner consistent with the comprehensive plan where you've heard your planning commission say, you don't even, haven't even brought yourself up to the level of density that they have been planning for. And that's what we're attempting to accomplish. And in fact, even at the residential density of 50 units to an acre, I mean, I'm sorry, 50 units, not to an acre, 50 units, it's still left less than the potential development up on this property, which is up to 72 units. We have done as much community engagement as we possibly can. I have had an open dialogue. Anybody who knows me knows that I am an open book. I want everybody to know what's happening. And so I've tried, and we have had conversations. I understand that that doesn't mean everybody agrees, but they have been absolutely respectful. We have tried to, to deal with the issues that have been brought up the best we can, but I, I, I want to say this, and this also deals with the trees. At the end of the day, if you're trying to take a project and co-locate it with an existing use and existing trees, and you want to keep the use, in this instance, we understand natural resources. Um, we, we can talk about those trees. There is, we've looked at this every angle we can. There is literally no way to develop this site with this kind of co-location, because it, it's not about the height. It's about what you have to have to co-locate this and your access points, especially security, given that this is a synagogue. There is no way to reimagine this site in a co-location manner that doesn't have tree removal. It's not possible. So it puts everybody in the position, and while I don't like saying this, this is accurate, of saying, do we want to have this as an available option for co-location, which is leaving the synagogue in its existing location with the, as many assurances we can, restrictive covenants that say that's what we're going to do, or should we just not go in this direction? And unfortunately, that's the conversation we're having, but I think it's a good conversation because it gives these other community uses options to redevelop. Uh, I've discussed the waiver criteria a little bit by describing the interplay between the fact we have an existing building and that being a hardship, but that's in your packet. Uh, I do want to just also talk about the related group. 
A lot of you have heard of the related group. A lot of you know the related group. They have a variety of developments that they do in Tampa. Some of them are high-end luxury, like the Ritz-Carlton. Some of them, and many of them, are affordable housing. They've come to Tampa. They love Tampa. They're going to talk about it uh, uh, if we get a chance. They want to be here, and they are, they're here to stay. This isn't a fly-by-night developer. And they have, as I've said in this, 450 affordable housing units that they've developed in Tampa, along with the Ritz-Carlton and other developments. In conclusion, and I'll, I'll hold whatever I have left, which isn't much for, for rebuttal, we really do think, as, as hard as this project is to, to, to deal with in terms of the community and their concerns, there is a sincere effort on our part to bring forward a project that respects the past with the, with the synagogue re retaining its existing location, but also provides opportunities for additional housing in this area up to the density that this comprehensive plan is providing for in as sensitive a, of a way possible by adding to the community. Thank you very much. And uh, obviously, any additional time I'll have for rebuttal. Thank you very much. Any questions, comments, before we go to public comment? Yes, ma'am. I have some questions for staff. If you could bring one of the maps, preferably one of the um, just uh, yeah, and probably any map will do. Okay. Uh, preferably ones that have like zoning, the zoning map. Oh, okay. Yes, LaShawn Doc Development Coordination, and let me um, show my map. I thought I picked it up. You have an aerial. Here it is. I'm sorry, LaShawn oh, Dr. No. Development Coordination, here is the map. <coughs> so this is the parcel that's located here, that's identified. Can you zoom in just a little bit? Sure, absolutely. Beca because I'm, so this is the current zoning? You can zoom out, because I'm really curious about stuff surrounding it. Yes. This is the current zoning, correct? Correct. Um, but to the south, it says RM24, but aren't those single family dwellings to the south? Um, some are single family attached. I have a picture of um, the dwellings that are located to the south. This is one. Jeez, I'm sorry. Oh, no and worries. then there's single family um, attached. That's okay. And the same thing I to the west. Single family detached. Yes. Uh, the west says it's commercial general, but I saw on the map that it doesn't look commercial it looked like residential so I was just curious yeah so to the west there's a pocket of commercial general which is located here on um, Isabella then you have your tower that's here but what I'm saying is commercial general it looks like those are townhomes am I wrong with that you showed some photos yes that's correct um, there are and then I believe in the tower there may be some that are to the west that has a commercial component but there are residential multifamily to the west and I'm sorry, I'm digging through my pictures to see. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. This one is the residential tower. That's no, no, I was asking about the directly across the street and where it says commercial general. Right. Okay, so I just wanted to clarify mm -hmm. that that's not commercial general. I apologize, I have to dig used. through to find out. No, no right worries. One. I just wanted to make sure we saw it and that yeah. I was clear on that. Um, can you put the map back up? Sure. Uh, what has what has council already approved on Isabella? If you could kind of just show, um, because we kind of looked at it in the abstract, but I'm curious where the actual developments are. So you have southwest of the site. Mm -hmm. This is a PD, which you can see some of the construction and some of the photos. Okay, um, um, how comparable is it size-wise? So that one that is to the west, um, I have it. It is over 200 feet in um, height. That development is 155 feet. It's 15 floors. Hold on a second. 150 feet, you said? This development is 200 units, 349 feet. 
349 feet. That's the south at Santiago. This is the development that is at the corner. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. This one is 250 feet. 250 feet at 15 floors. That's 21 floors in a penthouse, and that is at 250 feet, and okay. that was approved in 2016. So that's, that's the one development. just south of the Commercial General? Correct. This is on the opposite corner, like southwest of the site. Okay, and then you said there's another one. Further south of the site at Santiago. Uh huh. You have Bay Oaks Towers, and this one is at um, 200 units at 349 feet. Mm -hmm. It's for the south. And how many stories is that? Let me see if I have it. I apologize. I only have the height. I didn't put the stories that okay. was on it. I'm okay. sorry. But on average, that would be... And then further south mm -hmm. at Beta Bay is Aquatica. Aquatica is a PD that is 155 feet in height, it's 15 floors. Okay. That's Aquatica. And I believe those are the ones I have for. <coughs> okay, if you could just put that map back up for me. <coughs> yes, those are the ones I have. Yes. Okay, and so those are all going south? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that's the only questions I have for now. Thank you very much. Council Member Clendenin. This is probably from the uh, Planning Commission. You spoke about sample properties in comparison to this development uh, proposal. How many of those sample properties were not Bayshore facing, that were not you know, Bayshore adjacent? So when we do our samples, we look at, um, Ms. Dan Collins with the Planning Commission staff, when we, when we do our samples, we look at the land uses, and then we look at the densities within those land use. So for example, the R83, let me pull my numbers out. So for example, the R83, which is um, this parcel here, this dark brownish color, we looked at those samples. So based on, um, based on five sites, um, it was, the, the category allows up to 83 dwelling units an acre. That's what it's planned for. Those are currently developed at 16.12 um, units an acre, which is 19% of the density that's anticipated in the categories. Um, we looked at the R35, which are these right here, excluding the subject site. <clears throat> the R35 anticipates up to 35 dwelling units per acre um, based on 15 sample sites. Um, the um, existing density of those samples is 14.27 which or 40% of the density that's anticipated in our 35 designation. So when you're relating the new construction to the context of the existing neighborhood though, how many of the, how many towers do not face Bayshore? Um, towers are kind of staggered up along Bayshore. The one primarily we looked at, um, which you mentioned in our report, is there's that um, 15 story tower that's directly to the north of the site. But that's the one that faces, is, 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 abuts the uh, commercial district and right. the expressway, correct? Correct, yep. Okay, not residential? Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Council LaShawn, Doc Development Coordination. And if I may, um, Councilwoman Hertek, just kind of touch briefly on the commercial general that exists to the west. <coughs> The single family <coughs> unit residential that is developed within the commercial general district, it requires special use approval. It's a special use one, so that's why you won't see it identified on the actual um, atlas as like a PD. Thank you. Or as a rezoning, yes. 
And I also have for the record that I'd like to enter into the record, there were letters of support sent um, incorrectly to um, our office, so I'm going to enter those into the record. And I have copies for each council member. Thank you very much. Council member Henderson. Ms. Duck, or uh, maybe this could be for the developer. Um, the landscape buffer in the right-of-way, it needs to be in the right-of-way because it doesn't fit. I think that's um, what I have in my notes here. Is that why they need the waiver? Can you explain In order that? to, pro you're correct to the extent that in order to provide the turnaround that they, uh, the, the circle driveway it, within the property, um, there is a request to then allow additional landscaping in the right of way. So that does require a waiver as part of that. But again, and, and I, I recognize the frustration with everyone, when you're trying to do this kind of location, co-location, if we have a cleared site, there's a lot of other things you can do. This is an attempt to do this co-location in this area, and that's why that request is being made. Okay, has there been an analysis done um, regarding the public safety aspect of that decision? When you get to permitting, that will be required through the trans your transportation folks to ensure that any landscape that is placed in the right-of-way and anything that is done in terms of interface between the right-of-way and uh, the, the property, the on-site property, complies with their technical standards. So anything as it relates to view corridors, anything as it relates to pe the pedestrians having some opportunity to know what's coming in and out will occur in that regard. Okay. Um, I want to frame my question properly, so the since you need the landscape buffer in the right of way is there any way that you can not have to do that so that you can make it fit within the area that you need so that it can work is there any way that it can work uh, i'm going to ask uh, our landscape uh, <laughs> okay. our, our, our sorry our councilman henderson Expert. Ricky Paterica with Dark Moss, 3087th Avenue, I've been sworn. Uh, there was a modification in the latest site plan where we changed the waiver from requesting buffering in the right of way to an eight foot to two foot waiver with enhanced buffering on the property out of the right of way in the, in the two feet. So it was a removal of the landscaping request to put it in the right of way to provide a different type of buffer in, uh, within the property in a, in a narrow buffer, buffer width. In previous projects, is this a common request to have this type of waiver? Uh, I'm just asking so I can make good decisions. I only have experience with a couple of projects of this density, and they don't necessarily have turnarounds like this function, but uh, I think the no project I've worked on in a landscape or arbor sense has retained uh, cultural facility like a synagogue as well as the proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. If, uh, if there's nothing. Yes, sir. Councilman Clendon. And I, uh, Ms. Mandel, I have a question. You, uh, part of your presentation, you asserted that in order to retain the synagogue, that this was the only option. Is that, is that a professional assertion that there's nothing else that can be built on the site and stay within the confines of code? As it relates to the trees, that's what my point was relating to the trees. In order to provide, because because again, you have a cultural asset, you also have a synagogue that has certain safety requirements for their ingress and egress. So, in order to retain this this uh, institution on this location, the synagogue on this location, and co-locate. The only way to do that with the, as it relates to the trees, it, there's no, we looked at it, there's no way, even if, it, it's not a size or a height issue, it's in order to be able to do the ingress and egress. Ricky can talk about that further, but we did spend a lot of time trying to figure that out, and there's just not an opportunity to do this co-location and also retain those trees. But just for the record, we're not trying to... Uh put in the record that nothing else can be built on the site and, and I, stay I within don't, the code. That, okay. I, that isn't what I, I okay. was trying to assert. I was directly asserting that as it relates to the trees. 
But I was also pointing out to you that this is a parcel and this is an area that was intended for higher intensity and density development. And in order to provide both for the higher density and intensity and retaining the synagogue, could you do a project here not retaining the synagogue that may be able to do something you know, in this vein that may retain trees? Likely. But so, that's not what this application is, and that's not what the intent. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate the answer. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. We will now begin public comment. Uh, Mr. Pressman, do you have a speaker waiver form? I do, sir. How many? Please give it to uh, Mr. Shelby, and we'll read off the names. If you are here, you must be here. Um, please raise your hand so we can acknowledge you. Suzanne Carl. Carl. Thank you. Karen Roberts. Thank you. Carol Guyton. Carol Guyton. Thank you. Maddie Vega. Thank you. Donna Bars. Liz Reynolds. Steve Reynolds. Seven names, an additional seven minutes for a total of 10, please. Is somebody playing music in the crowd? Yeah. That's all sorry. I'm trying to make sure it's not <laughs> it's so. It's so. It is it's outside. It's so hard. It's so hard. All right. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> Mr. Pressman, please, well, we know you. State your name, and you have um, 10 minutes is up. Ten minutes. Thank okay. you. We have that on the clock. Please begin, sir. Mr. Chairman, Council Members Todd Pressman, 202nd Avenue South, number 451 in St. Petersburg. I am proud, honored to represent the iconic, historic, and beautiful Tampa Garden Club, who's been an icon in this city since 1926. We appreciate the zoning staff's finding of inconsistency. The Garden Club abuts this property on its north. We are the most impacted, most impacted neighbor, in our opinion. And yes, I was sworn in. If we could go to the PowerPoint, please. Yes, sir, we see it, and we can please, there we go. There you go. This issue is about compatibility. In our opinion, this compatibility is like oil and water. You see, you have the garden club and the wedding garden and the Fred Ball Park behind and the new building is located, you see, on the left. So there's a close orientation between these uses. When you look at the garden club's website, they tell you, which is you can look up today, uh, it's a spectacular view, perfect backdrop for weddings, corporate affairs. Your event will be private and exclusive. Spectacular wedding garden and gorgeous uh, uh, layout. So here's a little slideshow of what is at the heart of the garden club, which is their wedding garden, and what's proposed. Now, I have it at 354 feet, which was the prior height. Our research, per our planner, indicated to us was the tallest outside downtown or channel side. I think maybe I rephrase that, that it's one of the largest or tallest buildings that we saw in research outside of downtown Tampa and channel side. Another view regarding wedding center, which is the budding use. We found it taller than Tampa Marriott Waterside, 250,000 square feet. And this will be at a 10 foot setback on their plans. These, are, these uh, elevations are directly from the, from the reports and in the uh, public record. And then, of course, they have a facility which uh, they have uh, internally for uh, dinners and social events and things of that nature. So this is a use that's on the ground, on the grass. This shows the front lawn. Compared to one of the largest buildings outside of Tampa, uh, downtown Tampa and Channel Side. So this is from the public record, and you'll see their ex prior exterior plan shows a pickleball court, summer kitchen, tables. These are the summer kitchen tables. You can see the wedding garden is directly over to the right. So looking closer again, in those pickleball court, tables, summer kitchen. So at our condo, this is a big party area. Monday nights, 30, 35 people are there partying, cooking out, enjoying the facility. This is a party area as we see it. Now to be fair, on subsequent plan after we raise this question, 
the plan did change and they note it as the amenity deck. So I don't know if there's still pickleball there or not. But when women are saying their I do's, I don't think they want to hear paddle balls going back and forth. And again, at a 10 foot setback. Now, large buildings cast large shadows. This is an outdoor use, idyllic, beautiful. That changes light and air on a use that is very specific and impacted by shadow. So what we have here is a unique, singular, idyllic, one-of-a-kind bayshore, open space that will lose privacy and exclusivity, critical features for weddings and corporate events and other elements, and noise, beautiful view corridor, uninterrupted, garden-like facility has been chosen by generations of Tampa families, loss of their number one competitive asset, which is an idyllic, beautiful view, and this affects a five-acre bayshore jewel, which is an urban oasis and park light open space beauty. Now, why do I say five acres? Because abutting directly behind the garden club is the Fred Ball Park, 1.9 acres. I'm sorry, virtually abutting. There's a small road between the two. This has been a park in Palmasena since 1906. It, has a, a, it had an original pool. It still has a spring. This is a few shot, shots of it here. But I want to say one critical thing. As my friend Julia Mandel pressed and pressed, about future land use categories and densities. The, the, the point is this. Future land use categories are not a given. They are not, they are not what the density number says. They are a speed limit. You don't get what that number is. You choose what that density is going to be. So when you look, when she shows you future land use categories at high amounts, those are not a given. And additionally, they're under PD site plan zoning. If they came in to do something different, they would have to deal with that PD site plan. So let's change subjects. 10 pounds of sugar in a five pound bag. She talked about meeting intensity. I believe she said they meeting the densities or trying to meet the densities as best as possible. Well, the fact is they're asking for a bonus of seven additional units. That's a special bonus. They have an agreement with the city that they will pay for. Sorry, Mr. Shelley. And my apologies for interrupting. But Can ladies and gentlemen, clock, please? what? Please we'll say, stop did you the stop, clock, did you stop the clock? Okay, we'll have to give a little extra seconds there. But ladies and gentlemen, this is a quasi-judicial hearing. People are here to observe or offer testimony to give evidence. This is not an opportunity to make noise or distract. Um, it's not an opportunity to vote on something. So I would ask you to please respectfully, whatever side you're on, to refrain from making distracted noise and um, put your attention to the testimony because that's where counsel under the law has to spend its time, the <coughs> facts of the case that allow it to make its decision. Thank we go you back very to, much. Please we go back to PowerPoint, please. The clock, yes. Please put the PowerPoint up. There you go. Go ahead. They want to keep their old waiver of a, a reduction of parking from 84 to 54 and keep that plus add everything they're proposing. They're reducing the required tree retention from 50% to 20% on a non-wooded lot. <coughs> Tampa was chosen as a tree, uh, as a number one tree city in 2018 and removed three Grand Oaks. And the mayor made some important comments about keeping our tree canopy when you're always sworn in. We had our Tease Planning Solutions look at the site for us. And you have specific criteria, compatibility criteria in your staff report that you must find for. First one is consideration of adverse impacts. She notes five acres of lush tropical land and garden uh, will be threatened by the mass and bulk. The second criteria has to do with encourage compatibility and overall site design to scale, internally, external. You have to find support for that. Our planner, which I'll put in the record, notes that where high rise developments exist, and this is important on Bayshore Boulevard, they encompass a full block or at <coughs> intersections of high intensity. This building mass is not compatible because it is not set up on Bayshore the way the other large towers are. That's a very important finding. PD specific standard, you have to protect beauty, areas that have unusual beauty and importance, uh, open space and green space, that's a criteria that you have to find tonight. And number six you have to find tonight is encourage development where it is, where it is compatible surrounding impacted neighborhoods. Not illustrative of appropriately sized multifamily development, she tells us, reduces the economic uh, potential of the site. You also do have a long list of comprehensive policies and there are many that don't match or are supported. These are still under your consideration. Requiring scale and massing is compatible, appropriate transitions, which apparently in our opinion there is none, allow development that's consistent, protect open space. These policies go on and on and affect compatibility in a major way. But the 
A critical finding, again, is that the, by our planners, the existing high rises are more compatible with the low rise residential character in other places because they're located at intersections or the whole block is developed with high rise buildings. So when your planning staff tells you they're under density, that's fine because you don't have to be at the maximum future land use category, but this area where the tower is is much different where other towers are on Bayshore. Zoning report, uh, we support the staff, but they only really had one sentence about the Tampa Garden Club and Fred Ballpark. <coughs> Planning Commission had no mention of the park and no mention of the garden center, so we don't believe that their review was close enough to the abutting neighbors. Now, uh, they did make some comments and showed a couple pictures at the hearing. I'm referring to the staff reports that have been submitted into the record. So in summary, you have loud and widespread citizen opposition. Our last count was 1,200, 1,300 petition signatures in opposition. <coughs> Credible and valid points. We believe it is compatible like oil and water in regard to height, mass, noise, light, beauty, and density. We believe it's too much in the wrong place. There's natural resources to consider. We believe it's 10 pounds of sugar in a five pound bag. You have the city staff finding of inconsistent. You have specific compatibility requirements of criteria that you must find tonight. And that's why we feel, as I mentioned a few items, that the Planning Commission report is off. Uh, with that, I think it's important to again understand the critical operation and activity of the Garden Club, which is privacy, exclusivity, weddings attract attention, weddings, people gawk at weddings, they're very nice to look at, we feel that's going to be gone. The related folks, good people, it's a good project, but clearly we feel it's in the wrong location. So I'll put this in the record, we appreciate your consideration, thank you. Thank you very much. Does anybody else have any speaker waiver forms? Yes ma'am, please uh, approach the attorney and we'll read off the names. You have to give him the list, right here. Five names, Ann Jedmanson, please raise your hand, thank you. Terry Castillo, thank you. Ann Glenn, C.J. Smith, Allison Murray. Five <laughs> names, five additional minutes for a total of eight. Yes, ma'am, please state your name, you'll have eight minutes total. Good evening, City Council. My name is Jane Graham, attorney and founder of Sunshine City Law at 737 Main Street, Suite 100, Safety Harbor. I represent Altora Bayshore Condominium Association. Altora is here tonight um, adopting all concerns of the Tampa Garden Club and is also opposed to this request. We're requesting a denial tonight. As you make your decision, remember, as a rezoning, you need to hear that there's competent substantial evidence, the applicant has the burden to show that they've met all the criteria under the rezoning code as well as the waivers and they're asking for a bonus provision and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more and what you need to look at for that. The staff has a finding of inconsistency and that is competent substantial evidence. So you do need to take that um, seriously into account in your decision. As far as Altura, their prop the property owners have concerns that this will negatively impact their life, character of the neighborhood, and well-being during hurricane evacuations and floods and traffic safety. I want to talk about this bonus provision because it's, it's kind of serious. You know, the property is in the coastal high hazard zone, which Mr. Danny Collins had mentioned. And previously, this first came to you as a future land use map amendment, and the, the planning commission actually said, no, the density, you know, there was a recommendation against it because there was more density in the, in the um, coastal high hazard area. Here, the applicant is no longer requesting a future land use map amendment, but they are still requesting an increase of density on the same property. This time it's via a bonus provision agreement. And this request, for the same reasons as the future land use map, is inconsistent with the comprehensive plan. It increases density in the coastal high hazard area. 
If you look at the language of Section 5 of the draft bonus provision agreement, it explicitly describes it as a density increase. However, the Tampa Comprehensive Plan CM Objective 1.1 is very explicit. Direct future population concentrations away from the coastal high hazard area so as to achieve a no net increase in overall residential density within the coastal high hazard area. There's no exception in the code or the comprehensive plan that allows for increases of population in the coastal high hazard area just because it's approved via a bonus provision. The city of Tampa has a strong public policy reason as well to follow this comprehensive plan provision and not increase the density in the coastal high hazard areas. There are a number of other comp plan objectives related to the increase of density and I've um, provided a, a letter which I'll submit into the record right now that goes into more detail. The other issue about the bonus provision is that the city reviews it based on several factors under 27-140J. Um, some of them include the public's benefit derived from the bonus improvements and amendments, the development's benefits derived from the bonuses, and then negative impacts from the bonus. Well, in exchange for seven additional units of bonus density, which they're requesting, the applicant is requesting, the applicant is proposing to pay a grand total of $144,480 for multimodal and safety improvements um, while the, each unit is projected to sell in the millions of dollars. And so if you look at the balance of it, there's certainly an off balance of what the benefit and what they're willing to give versus what their benefit is. Meanwhile, the density increase adds more people in the coastal high hazard area which not only plainly conflicts with the code, but places the South Tampa community at further risk during hurricane evacuation. <coughs> there are additional inconsistencies with the Tampa Comprehensive Plan, which have already been described by Mr. Todd Pressman. Um, a couple that I do want to raise to you is the project will disrupt the surrounding area, nine, uh, land use policy 9.3.8, um, El Tora in particular is concerned about impacts from the increase on traffic on West Barcelona and um, what it will mean for the surrounding units. Um, while there is a traffic study, first of all, you know, you are supposed to be looking at competent substantial evidence. We understand there is a new traffic report that had been submitted May 8th by the applicant, but there's no staff review of it, so we would urge that the staff would at least be able to review that before and have any of your questions answered. We do have ongoing concern about not just traffic, but what the impact will be from delivery trucks, garbage trucks on site, and loading zones on the property. Um, finally, this site, as uh, Mr. Pressman talked about the 10 pound of sugar in a, a five pound bag, I, I could think of a less polite way of saying that, but I, I won't. <laughs> um, the site plan requests not one, but seven waivers. And the waivers must be supported by the criteria under section 27-139-4.2. Now, really importantly, the, it requires the applicant to pre, prevent, present evidence that shows that it will not substantially interfere or injure others whose property would be affected. And you're going to hear a testimony from many people in the audience tonight based on competent substantial evidence. This is, lay, many is, are layperson testimony, but they are based on facts and observations which are upheld under the law as being competent. And you will hear why this will impact them as far as you know, impacting the garden club, the quality of life, um, what it looks like. The fact that the applicant is requesting to reduce tree retention on a gnawed wooded lot from 50% down to 20% when next to it you have a well-loved wedding area which has all the, you know, it benefits from the outside, that's something you need to take into account. Councilwoman Henderson asked if there was a study on public safety for the landscaping and the right of way and, and the answer was, well, we deal with that in the site plan, but that's actually an insufficient answer because again, the waiver criteria requires that 
you do have, you do look at the impact on the, the public and, and others in the surrounding area. Again, the incompatibility with the character of Bayshore Boulevard, the Tampa Comprehensive Plan describes Bayshore Boulevard as the emerald jewel of Tampa. Its form has been shaped by the development of the Western perimeter. It has eclectic physical, cultural history, lush landscaped mediums, and unobstructed waterfront access to the public. Um, the corridor is more than a road. It is an experience, a destination, part of Tampa's identity. So please take this into account as you make this decision about the larger area. Finally, I'd like to just, I see my time has almost run out. I'd like to enter several things into the record. This is an existing Tampa land use map that shows the blue. Oh, I see I'm out. So that shows that's open space. All right. um, as well as several flood maps. Thank you very centers. much. Please uh, give them to the attorney and we'll put them in the record and uh, we'll be able to pass them around through here. Thank you, very, Thank you much. very much. Does anybody else have a speaker waiver form? All right. We'll get the speaker waiver forms out of the way and then we'll go to the regular public comment. Yes, ma'am. I have one name, uh, Joey Rivera. Thank you. So you have one additional minute. Please state your name and you may begin. And if we can get the presentation up on the screen. My name is Angela Favada Weck, and my family have been proud residents of Tampa since 1903. I'm also a member of the Tampa Federation of Garden Clubs. This development will impact our garden club and our ability to support our community. These projects include many of the things on the Almo, the Florida Garden Project at the Les Peters Gr Girl Girls Academy, the renovation and installation of irrigation at the Rosa Valdez School, the beautification of American Legion Post Number no. 5 on Kennedy Boulevard, the partnership with Gulf Coast Jewish Family Center to provide um, nature camps for their um, the children that receive services through their agency. The meditation garden that we installed, you see a family that lived there at Metropolitan Ministries. The community gardens that we support and provide the seed money all across our city and county. Our kids camp we host on our property each year for students to learn about nature and the natural world. Our youth scholarships we provide at Wakaiba Youth Camp in Apopka, Florida. The college scholarships we, we um, give to upperclassmen and graduate studies students that are, that are studying um, majors that we find um, important. We host many events. Many of you were there at our garden club on February 22nd. In our facility, free of charge, in past years, the organizers had to pay for the space to host this event. For years, on all High Holy Days, our garden club has allowed these, those attending Rodolf Shalom services to park in our parking lot at no cost to the synagogue or their members. This in-kind donation to Rodolf Shalom was especially necessary when around 2015 or 2016, Rodolf Shalom received a 30 parking space waiver due to an addition to their campus. That parking waiver should not roll over with this new development, and that waiver needs to be reconsidered as the scope of this development is certainly not the same as the property's current use. I understand and our Garden Club members understand that development can and probably will occur on this site. We have seen the rise of development in the neighborhood and have been actively involved in mitigating the effects of construction activity to our neighbors. When the sanctuary condominium project was being built, parking in the neighborhood was impacted by the number of vehicles. Daily, the Tampa Police Department were called due to blocked streets, driveways, and other safety concerns. The Tampa Police Department approached 
the Garden Club asking us in the name of public safety and concerns for emergency vehicles, ability to navigate the streets to allow the sanctuary workers to use our parking lot. We agreed and contracted for a fee to allow this. Unfortunately, due to the plantings and other hardscaping being damaged, we discontinued that contract for the sanctuary project. After discontinuing it, the police saw a spike in the calls they were receiving from the neighborhood and again approached our garden club asking us to again let the sanctuary project use our parking lot. We acquiesced in the spirit of community and being a good neighbor. After the sanctuary was completed, we quickly used the parking revenue to repair the damage done. Altura was proactive in asking us to afford them the same parking arrangement, and we have allowed that, but we'll have to deplete the funds generated to repair the damage caused by this arrangement. Unfortunately, the damage caused to the Garden Club by this development cannot be mitigated by money. The impact it will have on our revenue and the types of events we will be able to have in our building cannot be replaced. Thank you very Without much. those funds, we will be unable to continue to do the work that is the mission of the Garden Club. Please do what's necessary in denying these waivers Thank to save much. the neighborhood and the Garden Club. Thank you very much. All right, next up, another speaker waiver form, I believe. Yes, ma'am. Additional names on Catherine Gearing. Thank you. Joanne Enriquez. Thank you. Uh, R. Falzone. Am I saying it correctly? I'm sorry. Looks like F A L S O N E. Thank you. And Carol L E I G R I S. Thank you. Four additional minutes for a total of seven, please. Seven minutes total. Yes, ma'am. Please state your name. You may begin. Elizabeth Johnson. I'm going to start where my friend Angela left off because I'm the mother of a bride-to-be on June 10th and I will say to you that the gem that is the Garden Club is serious and the effect will be serious. She'll get married on June 10th there be, and we chose it over probably 20 different venues because you may not realize it but it's very difficult to actually get a water view. So you could be in a lot of hotels, but you'd feel like you were in a convention center. What they did too at the Garden Club, because that era of that building is pretty much like the era of the synagogue, but they've carefully renovated it inside. They have a beautiful bride space. They have taken advantage of the gem that is Bayshore Boulevard in a way, a good steward takes advantage of an old building. It's kind of squatty, it's not historical, but they've maintained the inside and out like a good steward. What I'm concerned about is that there's a lot of trading off. We love the synagogue idea. I go to Christ the King. We love having young people go to places of worship and grow in that way. But what I worry about in Tampa is that development trades off the good hard work sometimes of others. And that's a concern. In, in Hyde Park, you'll have developers that like to look over the historic district. You have developers that want to look over Bayshore. Your good speakers here cited many waivers that you would be giving that are not necessary. Ms. Mandel spoke about going down Bayshore, how much density has happened over the years. Well, I wrote in a letter to you that I set in the back of my dad's car when he went to McDill Air Force Base, sat there and made stories up about the beautiful mansions that were on Bayshore in 1978. It is not your fault that one by one, just when the smells of Bayshore were being rectified by good environmental changes, that people took advantage. But take advantage they did. So it isn't the zoning. Okay, the zoning maybe has already happened. And shame on them when that has happened. But now it's a chance for you 
Not every waiver is needed. Certainly not grand trees taken down. We homeowners abide by the tree ordinances. I live in Hyde Park. When we live in Hyde Park, we abide by a host of historic district requirements. These are overlays to the zoning that ought to be considered by good council members like you. Just because something was done poorly in the past does not mean the gem of Bayshore should continue to be taken advantage of in the future. Yes, the sugar in the bag is too big. We all know it. This should be downtown. I want to also compliment you. The downtown development that has been allowed to happen, awesome, even though that's a hardship on us all. But in 1978, the downtown was dead. Projects like this in Tampa belong in the downtown. And if you must work with idiotic zoning from the past, please hold the line as far as the tree ordinances, the preservations, the right-of-ways, the buffer zones, and all the other respectful things that need to happen. We sit here as members of the citizenry and we're astounded. There's no traffic problem with this, okay? There's, there's nails that are gonna be in people's tires. There's gonna be cones in the road. There's gonna be hurricane issues. We love your staff. We love all of you. But often we need some common sense for Tampa. Please listen to the Garden Club. This is a gem. I'm so excited about my daughter's wedding on June 10th. Please look in the beautiful Garden Club if you're going by that Saturday. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does that conclude speaker waiver forms? Does anybody else have one? Yeah. Is this the last speaker waiver form? Anybody else have any? This will be the last speaker waiver form. No, no, give it to the attorney. There's more? Okay. One name, Geraldine Poole. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, sir. Please state your name and you'll have four minutes. My name is Keenan L. Poole. I reside at 3203 Bayshore Boulevard, Unit 1001 in the Stovall Condo Building. I am fully behind the denial of the related group's application in its present form. As an upset resident of the Stovall condo that is adjacent to this massive related group overbuilt Ritz-Carlton that's presently under construction, do not repeat the mistake that's before you here today that you did to the Stovall residents. Your mistake oh. is that you approve. Please uh, put the overhead on the, the screen so we can all see it. Thank you. Okay. There it is. Go ahead, sir. Okay, you, your mistake is that you approved a related group, overdeveloped, architecturally unsound project that did not provide for proper tower separation, which does not fit into the fabric of our neighborhood. In other words, the buildings are too darn close to each other. It is my opinion that the Tampa city planning as well as the city of Tampa officials lack common sense in allowing this project to go. The city officials allowed four units to each floor. The responsible way should have been three units to a floor. This caused us to lose our privacy, and our right for quiet enjoyment. The sunlight has partially blocked our grounds. Our city views have been partially blocked. Constant <coughs> dust, dirt, and debris blowing into our property. Also, the related group before the city council cherry-picked a stat that said that it's 42 feet 
from our balconies. What they failed to say is that it's less than 25 feet from the Unit 301 balcony, and it's less than 25 feet from our parking garage. They cherry-picked to mislead the city council and the city planning and zoning. Come out, and I will personally let you on to my unit from both balconies that you can personally observe the travesty that the related group has done to our condominium, the Stovall. And also, the related group, under the direction to coastal construction, knocked down over 20 massive trees. Where is your tree retention policy? How did this happen? They left two trees. I'm a, C I'm a retired CPA. That's 10%. That should have never flown. The bigger issue here is today is about unjust enrichment. The city gets more tax revenues. The related group boosts their profits. The temple gets a big payday. But who loses? The neighborhood. Who suffers if this application is approved? Do the responsible of, of only allowing something reasonable. What you people did to the Stovall condo is a travesty. I personally would invite each of you to come and observe from my front balcony and my rear balcony just what a travesty it is. It's too darn close. Thank you very much. All right. Yes, ma'am, you have a speaker waiver form? people are on the list. And if I could have the overhead turned on during my speaking. I'm going to be referencing everything on the overhead while I'm speaking. Okay. Mr. I don't want you guys to miss anything. Mr. Shelby, how many names are on the speaker oh waiver form? <laughs> uh, Jordan Jasper. Here. Thank you. One additional minute, please. One additional <laughs> All right. Please uh, put the overhead up on the screen so we can see it. Okay, yes, okay. ma'am, go ahead. All Please, right. and if you could stay closer to the center, there's a hidden microphone there. Oh, so. okay, thank you. Uh, good evening, council members. My name is Dana Jasper. I live at 2813 Bayshore Boulevard, approximately one block from the proposed development. I am in opposition of this development. More, more specifically, I am opposed to one of the waivers that is being requested. For your convenience, I've placed the waiver that I'll be speaking uh, about on the overhead. And in particular, I will be addressing the highlighted portion there in which the developer wishes to provide an alternate buffer within the right of way. So that you can have a better understanding of where this buffer is, I will outline that on the sheet for you. It's along Isabella Avenue. It is approximately 300 feet by 15 feet. If you calculate that out, that comes to a tenth of an acre. I also want to point out to council that along this buffer, the developer plans to place at least five trees as well as shrubbery. So that you can better understand this from the ground level, I have a picture of the uh, intersection between Isabella and Barcelona. <laughs> Again, the area that is being requested by the developer is in this space here. This is between the sidewalk and Isabella Avenue. I've handed each of you a copy of a Tampa ordinance. This is section 20. 22.312, which states, no planting of trees or shrubs shall be done in the parkways lying between the sidewalk area and the street curbing on the several streets in the city. I'd like to provide for you reasons to deny this waiver. First and foremost, this would violate section 22-312 requirements as I've, I've just stated. Secondly, 
Granting this waiver would restrict future options to widen Isabella Avenue, should we ever need another lane, bike lane, or turn lane. Number three, this creates obstructed lines of sight where none currently exist. As you can see from the picture, there are no trees at this location. Remember, I said the developer was going to plan on putting in at least five trees. Lastly, to grant this waiver would be to give away the public's right-of-way land in order to accommodate a private developer's oversized project. Recall that I said that this is one-tenth of an acre. The developer has 1.43 acres on which to develop in this area here. Their project is so large that they are asking to spill over into the public's right-of-way. Now, I do not know what a tenth of an acre of land costs in South Tampa, but I know it is not free. So the bigger question to ask this developer is why are you asking for free public right-of-way land? Why are you not accommodating your development to work in the 1.43 acres of land that you currently have to work with? I appreciate your time tonight. I hope you consider my points, and I ask that you deny this waiver. Thank, Thank you. you very much. All right. I believe that's, that concludes our speaker waiver form, so we can go up to uh, regular public comment here. Anybody wishes to speak, please line up on this side of the room. You'll have three minutes. Please state your name. Good evening. Oh, yeah, Lisa's going to do you want to take a recess? Okay. I, I apologize. Before you begin, there's a request for a five-minute recess. Okay. We'll start with you. Okay. We apologize, and then we, uh, we'll, we'll get back up here. Thank you. We're in recess for five minutes.
unmuted.
We will do so, but if you do so, please provide it to me at the end of your presentation. Thank you. Roll call, please. Yes. Carlson? Hertek? Here. Plindenen? Here. Henderson? Present. Vieira? Miranda? Here. Meniscalco? Here. We have a physical quorum. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Please state your name and you may begin. Um, my name is Paula Perry. Good evening. I'm here before you to oppose the rezoning request for RAC 2293. I'm a longtime resident of our great city where I've uh, raised my family. I currently serve as first vice president of the Tampa Garden Club, and I'm on the board of directors for the Beach Park Women's Club and the Beach Park Homeowners Association. I've lived here for many years. I remember the first time our new Buccaneers football team made the playoffs, and I attended the game in the big sombrero. It was a long time ago, and there's been a tremendous amount of growth and change to our city. I understand things change, mayors, council members, teams, and stadiums. One thing that hasn't changed is the length of a football field. End zone to end zone, it's 120 yards. That's 360 feet. And this building at 29 stories is 354.8 feet. It's just shy the length of Can a football field. Can you zoom field. out, please? You see that yeah. scroll wheel? The scroll, you see the scroll wheel on top? Sorry, the it's right there. Okay. Oh. On top a little. So essentially, they would be building a vertical stadium next to our garden club. For the record, we have resolutions uh, from the Tampa Garden Club. And I'm sorry, I need to yeah, zoom out so we can see it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, from the T Beach Park Women's Club and from the. Um, Ballast Point Homeowners Association. And um, we are all, all of these groups are opposed to um, this, resol this um, application. In addition to this, we have a petition that was distributed and each person has submitted that individually and we're at just shy of 1,300 that have been submitted to city council. Um, I participated on a Zoom call on November 1st, 2022. And during that call, we, the Tampa Garden Club, asked during this community opportunity they would consider modifying the scale and size of this development to address the concerns of our garden <coughs> club in the neighborhood. Mr. Pedro Schnell, who was on the call, answered with an emphatic no. He said, this is what people want. This is what we've done in Miami and on the East Coast. Since then, they reduced the number of units to 50 from 60. However, they increased the square footage per unit and increase the height of the building two and a half feet. We're not opposed to development. We understand that um, there are gonna be things. We're asking they develop within their current zoning and entitlements. The change in PD, the multiple waivers and requests for bonus density clearly indicate it does not fall within current zoning or entitlements. 2015, when Rudolph Shalom requested rezoning, we did not oppose this. We, um, they wanted to add a second story to the existing preschool, the addition of administrative office and reduced parking waiver. Um, the property next to them that they owned, they sold for over a million dollars and those were developed into townhomes. We did not oppose it. We agreed with city council that this was appropriate for the neighborhood and the community. The last time I spoke to you, I was here as a member of the Beach Park HOA and we worked with a developer to come up with something that was a good compromise for the neighborhood. This can be done. This is not it. Please deny this application. Thank, Thank you. you very much. We have one person, one person only online uh, to speak on this, and we'd like to take her. She's logged in on the computer. Pamela Carpenter, if you could raise your right hand, we'd like to swear you in. Oh, the other right hand. The other one. The other right, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Do you swear or form? or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth and nothing but the truth? Yeah. Okay. You're, un you're muted, please unmute yourself. I also need to screen share. Okay, uh, and turn your video camera on please. Okay, we can see your, your screen share, but we, all right, go ahead if you can speak. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, and please state your name and go ahead. Pamela Carpenter, 2501 on Crowder Lane. Um, I've been a resident for 23 years. Uh, since I can't do this in person, I'm limited to three minutes, so I'm going to go through my slides rather quickly. 
Uh, you just heard from Paula about the size. Yeah, okay. You can hear me, right? Yes, we can. Go ahead. So you just heard from Paula about the size of the building, so I'm not going to go into that. This is a picture of Isabella, the current yeah. Isabella. Rusty, they could hear me. Be quiet. This is Isabella as it exists today. Uh, it has its own traffic calming built in. The screen uh, slide on the right shows the right of way for the west side of the street in front of the Presbyterian Tower. It is very important. There are 210 residents there. They do not have a sidewalk. This is the view looking towards that Presbyterian Tower with the 210 individuals. Um, when the construction starts at this uh, property across the street, the sidewalk will be inoperable, done like any other uh, development we've seen lately. They take the right away during the development for safety reasons. We understand that. But there is no provision being given during construction. I've asked multiple times of the developer to, to work with us on a solution for this tower to have safe walking to even get to the park. Also, they would, on the right-hand side, their bus stop is no longer on Isabella. They have to go down to, uh, anyone using the bus has to go down to, by the Kona culture, they're on day to day. So I've gotten input from the folks that live in this uh, building, and they're very concerned about their own safety and uh, going forward when the construction begins. All right, our streets, Isabella, Rubidoux, uh, Carolina, Barcelona, are all cut through. If you've ever driven down Bayshore and tried to get to the Salmon, anytime after 2 o'clock, you're going to see lots of traffic coming through these little streets. They're hardly streets. They're lanes. They have no sidewalks. They have no center line. That's Barcelona on the left. That's Rubidu next to Preball Park in the middle. And uh, over to the side is um, uh, Carolina. Um, later, I'm going to talk to you about traffic studies. There haven't been any. It's just mind-boggling that you wouldn't need a traffic study <clears throat> for the increase in traffic density in this three block area. Uh, the picture on the left is Carolina. We have resolved the parking to be only on one side now, but we even with parking on one side, there's no sidewalks on this street. So you can't, you cannot get down to the crosswalk on Bayshore. Why do I bring this up? Because these things need to be thought about ahead of time. When you look at a, a building and, and 1.43 acre, you need to look at the areas around it. The middle picture is a picture of the existing sidewalk in front of this um, area. Uh, the picture on the right is a big thank you to the city of Tampa who replaced that sidewalk uh, in Fredball Park in 2021. It was a nice addition, and we really appreciate it. Uh, these are pictures of construction, current construction, to prove my point that you will not have access to anything in front of a construction zone. We wait for concrete trucks every day. Okay. This is a picture of the flooding problem um, on Rubidoux. Uh, Rulin Hertak asked for statistics. Here they are. I'm sorry there's so many, but I've accumulated all of them. This is exactly what the developers have developed, how many stories, and the buildings that are on Bayshore have Bayshore access, unlike this. Thank you Traffic very much. You're, you've run out of time. Okay. My charts uh, and my presentation was submitted to the council, Thank and you. I would like to be part of the record. Thank you very much. All right. That concludes the virtual uh, public comment. We'll go back to the in-person. Yes, ma'am, please say your name. You have three minutes. Good evening, city council members. My name is Haley Sasser, and I live at 307 West Wilder out in Seminole Heights. I'm very excited to get married next year at the Tampa Garden Club in February. I chose this venue over 10 others for many reasons. It's one of a kind. It's so special to the city. It's such a gorgeous historical spot on Bayshore Boulevard. The beautiful amount of light that it has in the gardens makes for an incredible place to make a lifelong commitment to someone. So when I started seeing the news of this project and possible construction, I got very concerned. For all the reasons that you've already heard, the building as it's being proposed today is inappropriate and does not fit with the neighborhood. There are so many reasons why this project as it's proposed is not a reasonable option for this area of Bayshore. I have nothing against new construction or building condos or new multifamily properties, but this location is not 
where a giant high rise should go. There are plenty other locations in Tampa that could use a building like this and it's not in South Tampa. There are already enough high rises on Bayshore. Let's not add another one. Please don't ruin this gorgeous wedding venue for hundreds of brides and families in the next many, many years. And in closing, I can't imagine saying my vows to my future husband with the screeching noise of people playing pickleball in the background. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please, please state your name. You have three minutes. Hi, my name is Michelle Vadalero. I'm here as the outgoing president of the Tampa Garden Club from 2020 to 2023 and as a member of the current board. The Tampa Garden Club has been an institution in Tampa since January of 1926. The current location on Bayshore has been our home since 1949. We have approximately 400 members representing every stage of life from young professionals to great-great-grandmothers. We empathize with the congregation right off Shalom because in many ways we have had a shared path. We've previously experienced diminishing membership and financial issues. But about 20 years or so ago, the decision was made to invest every available penny we had in betterments to the building and a wedding garden in order to develop a small event business. We have turned our financial situation around and we are booked out 18 months in advance. Our event pricing is tiered so that almost any bride can have a wedding with a beautiful Bayshore background. We are a 501c3 organization run by volunteers with only one full-time employee. The money that we earn goes into the upkeep of the building and then we give it away to the community. We partner with the City of Tampa to maintain Fred Ball Park. And we open our building to police officers and city staff during community events. In the three years of my presidency, our members have contributed approximately $50,000 to the community in the form of scholarships, community garden growth grants, support of veterans projects, and community education. Additionally, we make donations in kind with the use of our building and our garden. We love doing this because it's our mission, but we cannot do it if our income is reduced. We are greatly concerned that all of our past work and financial investment, investment will be wasted if City Council doesn't help protect the legacy of our organization. Now, contrary to representations made here, our wedding garden does not directly abut Bayshore. That was our front lawn that was shown. Our garden is set back approximately 300 feet and is, is screened on the Bayshore side for privacy by six-foot hedges. The 29-story planned building will loom over our ceremonies, much closer to the garden, and the developer has never offered conditions for the construction <coughs> period so as not to impact our clients or cause cancellation of our contracts. Our brides are on our, our property for one day. That construction noise during their ceremony is not something that they're going to get used to. This development would be the fourth one adjacent to us in as many years. Please come see this area for yourself to see what it looks like. Regardless of no parking signs, cars line the narrow streets adding to the congestion, and they use our lot because there is just nowhere else to go. Our once grassy overflow space is now a sand lot that's going to require work to restore. Historically, we have been happy to provide overflow parking for Rudolf Shalom, but there is no capacity to accommodate them now due to our event schedule and construction parking. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please state your name. You have three minutes. Good evening. Hello, City Council. I'm Kitty Wallace. I live at 4902 North Collins Lane in Wellswood. I am the past president of the Tampa Garden Club. I'm here to speak on behalf of the legacy of the Garden Club, the work that has been done over the years to the quality of life in all parts of the city of Tampa and Hillsborough County um, for 95 years. Planting trees in Lowry Park, uh, renovating the American Legion Veterans uh, Cemetery, and countless other environmental and beautification projects. Our children's summer vet, uh, nature camp has provided inspiration and knowledge to over 2,000 children in the term, since, it, uh, since, inception, since its inception in 2005. The members have educated the community, providing workshops and speakers and flower shows for 95 years playing by the rules. 
the last green space on Bayshore, which is commonly uh, the nickname for the Tampa Garden Club, the last green space on Bayshore is committed to continue to preserve the lovely gardens on our three acres, to continue to provide a special place to multiple generations of families, to celebrate their weddings, their bar mitzvahs, anniversaries, graduations, playing by the rules. During the past decade, the Tampa Garden Club has also provided leadership in efforts to establish community gardens in Tampa by sponsoring the Tampa Heights Community Garden, which was named Best Garden in the South, and uh, providing grants so that five other community gardens could be established. By supporting the Tampa Garden Club's request to <coughs> deny these, these uh, waivers, you are supporting uh, an institution that's 95 years old that has benefited the quality of life in the city of Tampa in many ways, and I ask for your consideration in that. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please state your name. You have three minutes. I haven't done this before. Is this showing up? Yes. Wonderful. Good evening. My name is Courtney Honing, and I'm a resident of South Tampa. I'm also a proud member and volunteer at the Tampa Garden Club. I am here to ask that you deny the rezoning request before you here tonight. Uh, please uh, put that on the the screen so we can all see. We can see your, there we go. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> okay. You got it? I'm so, I don't want to lose my seconds. Okay. Okay. I would like to make the important point that the Tampa Garden Club, which is directly next door to this proposed rezoning, is a small, women-owned and women-run business. The U.S. Census Bureau defines a small business as any operating business with less than five employees. The Tampa Garden Club has one full-time employee. I would expect that if I asked each of you council members if you support small business in Tampa, you would say yes. Well, now is your chance to prove it. The Tampa Comprehensive Plan states on page 327 that when considering rezoning, the city council must consider the implications to neighboring properties. The impact of the ongoing construction, the noise, the traffic, and the trees being removed could be detrimental to both the current and future bookings for weddings and all types of events at the Tampa Garden Club. The beautiful oak trees that the applicant wants to remove are part of the draw for using the garden area for weddings and events. The quietness of this side of the property will be unfairly implicated. Can you imagine the shadow that this large tower will place over the beautiful wedding garden? Bookings have already been, excuse me, affected, and as you will hear tonight or have heard, our business is being impacted. The Tampa Garden Club made it through COVID, thank God. But what's unique about COVID and its impact on our business is that the crisis had an end. This building with its overdevelopment, the waivers, the tree remo removals are essentially the Tampa Garden Club's permanent COVID. Once the building is built, it's not going anywhere. The beautiful trees once removed are not coming back. Please do not destroy the wonderful business model that the Tampa Garden Club has worked so hard to create and maintain. I leave you with this reminder on the Elmo, which I was trying to show you, on the City of Tampa website, which states, and I quote, successful small businesses are essential to maintaining a healthy economy. The City of Tampa recognizes the challenges faced by many small and minority owned businesses and offers valuable informational services and programs to help you remain competitive, end quote. Please help us remain competitive. We are not opposed to development itself. We, as much as anyone, want Tampa to be a successful, thriving city. What we are asking for is compatible development. Zoning is in place for a reason, and only the current zoning should be allowed. We are here tonight, ladies and gentlemen in red, to ask that you please allow the wonderful memories at the Tampa Garden Club to continue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please, please state your name. Hi, I'm Dr. Abe Marcatus. I live at 2619 Bayshore Boulevard, next to the Garden Club, and less than a block from the property. I'm a fourth generation Tampa native and a lifelong member, past president, and current board member of Road of Sholem. I drive down Bayshore several times a day and for over 35 years have used it regularly for exercise. I'm here both as a resident of the neighborhood and as a member of Congregation Road of Sholem. Like many of us here, I don't like the increased density that's occurring along Bayshore. I like the fact that it's fronted by properties other than condominiums. That's why I support this proposal, 
because it represents the best compromise to having no further growth in the area and having another large building on Bayshore. I like this proposal because it limits the size of a structure that can be built on the property, and it keeps a longstanding Tampa religious institution at its home. Like many churches and other religious institutions, Road of Sholem faces limited funds and a permanent endowment from the sale of a portion of our property is needed to remain financially viable. If this proposal is not accepted, we will need to sell the entire property and move to a different location. A larger condo will be built in its place without the encumbrance of our congregation limiting its size. The presence of our congregation on this property does limit development. Selling the entire property is a real option for us that we haven't wanted to use. Over the years, the Board of Road of Sholem has entertained <coughs> numerous offers to sell the entire property for more than the current offer. We've turned down these offers because it would require us to move from our home. This vote can both allow us to remain at our current location and be financially viable. Keeping Road of Sholem at its current location is important to us, but it's also important to Tampa. Our congregation is situated between a Presbyterian church and a Catholic school, and it demonstrates the diversity that our city has always had as vi visitors travel along Bayshore. A Tampa historical marker on the site notes our rich 120-year legacy that Road of Sholem has in this city. Tonight's vote will decide on the two choices that we have, but unfortunately, maintaining the status quo is not one of them. One choice has Road of Sholem being demolished and another large condominium being built in its place. The other opportunity keeps Road of Sholem and Bayshore Boulevard exactly as it is now, with a more modest building off Bayshore that's in our current empty parking lot. For these reasons, I ask the council to please approve this motion so that Road of Sholem can remain where it belongs on Bayshore and because it does also limit the size and location of another large building. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Next speaker. <coughs> Hello, my name is Craig Newman. I live at 2421 Victoria Gardens. I've been a member of Rodolf Shalom since 1961, and I speak in favor of this proposed development. I could go all over everything I wrote here, but after listening to so many folks that have this spoke, there's a few things I'd like to say about um, the Garden Club. I think everybody who uh, should recognize and do recognize the benefits of the Garden Club and all they do for Tampa and for charities. We, we don't dispute that at all. Um, and I think that just having a building this tower is not going to take any of that away from the city of Tampa. All right. But what the city, what the city of Tampa has done, or in, in speaking and listening to staff, they don't find anything much wrong with it, what was going on. Everything falls into the criteria that they spoke before the attorney came to speak, between talking about planning. Everything fell in the scope. Some of the density is less than, it, than we expected it to come back at. But it, they said, we have not done anything wrong. There's a few adjustments when it comes to waivers. I'll tell you about waivers. Uh, Councilman Miranda was, uh, at that time, you were chairman. They put a bar. 23 feet away from a church and 23 feet from a residential community. There were seven waivers to put a bar in off of Howard Avenue. That's why I came before city council. Must have been eight years ago, seven, eight years ago. But they put it in anyway, seven waivers. So waivers is when you hear in city council, you, some of y'all are new and some of you aren't. But the waivers is, comes across as about everyone who's having anything built to ask for waivers. You know, you've got a waivers asking constantly for sidewalks and not, you know, not putting in sidewalks or trees or trees removing. On, on Gandy Boulevard, we had 20 trees that were cut down so they could put in a car wash. And they were fine for doing it. And uh, fined with a D. But the fact is, they still have got, they've got a property without it. You know, they've got a property with no trees and it's a car wash. What I'm looking at here is we're talking about a synagogue that also has a lot of history, you know, in, in Tampa, Ybor City, the Jewish history. The proposals, the things that I've seen, I took the time and went through over the last three to four months and, and 
I was reading, looking at the falsehoods said about this project on next door. I'm going to say, I'm going to read you some of the things that were put out. And it was in there today. I went over them again. Condo, the condos will be built directly on Bayshore. The Grand Oaks will be removed, and the adjoining property will be ruined because of the canopy and the garden club. There's even, there was even a question as why is the JCC, Jewish Community Center, on Howard Avenue building condos in their parking lot? These are people that wrote in saying they have a problem with this. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you for your time. I appreciate your indulgence. Thank you. Yes, sir. I uh, cast every vote that I have to the way I see them at the time, but there's a vast difference in alcohol waivers and land zoning <coughs> waivers. Thank you very much. Please state your name. You have three minutes. Hi. My name is Dr. Marcy Baker, and I live at 610 West Swan Avenue on Bayshore. I was born in Tampa and have been a lifelong member of Congregation Road of Shalom. It is where my daughter was bought mitzvahed and where, unfortunately, we had my grandmother's funeral. I was bat mitzvah at Rodef, and I was married there. My father is a past president of Congregation Rodef Shalom, and I am the immediate past president. I have served on the executive board for the last 12 years. Over that time, we have been approached many times by developers asking us to sell our property, and we have always turned down these offers. But during my presidency, we got a unique offer of being able to keep our current building in its wonderful base or location and be able to develop the parking lot. This offer was very appealing to us because it would give us an endowment that would ensure our financial stability for the foreseeable future. The financial reality of many organized religious organizations, including Road of Salome, is that it has become harder and harder to maintain balanced budget. Dues alone do not cover our expenses. I truly believe that the hard reality of the situation is is that if we do not approve, have approval for this building, that sometime in the future, we will be forced to sell our entire property, which may lead to an even larger development project and not preserve the historic and beautiful synagogue on the premier street in Tampa. Living here all my life, I have seen the growth that has occurred in Tampa, and I think it would be a shame for us to potentially lose a synagogue from Bayshore Boulevard if we are not allowed approval of this project. Personally, we were talking about weddings. Personally, I want my daughter to be married in the same synagogue where I was bat mitzvahed, where I was married, and where she was bat mitzvahed. The approval of this project will allow that to happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please state your name. You have three minutes. Good evening. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Lori Rabinowitz. I've been a resident of Tampa for almost seven years. I'm probably an outlier here. I wish I had my family here since 1903, but that wasn't in the cards for me. I've been a member of Road of Shalom for two years. Before that, I was only involved in a lot of the community um, events, more towards the business. I am a chief marketing officer at a major law firm here in Tampa. I built a home in Rodef Shalom. As a new member, everybody here has been here for decades. This has been my home for me. I am really, really scared that if, we, if this sale doesn't go through, that we won't have a choice of where to worship. Everybody here has a choice. There's a lot of other churches with other denominations. There's no other conservative Jewish synagogue in South Tampa or even close by. We have members who come from Lithia to our synagogue just because of the area doesn't have this. I hope that you vote in favor of the sale. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Please state your name. You have three minutes. Uh, good afternoon, or I'm sorry, good evening. My name is Jim Baker, and I reside at, as you've heard, my wife just spoke, 610 West Swan Avenue at the corner of Swan and Bayshore, so we're, we're within proximity of the synagogue also. I was born and raised here in our great city. I have seen it grow into a vibrant community where people are moving. I've been a member of Rodef for over 25 years. I went through my conversion here also. I got married. My daughter had her uh, bat mitzvah. Uh, my father-in-law and my wife are past presidents, along with many other life events there. I am currently the fundraising chair for Rodef and will soon be the membership chair. Being on the board at Rodef has given me insight in the inner workings of making a synagogue run. 
It's not only the great people that make it happen, but it's the finances as we've heard. While we have been able to maneuver through the pandemic and the ever increasing labor and inflation cost, it has not been easy. We're the only synagogue in the area remaining open during the pandemic with interesting ways of doing things like everybody using Zoom and our in-person drive-in Shabbats in the parking lot. So that made it great for us and, our, and all of our members. RODEF is such an integral part of the fabric of our community. Related has thought very carefully about RODEF and all the neighbors when developing the proposal. They have made very thoughtful concessions after hearing the concerns of all parties. Please support Related's project to honor the past and preserve the future of RODEF on Bayshore. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Please state your name. You have three minutes. My name is Warren Harris. I live at 304 South Fielding Avenue. I've been a resident of Tampa since 1970. Uh, not to tell you anything you don't already know, but Tampa has some wonderful jewels, like many cities do. But one of our best jewels is Bayshore Boulevard. Um, we also have a jewel in the synagogue located on Bayshore, along with many churches and the Garden Club. Bayshore has, turned, has started out as a residential road and it has developed into a even more <coughs> residential road with multifamily dwellings and condos. Um, as I've said, it also has uh, churches, uh, a Catholic church, and the synagogue that's there. The, the beauty of those facilities, in addition to the residential areas, is that it shows to the world Tampa's commitment to not only morality, but to diversity. Uh, this plan allows the synagogue to remain where it is and utilize the value of the land. My concern is that if this plan is denied, in time the synagogue will be forced to sell, to sell the entire lot, allowing even a larger condominium to go in there, losing the beauty of the synagogue and the diversity that it demonstrates. Um, I would ask that this committee, this group, this council find a way uh, to allow both the synagogue and the garden club to coexist. I don't believe the condo would take away from the beauty and use of the garden club. It may create some circumstances that may not be ideal, but the garden club will continue to do their good work and allow people to continue to use their wonderful facility. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before I start, can I have the Yes, and please uh, show the overhead on the screen so everyone can see. Good evening, my name is Patrick Cimino. I'm president of Historic Hyde Park Neighborhood Association, and I've been empowered by my board to come and oppose the rezoning of this parcel next to the Garden Club and support their request. I think it, I wanna step back. This is a rezoning and a condo project from a, a land use and, and zoning perspective, because that's very important. We deal with this in the historic district a lot. I think what really is concerning is the excessive use of waivers and, and having to require bonus to do the level of density that this is. And the comp plan talks about it. Many of you all were at, a, at the public hearing here in the Garden Club and stated South Tampa should be closed. There's a lot of concern in the floods area and other people have emphasized this better than me. I think the, the giveaway on setbacks is critical. Two feet, you cannot put a little bush in. We've dealt with this in Hyde Park. So to, to, not, to not have a buffer or give up public land is not appropriate. And finally, you know, I, I, we hear a lot about financial hardship in the historic district. And I become very agnostic to that because in fact, that is not criteria for making these kind of decisions. Or it only should be used with exception not routine. And I will say one of the challenges, and I know you were addressed, uh, Councillor Miranda, on this, is Tampa has uses way too many waivers. If you have to use that many waivers, why is there code and why is there a comp plan? <coughs> Recommend denying this request. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, ma'am. And sir, I see you're standing there after you speak. I would ask for a 10 minute recess. And the reason is we'd like to move the folks that have spoken that don't need to be here to leave the chambers because we have a huge group downstairs and we want to bring them in for public comment so we can accommodate everybody. There are TVs and monitors downstairs. There's a room full of chairs so you can continue watching the meeting. 
and uh, we can keep the process going. Yes, ma'am, go ahead, you have three minutes. Thank you, good evening, councilmen um, and women. Um, my name is Paula Meckley, and I'm the current president of the Tampa Garden Club, and we, we really need your help here. Um, we're very worried about, about this decision and how this could have a, a major impact on our property and our small business. When a project asks for waivers and bonuses, there are usually underlying issues that have created those circumstances. In this case, the circumstances are that this piece of land is just way too small for the size of this tower, and it negatively affects the surrounding properties. This project has not shown justification for these increases in intensity. It is also clear in the code that there, is, there can be no adverse effects to the adjacent property. This has also not been addressed. The applicant should not be allowed to cherry pick specific information that they're providing. The traffic study does not include existing traffic generated by the synagogue or the new tower almost complete across the street. Well, well which is it? Are we allowed to include that in our evidence? Because they, they say there's seven towers in this area, but one of them's not totally built yet. So I'm not sure are we allowed to talk about traffic? Or are we not allowed to talk about traffic? They also mentioned that the condo tower has only 50 units and is located well behind the Tampa Garden Club's building and away from its, gar its wedding garden, um, a direct, and it's directly adjacent to a parking uh, lot. And it says, well, what they fail to mention is, and in the last PD that's uploaded in a cell, it shows the building is 354 feet tall, eight inches. That will loom over our wedding garden. The measurement from the corner of that building to the center of our wedding garden is less from the center of our wedding garden to Bayshore Boulevard. So it is closer to our wedding garden. Don't, don't let them tell you it's not, it is. Um, and this, they also make a statement that our wedding garden has no buffer between Bayshore and it sits right on Bayshore, it doesn't. It sits way back off of Bayshore and we do have vegetation buffers. But they also make a statement that, oh, we're putting buffers around our pickleball court, but yet we can't have a buffer to stop noise from Bayshore, but they can have a vegetation buffer to stop noise from the pickleball. Which is, it, does it work or does it don't? I don't know. Does it work? No. Um, they also state, given the unique nature of this project, removal of the existing trees is justified. There are no opportunities to develop this site without tree removal to keep the synagogue. Well, that statement is disingenuous. Just across the street, the developer developed some land that the synagogue sold in 2016. They put seven townhomes that fit nicely into the neighborhood. A development similar, or even larger, because this is a lot more land, that was like a half acre, this is 1.43 acres, could fit on that property with the synagogue. Thus, we would have the synagogue, new residential development. We'd be able to meet all the safety and security concerns that they're having. We would save the trees. It's a win-win for everyone. We are asking to please deny this application. It is just not compatible with this small site. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Please state your name. You have three minutes. My name is Vance Smith. I reside at 3501 Bayshore Boulevard. And I'm here to oppose this application for rezoning. Please show the image up on the uh, screen for everyone to see. That's beyond my pay grade. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> the application and the developer's uh, rezoning application seems to claim a right to develop the RS-35 uh, density under the Florida land use plan. That is a conditional right, if any. They must show that the parcel would otherwise fit all of the zoning requirements of the City of Tampa land regulations. I, th I think that RS-35, if you look at the Florida, at the Tampa Comprehensive Plan, the RS-35 identifies RS-35 as a medium density uh, element. When you look at medium density, this project has none of the key characteristics identified in the comprehensive plan. What it does have are all of the key elements of a high-rise condominium for RS-83, for which there is no significant property. 
I'd like to speak a little bit about a waiver. The project cannot exist with the zoning code as, as applied without seven waivers. I think common sense would tell you that the more waivers and exceptions are there are, the less likely it is that it is compatible with the neighborhood built environment. And for that reason, we think the, the uh, waivers should be denied because as a part of their criteria, a waiver should not substantially interfere or injure the rights of others whose property would be affected. That is precisely the position of where the garden club sits. Their property and their rights would be affected substantially by the allowance of this project. In addition, there has been a past waiver for parking and ingress and egress. If you look at the overhead, the, the uh, parking for the temple is limited to 18 spaces, thereby subjecting the remaining 165 or so spaces to ingress and egress from Isabella only. And finally, I have some concern about the green space. The green space on this project, it has to be 30% of the area, excluding the building footprint. If you look at this, we only have the outlines, 10 foot uh, perimeter outlines of the building. Thank you very much, sir. All right, before we go to the 10 minute recess, again, if you have spoken or have been named in a speaker waiver form and do not need to be in this room, uh, please uh, leave the chamber so we can bring in the next group. Again, you can watch the meeting downstairs uh, where there's seating and monitors. We are in recess for 10 minutes. muted.
All right, I'd like to call this Tampa City Council meeting back to order. If we could have roll call. Carlson. Hertek. Here. Clinton. Here. Henderson. Present. Vieira. Here. Miranda. Here. Maniscalco. Here. We have a physical quorum. All right, so I'm told that we don't have to do the shift change anymore. And this is everybody for the rest of the night. So we're in public comment. If you'd like to speak, please approach the uh, lectern. Oh, I'm sorry. If you haven't been sworn in, let's just, to be safe, please stand, raise your right hand, and we'll swear you in before you give any testimony or speak. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. All right. If you wish to speak, we're in public comment. Please approach the lectern. You have three minutes and state your name. And if you'd like to uh, form a line on this side of the room, and we'll keep it going. Go ahead, sir. Well, good evening, Council. Uh, I'm Jonathan Moore, 1501 West Cleveland Street, Tampa, Florida, president of Envision Advisors, a Tampa based owner's rep firm. Uh, the point that I want to make quickly is what is the alternative if this is not approved tonight? Um, I've been hired by Congregation Rodef Shalom to make sure that this new project is beneficial to them long term and the process of design, construction do not adversely impact operations at the synagogue. Although we're early in the project, I found the developer to be very responsive, cooperative, and fair in protecting the interests of not only Rodef, but also the surrounding properties. I strongly feel that multifamily projects and religious facilities are symbiotic uses. It's smart development. It really is a win-win for the community. And most importantly, it limits the size of the development for all of the reasons that the Garden Club wants. I don't stand in front of city council representing poor development. Uh, while I'm not overseeing this project, I feel that the design placement and the construction process is being discussed are sympathetic to working here and are the best solutions to keep this historic structure, the historic neighbor uh, and the area um, uh, proper while keeping up with the development trends in the area. Again, what is the alternative if this plan is not approved? My biggest fear is Rodef will sell. The synagogue will be demolished, and an even bigger project will be built, maybe with fewer waivers, but a bigger project will be built closer to Bayshore. I fully support this project and recommend you vote yes to approve moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please please state your name. You have three minutes. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of council. My name is Jack Ross. I'm here as a resi longtime resident of Tampa, um, as uh, a member of uh, Road of Shalom, and uh, representing the Tampa JCCs and Federation. I'm here speaking in favor of uh, petitioner's request this evening. Uh, the JCC, as you uh, all probably know, operates a preschool. The JCC preschool is very much in favor of this project, although we will now be moving and we're actively looking for alternative sites and we uh, will be reopening uh, in, in sufficient amount of time uh, to serve our community. This is smart development. This project ensures not only Rodolf's legacy, but it helps to usher in the era of Tampa in our development in preserving legacy, history, culture, and marrying it with smart development. I encourage you, uh, Council, not only for the City of Tampa, but also for the members of the Garden Club, whose alternative may be far worse than what they imagine uh, in approving this project. It is a project that preserves our history, looks to the future, and your colleagues around the country, other cities will look at Tampa and say, you got it right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, ma'am. Please state your name. And you have a speaker waiver form? No? No. Okay. You have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good evening, council members. My name is Elisa Fischel, and I am here representing the Tampa Jewish Community Centers and Federation, Top Jewish Foundation, and the JCC Preschool currently located on the property being discussed. Our address is 522 North Howard Avenue. I'm here this evening to speak in support of the proposed development project. As you are likely aware, the Jewish Community Center has operated a preschool at Congregation Road of Shalom for well over two decades, serving both <coughs> Jewish and non-Jewish families with the highest quality of early education available. Although the proposed development will cause the preschool to relocate, we are very excited about that possibility as we believe it will further enhance our ability to provide a quality early education to the entire South Tampa community. We are actively exploring several South Tampa locations. We are equally excited for Congregation Road of Shalom. The proposed development of the site will ensure that Road of Shalom, a Tampa cultural landmark for over 100 years at its current Bayshore location, will continue to endure. In addition, the proposed development represents a progressive and thoughtful example of how current development trends in the city of Tampa can coexist with Tampa's rich and important cultural history. As Tampa continues to experience exponential growth, the related Road of Shalom development project is a wonderful and smart example of how we can continue to emerge as one of the country's best livable cities, all the while preserving its historic roots. We encourage you to vote in favor of this project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir, next speaker. You have three minutes. Hi, my name is Andres Conworcel, and I'm the current rabbi of Congregation Rodef Sholom. Let me, <coughs> let me start with a blessing. Baruch atah Hashem, Elokeinu melech haolam, shecheyanu, vekiimanu, veigiyanu, lazman hazeh. Thank you, God, for allowing all of us to reach this moment. I'm here to say how beautiful our community is, how much good work it has been doing for the last 120 years. I'm originally from Uruguay. I moved to Mexico in the year 2000 when I met my wife and we had two kids. Then we moved to Vegas and we have been here for the last 10 years. We have been in beautiful communities, but none of them compares to Congregation Rodev Sholom. I studied as their cantor, and for the last three years, I'm serving as the rabbi, as the, their spiritual leader. During the last 50 years, the congregation has gone from around 500 members to our current less than 280 members. Even that we have a vibrant community with many events and people coming to live their Judaism every day as we have things going on every single day, we are facing some challenges that may cause our need to close our doors. Maybe not in the near future, but it's a possibility. We are thrilled to have the opportunity to guarantee that there will be Rodef Sholom for many generations to come. That there will be a Jewish presence in South Tampa to allow people to celebrate, to come together in happy and sad occasions, to continue the legacy that has been around for more than 3,000 years since Abraham. It's very important to the soul of our people, and it's very important for the soul of our beloved Tampa community. How great and how good it's for all of us, brothers and sisters, to be together. God bless all of you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yes, sir. My name is Ralph Marcatus. I live at 4913 St. Croix Drive, and it's hard following my rabbi, but I'll go ahead and do it. Um, I have a law office at, uh, on West Shore, south of Gandy, so I've seen growth in Tampa. I mean, y'all all know how, what's going on uh, down there on, on south of Gandy. We've got to welcome the growth in Tampa. We love Tampa. I know y'all love Tampa. This is our home. People want to move here, and we're going to have to welcome them and welcome them with good housing. Um, as you can see, I have my blue shirt on. I support the project. We hope that y'all do too. There's a little bit of a history. I was born in Tampa. I was born at St. Joseph's Hospital, the old one. My grandfather, my great-grandfather, who passed away in 1918, is buried at the Ola Cemetery. So we've been here a long time, and we've seen it change. One thing's for sure, we can't keep it like it was in 1918. People are moving here. Um, I was bar mitzvah at Rodef, 
Sholem. My father was bar mitzvah there. My three kids were bar mitzvah at Rodef Sholem. So the one thing, this is our, this is our home. Rodef is, and the people there are family. Um, this project helps support uh, the synagogue and, and keeps the synagogue financially secure. We drive up and down Bayshore. I drive up and down Bayshore all the time. I see high rises. I drive slowly, but I drive up there all the time. Five miles an hour. And this project, <laughs> this project is a perfect balance between charitable organization, private industry, and, and the related uh, group who, who's terrific, and there's other projects here. And you don't see many balances like that where you have a charity and private industry that's doing all these wonderful things for Tampa. We look forward to your support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Please state your name. You have three minutes. Uh, good evening, council members. My name is Jonathan Tannen. Uh, I live at 7915 Valley Money Road, uh, and I'm a board member at Congregation Road of Sholem. Uh, I just want to emphasize that this is an existential issue for the synagogue. Uh, we have an aging building that's going to require a lot of maintenance over uh, the coming years. Uh, this will give us an endowment that will allow us to maintain our building in perpetuity. Um, we have a menorah sculpture that everyone sees when they drive by Bayshore that is iconic. It is a symbol of the diversity of faith traditions in Tampa. It's a symbol of the Jewish community. We want that to be there for generations to come. And so I encourage you to support uh, this project. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir, please state your name. You have three minutes. Good evening. My name is Stephen Silverman. I am a commercial real estate broker. I'm a resident of South Tampa on Bayshore Boulevard, and I'm also a member of Rodef Shalom. When my clients go into a new area, it's always important to do due diligence and to understand what is allowed and what will be allowed. And by the same token, when people live in a neighborhood where the future land use and zoning allows other things to be developed, they are still free to always enjoy the rights that they have on their property, but they cannot prevent neighbors from getting to the highest and best use of their property. You enjoy inalienable rights when you have a property. Um, so the city of Tampa had a vision for how they wanted Tampa to look, and that's achieved by using zoning and future land use and a comprehensive plan. And in this particular area, multifamily is allowed, but zoning by itself is a blunt instrument, and modifications are often needed. When the developer makes a modification, it's called a plan modification or maybe a waiver. When the city makes a modification, I'm sorry, when the, develop, when the developer makes a plan, it's called a plan modification. When the city makes a modification, it's called a variance or a waiver. In this case, the issue is not whether multifamily can be built, because it can be built. The issue, rather, is how many square feet could it be or how high could it be. And so you have to bear that in mind. A difference of one or two floors is not a huge ask. Tampa has become, South Tampa has become very expensive, and the neighborhood's changing. I see the city, younger families have moved out. <coughs> this synagogue will change with the demographics. I see more people living in the multifamily, and those people will be walking to synagogue rather than driving to synagogue. Lastly, look at what Tampa's done. Tampa has recognized all these changes and figured out ways to make Tampa a vibrant community to live in. And the way they are doing that is by, with mixed use. Look at, um, at Midtown, where we see multifamily, hotel, retail, and restaurant. Look at Water Street, which is going to be our shining beacon to the world that Tampa has arrived. South Tampa is already a vibrant mixed-use com community, but it has an additional element that those other mixed-use communities don't have, and that is it already has religious institutions and houses of worship. So I see the, the, all this coming together as a place where people can live, work, and pray, because houses of worship are an essential part of a vibrant mixed-use community. I would even argue that they are the beating heart of the community. This, this is not the first time there are other res uh, religious institutions that have to adapt. 
The road of shalom is not the agent of change. They are seeking to adapt to change that has already occurred. Thank and you we request much, your help with it. Thank you, sir. Next speaker, please state your name. You have three minutes. Thank you, Council. My name is Stephen Hubbenstock. I'm currently a board member at Road of Shalom, and I'm speaking in support of this uh, zoning. I am a past president of Road of Shalom as well, and I want to just give you a little uh, historical uh, context for this situation. Over the years that uh, I was on the board and executive board and as president, we received offer after offer for people to come in and, and redevelop this property. And we decided to accept this offer because it did allow us to co-locate on this property uh, instead of moving away, losing our community, because we're, we're a community here. We, we've established a community since 1969 on this property, just as the Garden Club has established a community on their property over all these years. And we've had a, a great relationship with the Garden Club. I appreciate all the times that they've let us park in their parking lot, and we reciprocate, and when they have events, we let them park in our parking lot. And we actually, with this development, would have more parking spaces to offer them than we currently have with the way the property is developed uh, <coughs> currently. Tampa, uh, I'm a lifelong resident of Tampa. Uh, I was driving down Manhattan Avenue the other day and I noticed a, a big pile of concrete rubble. And it was a church that is now being demolished and something's going to get built in its place. I have a feeling it may be some housing. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the issue with faith-based community facilities like ours is that it's getting tougher and tougher to, to meet the demands that are out there for us to exist and maintain these properties and offer the community, uh, whether you're Jewish or any other faith, uh, a, a place to go to worship and, and be a group of people to get together and enlighten themselves and learn and be a part of the community. We've continuously supported the Tampa community with uh, good deeds and uh, so we would like to be able to stay in that property and, and be a part of the South Tampa community. Otherwise, we'd, we would lose that vicinity to South Tampa and, and a lot of the people that we serve. Uh, I also like to just talk about the waivers for a minute. The related group has, has come in and looked at what was possible for us to have their building and co-locate with them. Unfortunately, in today's environment, it's not easy to stay safe, just as we came through uh, metal detectors here. And allowing the waivers is allowing the security of, of the synagogue to be maintained. So Thank you very much. Thank sir. you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Please state your name. You have three minutes. Thank you. My name is Andrew Titan, and I live at 5006 Garrett Court in Tampa. I am also the audit chairman of Top Jewish Foundation and president of the board of Tampa Jewish Family Services. I'm also a past president of Congregation uh, Sherazadic, which is a uh, reformed Jewish temple here in Tampa. I'm here to support the granting of the related group zoning request and the variances that are needed for them to build the proposed condominium high-rise on Bayshore Boulevard. I know it's late, and you've heard this a million times, but I thought it'd be just smart if I just summarized, in my opinion, what the, what the main reasons for this change should be. I feel that the, the, there's three main reasons why you ought to grant, grant this variance and approve this request. First, this is important. The sale of the Road of Shalom land will provide the congregation with additional funding that will ensure its long-term future and will prevent this beautiful property from falling into disrepair. Temples, churches, they're all having challenges. This is something we just have to, you know, uh, accept. They have a solution here which will allow them to, you know, continue to exist and it will also allow them to keep their property looking nice. And as you drive down Bayshore, it's pretty and you really want it to stay that way. This solution will allow that to happen. 
Secondly, without this funding from this sale, the congregation may be forced to sell the property to another buyer who may want to build a bigger condominium that would occupy even more land and would bring even more traffic to the area. We're not going to get away from this problem. Condos are happening. People want to move to Tampa. We've done a good job selling the area. And we just have to accept the fact that, you know, with change, with progress, you know, things have to change with it. And thirdly, the 50-unit cond condominium should only have minimal impact on traffic in the area, and it will clearly generate additional property tax revenues. And of course, that will benefit schools, libraries, emergency services, and road maintenance. Thus, I respectfully request that you give this serious approval, serious consideration, and approve this variance. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Next speaker, please state your name. Good evening. My name is Beth Ann Gamunder, and I am here representing Tampa Jewish Family Services at 522 North Howard Avenue. And I am here to speak in support of the proposed developmental project. As you've heard so many times, Rodoff is such an important part of our community. And with so many of their congregants donating and supporting to the vital services that Tampa Jewish Services provides, it is able to increase what we're able to do in our Tampa Bay community to help those persons most, most in need, both Jewish and non-Jewish. We're able to help through our community food bank and through our emergency food bags that people could come in and get every day, of the, Monday through Friday during the week. We're able to help by offering our psychological and social wellness center where we provide counseling on a sliding fee scale to those persons who can't get mental health care anywhere else. And we also accept insurance from our patients. We provide educational program and we provide social services that are in such great need now more than ever and even at greater than at the height of COVID. We also have emergency financial assistance, which has escalated to a point where we have wait lists every single month to help cover the costs of rent and utilities and water and electricity. And with all that's happening in our community right now, the, the services that we provide are needed more than ever. And if there's for some reason is a service that Tampa Jewish Family Services cannot provide, we have a vibrant referral service to make sure that every person in our community who's in need of assistance is guided towards a place where they can get the help they need. I truly urge you to support RODAF in their development project. Their family is part of our family, and we support each other to make our community a more vibrant place and to keep their historic relevance here in Tampa Bay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am, you have three minutes to state your name. Thank you. Thank you, City Council members. My name is Francine Levine. I live at 3211 West Lawn Avenue. I've lived in Tampa for 39 years. My husband, Dennis Levine, is a Tampa native and lifelong member of Road of Shalom. We were married at Road of Shalom 38 years ago tomorrow. My husband and I have both served in leadership positions at the synagogue, and we know that in, over the past few years, we've turned down many offers of development because they required our spiritual home to relocate. Because of the financial support we'll receive from this development, we believe our synagogue can maintain its presence for my children and my grandchildren. We believe in the ideals held sacrosanct of conservative Judaism, embracing tradition but recognizing the need for change. And we want to remain a visible presence that Tampa is a diverse and welcoming community. Please support our project. Thank you very much. Yes, sir, please state your name. You have a speaker waiver for him? He'll read off the names, and if those uh, on the list would please raise their hands. I count three names. Uh, Nucci Smith, do I see you here? Could you could raise your hand, please. Nucci Smith, thank you. Cindy Gooding of Gooding, thank you. And uh, uh, Charla Wash, thank you. Three additional names. All right, you have six minutes. Please state your name and go ahead. Uh, thank you for staying this late. My name is Michael Meckley. I live at 2715 West Chaton. I've lived there for 35 years. It's a short walk to Bayshore. I am in favor of development in our city to support our population and provide suitable housing for the people who work and live in our community. I want the synagogue to remain and thrive in its current location. At the same time, I want the Tampa Garden Club 
to both remain and thrive in its current location. What I am not in favor of is making exceptions to allow more density in areas where more density will make an already overdeveloped situation worse, especially when the exceptions are made for the benefit of a few <coughs> uber wealthy individuals. I'm also not in favor of making exceptions for the benefit of one community organization, in this case, the synagogue, to the detriment of another one, in this case, the Tampa Garden Club. Before I get into the development itself, I want to review a couple of things. The roads in the, and, and again, I apologize for repeating some of this stuff. The roads in the general area are overcrowded today with limited ability to expand the roads. The comprehensive plan includes a significant number of undeveloped, medium and high density parcels in this area, including several zoned RD3 very close to this parcel. The situation is bad already and is certain to get worse in the future when these parcels are developed without any exceptions. And of course, you know it's in a coastal high hazard area. It, regarding the development, people have already mentioned the previously approved waivers. It's not clear to me, but it seems like if they relate to the prior PD, they should have to be brought back and get approved again. Regarding the north and south setbacks, as you can see from this document, the current PD has the current building, that's the red outline, set back an appropriate distance from the north lot line and outside the required radius of that large oak tree. I also want to point out that in the plan set, it says the existing setback on this side is 13.5 feet. That is not correct. The 13.5 feet is this area way in the front, which is remaining. It jogs back, and the existing setback is closer to about 20 feet on the back side, where the uh, new development is going to go. If you look at this, this gives you a visual of what you're talking about in terms of where they would like to place the existing building right here versus where the, uh, I'm sorry, the proposed building versus where the existing building sits. So you can see that the existing building is set back much further than what they're proposing. Other than to allow the development of too large a building, there is no reason the north setback should be modified from where the current building sits. And the south, set, south setback should be 15 feet, which is the same as the west setback. The final thing I'd point out is there is a street buffer on all three sides of this project other than the garden club. So in terms of the uh, side of the, the project that needs the buffer the most, it's clearly the garden club side because it doesn't have a street. The developer's request to change the north and south setbacks should be denied. Regarding the west and the landscape buffer, the green is the landscape buffer, the blue is the right-of-way line. I think this has already been brought up, but the 15-foot setback on this side is really disingenuous because if you put the entire eight feet inside the property, it would, the building would have to be set back 21 feet to accommodate the port cochet and the entry drive, which they talked about earlier. Other people have mentioned the probability of needing to widen Isabella is high. So if you give away six feet of right away, and then you have to take that back for expansion later, then you only end up with a two foot buffer, which you know, again is way too small uh, concerning safety uh, situation. Lastly, I wanna talk about the scale of the building and the density of the project. 42 units, seven bonus units, no one said this, 225,000 square feet of living space, 354 feet tall. All of this on just over one acre. The reason the scale and size of this development is so offensive is not complicated. It's simply because the units are averaging 4,500 square feet. I'd love to see a show of hands, I'm not gonna ask. How many people in this room live in a house of 4,500 square feet? I'm sure it's a small number. By way of comparison, the recently built Hyde Park house is 3,000 square feet on average. What's allowed in the maximum, for the maximum under the current PD is unclear, but section 27-227 of the code indicates 120 feet. And another reminder, this is medium density. This is not high density. I'm a developer. The suggestion that co-location can only be accomplished with this design is just false. And the suggestions that the only options are to do this or tear it down, that's false too. Without the requested exceptions, the applicant built a substantial building with sizable units 
where the size and scale of the building would be compatible with the existing surrounding area. The request for the bonus unit should be denied and the height of the building should be limited. Let me close with a final important point. The applicant said they reached out to the neighborhood. They never met with the neighborhood. There's a big difference between saying I'm in conversation with the neighborhood versus actively and proactively meeting with the neighborhood and trying to see if you can find common ground. That never happened. There's no competent substantial evidence offered by the applicant to justify granting any element of their request. This is simply a case of overreaching. From every standpoint, the request is negative to the area. Please preserve this area and represent the entire community by denying this application. And I have some documents that I referred to to put into the record. If you would give them to the attorney and he'll uh, take them. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Next speaker, please say your name. You Sorry. have three minutes. All right, my name is, uh, good evening, my name is Bo Allen. I live at 2725 South Isabella Avenue. Um, Councilwoman, earlier tonight you requested some clarification regarding zoning west of the proposed development. Right across the street from Isabella and a photo was shown, that is my home. Um, we've heard from many individuals tonight, mostly from Rodef Shalom and the Garden Club, but we have not heard that many from uh, neighbors that live in the direct vicinity of the proposed site. I believe I speak on their behalf when I say, Please deny this proposal. Uh, the advent of construction on, of the Altura condos, which is directly south, <clears throat> excuse me, of where I live, just shows how disruptive these projects can be. It is noisy, overwhelming, dirty. Um, they, cr they disturb the community and create congest congestion with foot and vehicle traffic. These lengthy con construction projects lead to a total lack of privacy and an inability to enjoy outdoor spaces. Uh, furthermore, as I said, my home is two stories high. If this proposal goes through, my neighbors and I will be completely boxed in by these luxury condo high-rises. Uh, not only will my access to natural sunlight be completely occluded, but I fear it for the health of my centuries, centuries old oak tree, and my lovely mango tree in my backyard. I fail to see how this project benefits any current community members that live in the direct vicinity of it, and I know from experience how poorly equipped the area is for the increase in pedestrian in vehicle traffic. Please consider myself and my neighbors on Isabel and Barcelona who are being completely boxed in by these luxury, luxury high-rise condos. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Ms. Perrine, are you the last speaker? Yeah. Anybody else? All right. Stephanie Pointer, are you the closer? <laughs> yep. All right. Very good. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Please state your name. You have three minutes. Good evening. My name is Laura Kreitzer. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in behalf of this project. Uh, my family and I have been members of Congregation Rodef Shalom for nearly 50 years. We joined within a couple of weeks of Uncle Sam kindly inviting my husband to come to McDill to be a me medical officer. I've also had the honor and responsibility of serving as president of our congregation. So I have experienced the challenges that modern day synagogues face, including the financial pressure of maintaining facilities and services. Road of Shalom did not embark on the relationship with related group lightly. Our current leadership made the very pragmatic decision that the proposed project will guarantee our ability to remain in our spiritual home in its long-term location for as long as conservative Judaism is alive and flourishing in South Tampa. The face of, Tampa, of Bayshore Boulevard has been changing for at least 40 years. It's disingenuous to think that allowing an additional residential tower to be built on our property will somehow change the current nature of the neighborhood. But the but the potential loss or relocation of Rhoda Sholem, part of the heart and soul of all of Jewish Tampa, would be an irreparable change. As you saw in the earlier slideshow, the menorah on our building, which metaphorically shines proudly on Bayshore Boulevard, is a symbol of life, light, faith, and community. 
By allowing this project to go forward, <coughs> it will permit Road of Sholem to continue to serve with its light undiminished. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Please state your name. You have three minutes. Hi, uh, my name is Pamela Jackson Haney, and I have lived in South Tampa for 30 years. I'm a founding member of the Tampa Tree Advocacy Group. Um, I'm here to ask you to save the grand trees on this property. They are <laughs> priceless and non-hazardous. The developer acquired this property um, knowing full well that it holds the majestic grand trees that are protected by law and yet the developer seeks waivers in order to destroy them. The seemingly insignificant procedure of getting rid of a few more grand trees in the name of progress is no longer insignificant and needs to stop. The requirement for this lot is to save only 50% of the trees. The developer is asking to retain 20%. Section 27-284.2.5 of the City Code discusses the standards and criteria needed for making a decision to approve the removal of a grand tree. Not one of these trees meets the criteria for removal, and thus they all need to remain as they are. It's imperative that they do, and it's the law. In addition, this site would not be able to accommodate the required mitigation, so more money would have to be poured into the already overflowing South Tampa Tree Trust Fund. Where are the reasonable reconfigurations? While maybe not ideal for the developer, it's time to get creative, build something reasonable for this parcel. It's a small price to pay to save grand trees. Regarding the grand tree that is shared with the garden club, that tree should be hands off and given a wide berth in order to save it. That's being a good new neighbor. As you all know, the new City of Tampa Tree Canopy and Urban Forest Analysis came out last month. Since 2011, we have lost over 3,300 acres of tree canopy, which is roughly the size of clear cutting four Davis Islands. Each year, Tampa's urban forest reduces 1,004 tons of air pollutants that cause respiratory problems. It um, reduces residential building air conditioning. It reduces 74.8 million cubic feet of stormwater runoff. Look to our neighbors to the south, specifically Miami and West Palm Beach, who have lost significant numbers of type one trees due to poor planning and development. The flooding in those two cities alone is horrid. They also store 1.4 million tons of carbon. 92% of Tampa residents highly value our trees. Long-term residents feel trees and the ecosystems they support are connected to the historical sense of place and want them in their future for their children and grandchildren. Now more than ever, we need to save these grand trees to benefit our environment because we are losing them at a rapid pace. It is scientifically proven that large old trees provide the most benefit to our environment Surprising, these grand trees not only make up less than 1% of our tree's canopy. In closing, the synagogue and the developer will still make hefty profits if we save these grand trees. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Next speaker, please state your name. Bob Whitmore, the executive director of City Tree, the Citizens Action Group. You promised me. You promised me on the campaign trail and you made a commitment at the tree workshop on April 27th. You told me you cared about the canopy. Everybody that comes in front of you and wants a variance is going to have a reason to cut down trees. 24 trees they want to take down. Related took down 30 trees to put up the building behind this property. Now, Ricky's going to come up here later, and he's going to, like, tell you about all the magic that they're going to work to replant those trees on this property. It's not going to happen. It's not. The money is going to go into the tree fund, and they're going to mitigate it in some mythical spots throughout the city that don't exist, and boom, we're done. We got 54 trees that are out of, out, out of the canopy. One acre of land is what they're building on. Did you see that monster? One acre of land they're going to build this property on? And I think it's a little appalling that related is sort of hiding behind the synagogue to get what they want done. They can sell that property 
in the, in the synagogue can make money with that property. They just won't make as much money if related is allowed to put this monstrosity that's going to cause so much problems. And in my field of study, take down so many trees. We have got to take and make the, have the political will to stop the destruction of the canopy. Activists can't do this. We can't do it. We just can't. It shows five years of destruction, 7% of the canopy lost across the city, and 18% of the canopy lost in South Tampa. And you guys, all, all due respect, are like, this is appalling. How does this happen? How are we going? Let's get, a, let's get a tree czar. That's what we'll do. We'll get a tree czar. No. No. No tree czars. Just look at development rationally. Look at it as how we can actually work with the trees. Let's put something reasonable in there. It doesn't have to be this thing. It doesn't have to be. The synagogue will get their money for the property. Related or somebody else can build a building and we're good. We don't lose trees. Everybody's happy. People don't have to live in the shade anymore. You know, 10 o'clock doesn't mean to be sunrise for people in some parts of South Tampa. We can do this, but we need to have the political will. I am so grateful to see you people up there. I really am. I know that each one of you sincerely cares about the canopy and about the city of Tampa. And it's only by getting in the way of these things one pro I want to go out of business. I don't want to come here anymore. It's only by getting in front of these things one project at a time that we are not going in five years say we're down to 23% canopy. Like Miami. We can't do it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm sorry? Bob Whitmore. No, it's for the record. Oh. No, no, you're good. She didn't get your name, so. Thank you. Three, four, five, six, seven. That's okay. That's okay. I'll get Mr. Chairman, I have a speaker waiver forum with seven names. And we'll begin. Ann Levengood Giles. Yes. Thank you. Kelly McGuire. Kelly McGuire. Oh, excuse me, Kathy McGuire. Is Kathy McGuire present? I don't see Kathy McGuire. Mike Fanning. Okay, Grace Kelly. What, is Kathy McGuire here, did you say? If Kathy McGuire is not here, we can add Mike Fanning. <coughs> well, we don't have Mike Fan on this list. I can put it on there. <laughs> okay, you want an extra minute? No objection to the extra minute? Okay. Thank you, Julia. Grace, Thank you, Julia. Grace Kelly. Thank you. <laughs> Carolyn Franchesi. Did I say it correctly? Cheryl Smith. Thank you. <laughs> Elena Coates. Thank you. And Weatherly Bentley. Without objection, 10 minutes. Thank you. Go ahead. Please say your name. You have 10 minutes. It says six. Got it. it Hi, my name is Carol Ann Bennett. I'm a founding member of TTAG. Councilman Vieira, Maniscalco, and Miranda. You voted in 2021 to, quote, remove the ability to utilize FAR for single-use residential multifamily. You did this because, quote, City Council considered numerous rezoning requests for single-use residential developments. During such hearings, City Council repeatedly sought direction regarding Comp Plan Objective 1.1, directing future population concentrations away from the coastal high hazard area to achieve a no net increase in overall residential density within the CHHA. Quote, in order to protect and preserve the public health, safety, and welfare, City Council directs staff to prepare an amendment to the comprehensive plan. The Tampa Bay Times wrote an in-depth analysis of how much worse the damage in Tampa would have been compared to Fort Myers if Hurricane Ian 
had hit Tampa as projected. Urban Tampa Bay summed it up better than I can. Quote, it doesn't make much sense to allow new development in locations which are at high risk of inundation during flood events. Every property developed in such locations is another property the rest of us will be subsidizing in perpetuity with our insurance and disaster relief payments, end quote. Councilman Miranda Maniscalco and Vieira, in 2022, you again voted unanimously to eliminate FAR for land use categories CMU 35, CC 35, and UMU 60, quote, prohibiting the use of the FAR option for single-use multifamily residential projects within the South Tampa or New Tampa planning distance. Make no mistake, the related group is building single use. The related group does not own places of religious assembly. Also in 2022, Beach Park brought it to your attention that they had RMU 100 in their neighborhood. You voted unanimously for a third time to add that land use, to add that land use category because your intent was to eliminate the excess density of single use multifamily residential in South Tampa. This property is R35. There are only three other R35s in South Tampa and it was not included in those motions. But that doesn't matter because before you today is exact same thing you voted to eliminate unanimously three times. Excess density where it doesn't make sense. So you must decide, are you going to be consistent with the intent when you voted repeatedly against excess density in the CHA, quote, in order to protect and preserve the public health, safety, and welfare? If you choose to split hairs by saying it's R35, not CC35, you'll be explaining yourself for the next four years to all the people who came to the candidate forum that was held at the Garden Club. They are calling this excess density a bonus agreement. If you look at the page titled bonus um, provisions that I gave you, you'll see that this actually makes it even easier for you to, to deny. It points out that bonus provisions are subject to city council approval and are not a by right provision. If this is underdeveloped, why do they need a bonus agreement? Vote no on the bonus agreement. Last month, you got a peek at the new tree report. The percentage that the coverage has de decreased is terrible. The South Tampa percentage is the worst in just five years. It is because of projects like this one. Related wants to remove 24 healthy live oaks. Three of them are grand oaks. On these pages from the tree report, you'll see that live oaks are 33% of the value of our tree canopy. But live oaks only make up 3% of the tree canopy. Here you'll see live oaks. The, the light color is the percentage, oops, sorry, can you see it? Nope, there it is. This is the percentage of live oaks, it's 3%. This is the percentage of the leaf area of live oaks. It's the greatest. It's only 3% of the canopy, but it has more leaf area than any other tree. They are the workhorses of our, of our um, tree canopy. Uh, shoot, there we go. What are the consequences of this to the public? We have had the hottest nine years on record. Areas with tree canopy are six degree, degrees cooler than areas without it. We need to get used to hearing the phrase urban heat island effect because we're going to have a lot more of it if we don't stop the decimation of our canopy. You want to know how much it's worth? The annual benefits of our canopy are $306 million a year. The loss adds up to $12,240,000 a year. Every year, how much would our city benefit from an extra $12,240,000 a year? What area floods more than Bayshore Boulevard? How much does flooding cost our city? Well, you know what? They figured it out. This is how much it costs our city. Uh, $4.9 million of runoff is avoided with our tree canopy. $4.9 million. Live oaks alone save the city about a million dollars a year in runoff. The value of avoided runoffs, runoffs cannot be replaced. What is free flood pre prevention? The 24 live oaks on this property. You'd have to be crazy to cut down 24 oaks on one of the most flood prone streets in the city. During the campaign, you said you understood the importance of the tree. Now is when you get the power to do just that. Our mayor saw the bad tree report and sprang into action. She's had press conferences talking about her plans to save our trees and to plant 30,000 more. We are a team, you, the mayor, all of us. 
The mayor can get trees planted and change the penalties for illegal tree cutting. You can say no to waivers to remove grand trees. You can say no to waivers to remove more than 50% of the trees. Support the mayor, support the residents, and protect our trees like the solid gold infrastructure they are. The related group can build on this property. All they have to do is pull permits. If they build what they are actually entitled to with no waivers, they can still remove 50% of the trees. They can build 42 units that are allowed by right. The units won't cost $5 million, which is what they, said. they told us these units are gonna cost. They'll be better. They'll be smaller and more affordable. That benefits everyone, not just a few. I got this slide from Gina Grimes. It has never been the policy, it's never been the law that a landowner is always entitled to the highest and best use of his land. The Senate got, got a PPD rezoning in 2005. Later they asked for an amendment to sell half an acre. If you look at the next page I gave you, you will see that they were granted the change only if they committed to preserving all of the trees and yet here they are today asking to cut down 80% of those trees. Promises aren't worth the paper they are written on. When, and I mean when, not if, the synagogue becomes residential, all the remaining trees on the synagogue's land will be killed too. There is nothing requiring them to stay. If they get an offer they can't refuse, they can do whatever they want. The agreement about restricting what can be built in the future is gonna be thrown out the window. I would love to see Congregation Road of Shalom stay on Bayshore Boulevard, but you cannot vote yes because you want them to stay. You cannot vote yes under threat of something worse. That is not competent and substantial evidence, and you must base your decision on evidence only. All their assurances evaporate the day after you vote yes. You are expressly forbidden from basing your decision on what this synagogue might do in the future. On the other hand, the comp plan requires you to prevent harm to the surrounding neighbors. LU policy 9.3.8 states that, quote, new residential redevelopment projects shall be minimally disruptive to adjacent areas. To achieve this, the city shall assess the potential positive and negative impacts of residential development pro projects. They said they can't build what they want without waivers. Well, then it was the wrong property for them to buy. The Planning Commission said the pattern of de development is 14.7 units per acre. The comp plan requires you to make sure these developments are compatible with the pattern of development. They, they told you the pattern of development is 14.7 units per acre. Danny Collins told you. You must be consistent with your previous votes to protect and preserve the public health, safety, and welfare. I ask you to preserve our tree canopy, which benefits everyone. I ask you to vote on competent and substantial evidence only. I ask you to protect the surrounding properties as the comp plan mandates. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am, next speaker. I have a, a waiver for an additional minute. Thank you, Nancy Criswell. Thank you, an additional minute, please. No, it's okay. Can you clear the seat out? <laughs> well, thank you. Yes, sir. Good evening, I'm Lorraine Perino, president of the Tampa Tree Advocacy Group. Just last year, Miami-based developer, the related group demolished the middle-income Bay Oaks apartments on Bayshore. In constructing a super luxury condo there, it destroyed 30 mature live oak trees, the most valuable trees in the state of Florida. Now the related group is at it again, constructing yet another luxury condo on Bayshore, asking city council to ignore city code protecting these valuable trees by allowing it to keep only 20% of the trees. Let me state that again. The related group wants a special waiver to destroy 80% of the live oak trees on the property, including three healthy old growth live oaks, one a healthy 50 inch live oak. Yes, the related group wants per permission from you city council to destroy 24 live oaks, the most valuable trees in the state of Florida, plus three grand live oaks, so they can increase their vast wealth at Tampa's expense. Let us call this out for what it really is, corporate greed at its worst. Where does it stop? You city council must stop this.
because when it comes to corporate greed, it is never enough. The 2016 Tree Canopy and Urban Forest Analysis rated Tampa's tree canopy a healthy 33.3%. That same year, Miami-Dade, the related group's headquarters, had a very substandard tree canopy of 19% due to unbridled ambition and overbuilding by the city and developers like the related group. Miami-Dade's very poor tree canopy start, sparked huge concern, resulting in Million Trees Miami, an ambitious city corporate initiative, initiative to plant a million trees by 2020. It did not reach its goal. The question before us today is this. Is City Council willing for Tampa's tree canopy to become as degraded as Miami-Dade's was in 2016? The just released 2021 tree canopy and urban forest analysis informs us that Tampa's tree canopy declined by 4% in the past five years. A closer look shows that Tampa lost 7% of its tree canopy since 2016 and 13% since 1995. South Tampa alone lost an astounding 18% of tree canopy and flood prone Davis Island lost 10%. If the citywide push for growth and development continues at breakneck speed, as did Miami-Dade's, Tampa will lose another 7% of tree canopy in five years, decreasing to 23%. Tampa is then on a very slippery slope to tie Miami-Dade's 2016 19% tree canopy. Add the 24 live oak trees that the related group wants to remove to the 30 mature oak trees it removed last year, and the destroyed trees amount to an astounding 54 trees including three grand oaks, the most valuable trees in all of Florida. This developer will destroy a small forest of trees, no matter the great harm to Tampa's ecosystem, merely to satisfy its boundless corporate greed and ambition. Is City Council really willing to appease the self-indulgent greed of developers like the related group, allowing it to destroy even more of Tampa's disappearing tree canopy than it already has? The City of Tampa's forest examiner has found this rezoning to be inconsistent. Development and growth management also found it inconsistent. You, City Council, must decide if you will follow the code and protect Tampa's tree canopy and healthy Grand Oaks, or if instead you are willing to grant waivers to irresponsible developers all too willing to destroy Tampa's <coughs> old growth oak trees. City Council, you must follow the code, or better yet, strengthen it, making it impossible for developers to request tree destroying waivers. That is why the city codes were codified, and that is why you were elected to enforce them to preserve Tampa's natural resources for today and future generations. You have a responsibility to all Tampa residents to protect Tampa's natural beauty and natural resources from the ambitious, the greedy, the selfish, and from developers interested only in their own financial profit. Thank you Please vote much. no to these tree-killing waivers. Thank you very much. Next speaker. I'm sorry, last speaker, please. <laughs> we did it. Yes, ma'am, please state your name. You have three I'm coming, minutes. I'm no. coming. I got to wait for All right. Oh, wait. Too many white pieces of paper. Uh, the handout, you mean? Uh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> it looks like uh, six names. A uh, Bob Weck. Thank you. Catherine Favada. Thank you. Elizabeth Weck. Thank you. Sam Werner. Thank you. Corinne uh, Gertner. Thank you. And Wendell Gertner. A total of six plus three. Right. Good evening. My name is Stephanie Pointer. Um, I, I handed you a copy of this resolution that Carol Ann mentioned. It is resolution number 2021-273. But what's almost as important is the next piece of paper that I gave you with this large type at the top. Um, because I want, you to, I want you to take just a minute and look at the highlighted sections because what it says here is what city council asked for, okay? And what city council asked for was council also directed staff to review the use of FAR in the single residential use residential multifamily developments. They did, they never mentioned this nifty little R35. My guess why? Because there's only four of them in all of South Tampa, including this one. Okay, so even though it's not in this ordinance, it certainly goes along with the spirit of this ordinance where we were not 
allowing FAR, where you can't buy bonus density, okay? So they overlook these four very small parcels. And the other three already have something pretty significant on them. So when we think about the big picture of things, city council in 2021 voted not once, not twice, but three times to keep, to put this ordinance in place. And this wasn't even anything that the South of Gandy folks asked for because we never got to FAR. We never got to 1.0. This bonus density agreement, I, my mouth hangs open. $144,000 for seven units? Oh my goodness. Please, can you sign me up for where I can go to hand somebody $144,000 and get probably about $30 million out of it? Please tell me where I can go shop for that because I need that kind of money. I would buy some affordable housing like the church did at the corner of, um, somebody mentioned it earlier, Bay Vista and Manhattan said, oh, they're, they're building these units there. Well, guess what? The church sold it to an affordable housing developer. Their only requirement was that they get to name it, and they named it. It's a hundred a hundred affordable housing units in South Tampa. Now, um, we've heard a lot this evening about a lot of different things that had nothing to do with competent, substantial evidence. The history, nothing to do with it. What we want to do there, nothing to do with it. There is no boogeyman standing in the corner that is going to create a new development five minutes after you say no for this. There is no boogeyman, I'm telling you. Every developer under the sun has come up here and said, well, it could be much worse. We can build this and we can build that. That's, it's a farce. The bottom line is, this is what they think is a good deal. And don't tell me that everybody was treated respectfully because you know what, Carol Ann and I are here tonight because we got a phone call from the garden club ladies. Now, I want you to look at the ladies in red. They like gardening and trees. And Related Group wanted them to take out their joint tree. I mean, seriously, that was the first conversation that we had about this. They called us because they said, these people want to take away our tree. <clears throat> well, guess what? This project will still take out that tree because they're building too stinking close. There was a gentleman here earlier that talked about five to 10 pounds of sugar. You all know that I'm a, I, I would say something much, much worse. When do we start making people follow the rules? This is four and a half, five million dollar units. This is not affordable housing. This is not gonna create a place for anyone to live. Nobody calls that hotline and says, I can't find a four and a half or five million dollar property. I can't find it. It's, it's not there. I haven't heard this developer tell us, we'll build sidewalks around it. We'll build sidewalks for the people across the street. If you are working with the neighborhood and you are not talking at the neighborhood, then you're talking to them about the things that they say they need. And how many people came here tonight and said, we don't have any sidewalks. We're going to have to walk in the street, but we didn't see any of that. These people are going to make millions and millions of dollars. I'd also like to say that in the staff report, it says that they're buying with the bonus density seven units, but they can only build 42. But then we talked about 50. I don't know about y'all, but I did teach third grade math for a long time. And 42 plus seven is 49, not 50. So we can't let them have 50 either because that's not what they asked for and that's not what's in the bonus agreement. Please, I'm sure I'm forgetting something. Um, medium density. Yes, medium density, medium density. Ann gave you a paper with a brown box on it, medium density. That says eight stories high. They wanna build 21 more stories on top of that. That's not medium, that's extra large. That's XX level. That's, that, really cool guy that was here earlier, that guy. That, so again, we're back to 10 pounds of shizzle and a five pound bag. Please take a look at these before you make a decision because somebody said we weren't gonna do this to South Tampa anymore. As a matter of fact, I think at least one, maybe even two of you stood up and said South Tampa's full at the Garden Club in the last 90 days. 
we're full. And you know what, south of Gandy, it does count. Because those hundred cars that are going to live there, I got to get past to get home from here. It impacts us every single day. The coastal high hazard area is not supposed to have any new density. Danny Collins said 14.7 units per acre. Why are we even discussing it? We have to spend all this time and energy to protect the folks in our city from somebody from Miami. We don't want to be another Miami. I didn't move to Miami. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with Miami, but I didn't move to Miami. I moved to Tampa. It's also in a VE flood zone. I don't have any evidence of it with me. Anybody have any questions? I still have two minutes. Thank you okay, very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> that concludes public comment. <laughs> <laughs> we don't allow joy and celebration in here. Thank you. There will be no joy. No joy. Um, yes, ma'am. Councilwoman Henderson. Yes, I just want to get it on the record officially for um, one of the waivers, Section 27-290.1E, to allow an increase um, of the fence or wall in the front yard. It says Bayshore Boulevard and Barcelona from um, three <laughs> feet to six feet. Is that shown in the site plans? I was looking at that, and I couldn't tell. Um, and I just want to get that in the record. Um, yes, LaShawn Doc Development Coordination. Yeah. And um, Councilwoman, what was the last part of your question? Was it, it shown on the site plan? It says that section, section 27290 to allow an increase in the allowed fence wall height in the front yard, yes. Bayshore Boulevard, and Barcelona Street from three feet to six feet. Yes, that is identified. That is the waiver requested, and that is um, listed on the site right, plan. Right, but is it, is it in the site plans? The on wall? the site plan, it, it is one. listed and shown. She's pulling it up. She's going to. Oh, okay. It is a security fence. So let me. It's, okay. It's not decorative. Maybe that's why I couldn't tell. Well, it's shown as a dashed line. So what happens is some of the lines, they don't bleed into each other, but they're all lines. You've got the property line, mm -hmm. um, and then you've got the setback line that's shown, and then you've got the fence line. So it says proposed security fence, and it points here. This is it with the line and the dot. Okay. And that's what is proposed. This is considered the front yard, so that is the need for the waiver to allow that fence at six feet. Also, the last one is, is there any effort to save the trees? I remember University of Tampa, they saved a very big tree when they built the lacrosse field. The grand trees in particular, is there an effort to like pick them up and save them? I, didn't I believe I'll let the applicant speak to that. <laughs> okay. All right, are we now going into rebuttal? Or would this not count for rebuttal? She's, no, no she's asking a specific question. Yes, Mr. Petter. Just to be on the record. No, before we begin the rebuttal period, if you have any additional questions for staff or the applicant before they do rebuttal, remember the rebuttal is their last word. Okay. So if you have any questions, now would be the appropriate time. If you have any questions of the applicant after rebuttal, then you can address that, what they raised during rebuttal. But as of now, uh, be, give them the last word if you have any questions. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. No, no, you're, no you're, you're good. Okay. Thank you very much. Ms. Mandel. Before I get into rebuttal, I just want to clarify. There was questions that were asked. Are those supposed to be answered now before I get into rebuttal? Because rebuttal is my opportunity to, to respond to everything. But I, my re recollection is, is we do all the questions before we end with rebuttal. So if those are questions that needed to be answered by members of the team, isn't now the time for them to answer those questions? Did you want to ask Mr. Federico about the trees? The trees? I don't know who's supposed to answer that. I, I mean, <laughs> no, I, that's why I want to clarify it. Should, I mean, if there was a question posed, then I, I whoever, is a question. Whoever, whoever is appropriate to answer the question. Yeah, it won't cut into your rebuttal time. 
Oh, I just wanted to make sure we're doing it yeah. in process. Thank you. Mr. Pederica. Thank you, Council. Ricky Pederica, Dark Moss, I've been sworn. And with me is Artie Sancho with Kimway Horn. I've been sworn in as well. Um, there are three grand trees proposed on the west side of, of the existing synagogue. And by proposing the other half of the development on the west side of those and providing access, uh, the access proposed is in conflict with the tree protection of those three trees. And so we tried, we evaluated several criteria or several configurations. Two of them are in your packet as the reasonable recon to preserve uh, one or two of those trees and characterized the impact to the site plan that results from the preservation of two of those grand trees. Okay. So yeah. I, oh, yeah. To, to add to Ricky's point, um, you know, the redevelopment of the site and the preservation of the synagogue require add some constraints. And to, to Ricky's point, the constraint of the access um, affects the, uh, the existing trees there. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you very much. You. If there are no other questions, we will go to the applicant for rebuttal. Any other questions? I'll, if I may, I'll do it after rebuttal. You have questions after rebuttal? Then you know what? Then I'll, I'll I mean, if I can. Go ahead. Okay, my question before we begin. Councilman Vieira, are, do you wish to have a, a discussion or raise some issues or concerns? Do you want to have a discussion prior to rebuttal? Is that what you're suggesting? A little from A, a little from B. I mean, I did have some inquiries. I, I, I typically do it after rebuttal because maybe my questions are answered in, in their rebuttal. And that's, that's <coughs> if that's the case, that's fine. If, the, if the rebuttal raises questions or questions that are left unanswered, mm -hmm. perhaps. But the question is, if you want to answer, ask your questions now, then they could spend the time if it's okay with the chair, I'll wait until after rebuttal. He may have his answers. Okay, but just be rebuttal. prepared. If we, not, we can, if we we'll get open the floor again for rebuttal. Yes, sir. Let me just say this, Mr. Chairman. I just, uh, in fact, in this case, in, in every case that we have, uh, uh, and I know there's, there's a lot of people with a lot of feelings one way and a lot of people with feelings the other way. You have three entities here. You have synagogue, you have garden center, and you have the developer. But what we've heard and the preponderance of thing is what if I don't do this, I get that, and about money and all that. That has nothing to do with the rezoning. Yep. It is about whatever is on the docket that we're looking at, whatever you present, whatever they present, whatever the rebate, debate is, whatever this council hears is the rezoning. Not about what if, if I don't have enough money to survive. And I understand that, and I understand that, and I perfectly understand that a lot of things are going to change. However, I see things go down, and the same things in any business goes down. When the youth comes back, they go up. And I know parks and recreation has nothing to do with this zoning. But our attendance in parks and recreation in some parts are down, all the way down. You know why? Everybody's my age. However, when the young kids come in, it's go back up. So it's a circle of life that happens. And I'm not, I'm not saying this is, they're not going to get that and put it into this zoning. But all the zonings stand on their own. Not about this benefit or demise or demise and benefit. And it's about the rezoning. And that's all I got to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I'll, may I say something? Yes, if sir. I may. Thank you. I'll, you're like, just say it here. <laughs> um, and, and thank you very much. I wanted to build on something that Councilman Miranda said. It, you know, including ta taking some issues off the table that I think are, are important for our consideration that, you know, a, a lot of, uh, we hear a lot of residents talk about construction, et cetera, et cetera. There, there's the, the, the view that says, no further building in a part of Tampa than there's the view, particularly on this development, that goes, something's going to happen there, right? So in other words, c construction, noise, all that stuff, I, I think it's, 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 it's reasonable to say that will happen. Uh, whether it's because of this being approved or something in the future, something of that nature will happen. Um, I, I think the more persuasive case against this development is not the idea of no more building, but not, not saying that I'm here because I'm, I'm listening to everything, et cetera, that's for sure, um, but is the uh, sugar bag, right, which is 
Is it a little too much uh, for that? Something that the applicant obviously has to address um, in, in their rebuttal. You know, like Councilman Miranda said, we've heard a lot of very, very compelling uh, factual statements uh, with regards to the future of the Garden Club, with regards to the future of the synagogue, things that are very, very compelling uh, in, in, in terms of narratives on the city, factual issues, et cetera, et cetera, whether they're competent, substantial evidence is obviously a whole other issue uh, in terms of our, um, our consideration here. Um, for, for example, the, the issue of the selling of the property, what, what happens if we don't do this, will the property be sold, et cetera, you know, some people say that's a threat. Could be a, a fa statement of fact. You've got a big property on Bayshore. A lot of people want that. So that, but again, competent, substantial evidence. I, I, I don't think so. Um, so we have a lot of concerns on both sides that are very, very compelling. Uh, whether or not they're competent, substantial evidence is obviously a whole other issue. So that being said, I'll be quiet and let Ms. Mandel speak. Thank you. All right, Eric Forden. I'm a managing director of the Related Group representing 2713 South Bayshore LLC. Are you part of the rebuttal? I am. Yes, yes. sir, go ahead. On behalf of George Perez, our chairman, John Paul Perez, and Nick Perez, our presidents, I really wanted to welcome, thank everyone for welcoming us into this city hall and vibrant conversation. I love Tampa. I went to school in Tampa. I came here in 1990. I was the first developer to bring Related Group into Tampa, into Channel Side. George has, and John Paul and Nick, have a sincere desire to continue our investment in the city of Tampa. We have been working with the congregation and with the neighbors tirelessly. Not everyone's getting what they want, and we're conflating a lot of the issues. We're trying to keep and develop something for the synagogue where they can have access into the site, which is what's the portion that's interfering with these Grand Oaks. I've offered, if someone wants to take the, the Grand Oaks, I would relocate them to a location. If the Garden Club would like to take them on their property to create more shade, I have no problem spending that money to actually do that. I'll do the root pruning and take care of it. If they want sidewalks across the street of Isabella, I said that's something we can talk about at city commission. I can't offer to do that when I don't control the streets. I have no problem pay paying to mill the, the streets and the sidewalks. That's part of being a good neighbor and a good developer. I don't want the sidewalks and the streets to be run down. Our point is to beautify this neighborhood and continue the existence of Road of Shalom. So, I mean, our tower is not impacting the Grand Oaks. Our tower, where it's located, is away from the Grand Oaks. The access point into the synagogue that we have to create is impacting the, location, uh, the Grand Oaks. If we can move the access point closer to Bayshore, which no, I don't think we're able to do, maybe that way we can minimize the impact to the Grand Oaks, but I don't think that's possible. So, the tower is not at issue with these Grand Oaks. You want me to do a smaller podium away where the podium gets then taller and then the tower itself gets taller? I mean, we need to, we need to figure out how we're going to do this. We're not, we're not trying to shove 10 pounds of sugar in a five pound sack. We're trying to be a sensible developer. It's 50 units. If Rodef isn't there, it's 72 units. <clears throat> I'm here to be a good neighbor and a good developer, and we're not going anywhere. So people can cast aspersions on us and paint us as a bad guy and it's corporate greed. It's the furthest thing from the truth. But I thank you for your time. I truly love the conversations. I do this in front of municipalities up and down the East Coast and the West Coast, and I have nothing but positive things to say about at the Garden Club, as well as the Tree Advocates. Everyone, it's been a tremendous opportunity working with everyone. I wish I could appease everyone. I know that's not always the case, but we're trying our hardest. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Ms. Mandel, do you have anything? 
I think Mr. Fordham summed it up very nicely. There's several legal issues that came out through this conversation. If there's questions about those, such as the bonus agreement or any of these other items, uh, we'll go ahead and answer those questions. Um, the only thing that I do want to make clear, because I think that got, did get conflated in this conversation, is the requested height. The requested height is 329. So that got just a little conflated and was not as clear on the site plan as it should have been, but I want that statement for the record. The <coughs> remainder, I think, of what, uh, what has been said here, I also tremendously respect everybody in this room and understand this is a hard case. I respectfully request your, your uh, a vote of approval. I think that it is a project that we could all be proud of and we could keep Bayshore in the manner it is right now with the synagogue remaining in its existing location. Again, I'm available for questions and thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Any board members? Council Member Clendenin. Eric, I'm sorry, I forgot your last name. Four. So you, you referred to other options. So it's, it's financially viable to shrink the footprint and go up higher? It, it's really the financial, we, we promised the synagogue X amount of dollars, and the numbers work at 50 units. It makes it more challenging for us at 42 units. But you can, I, my question is, you're, you're capable of shrinking the footprint and going up higher? Yes. But we didn't think the, the neighbors would want us to build a taller tower. I'm just thinking options. I don't, yeah. What, I, yeah. Does yeah. anybody know what the maximum height that could be? I, mean, I could tell you because uh, Bay Oaks, where Ritz Carlton is, that's I think two or three floors taller than this building is proposed. This building is shorter than both phases of Ritz Carlton, phase one and two. Kate Wells, for the record, um, with the legal department, just with regard to that question, in a quasi judicial hearing before council, such as this rezoning, um, this is not the point in time to negotiate alternative. Uh, design elements or development plans the applicant had the opportunity to look at those issues while they were communicating with with the neighborhood and others so this is an application that is before you there's been a full presentation council gets to make a decision based upon competent substantial evidence with respect to the criteria in chapter 27 and in the comprehensive plan as to how this application does or does not meet that criteria and whether the applicant has met its burden of proof with regard to that criteria as well as with regard to the requested waivers. So any discussion with regard to sidewalks, any discussion with regard to paying for the relocation of trees is not relevant at this point in time. Thank you very much. Thank Councilman you. Councilman Vieira and Councilmember Moran. Thank you very much, sir. But let me, uh, 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 Kate, if I, uh, if I may, uh, as well, thank you very much for your uh, hard, diligent work. Let me ask you, because the developer did voluntarily, without us inquiring into these issues, bring up, like you noted, sidewalks, relocation of trees, et cetera, without being pushed by city council at all, which I don't think we have. Can they voluntarily Again, speak on that's, those issues? Again, that's an attempt to negotiate a mm -hmm. solution that is not before you on the site plan. Mm -hmm. Okay, but in other what words, we can't What is before you for is a complete application mm -hmm. that has been presented, that staff has reviewed, that you've considered hours of testimony mm -hmm. as to whether or not it meets the criteria in the code to start discussing negotiations mm -hmm. and conditions on the site plan, whether they're offered by the applicant mm -hmm. or by city council, this is not the time or place. I respect that. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Moran. Thank you, Chairman. And I've heard you, you, you've heard me say many times, what if? When I do something or I think of something, what if it doesn't work? What if I do this and it doesn't work? That was the, the, the burden of proof was on the developer at that time. I wasn't there when the plans were, I wasn't there when the negotiation was to buy the land. This council wasn't involved in that. I wasn't there with the opportunity to meet with the neighborhoods. I, we weren't there. We hear only the competent evidence that's presented to us. And it, it's, uh, if, if the development partners or plans or friends or employees or whatever had come up with a what if, what if this, what I have here now doesn't work, what do I do then? What about the trees? What about the, what about the garden club? What about this? 
I'm sure they thought of that, but they, they cooperated in a situation where they could say, if I do this, everybody wins. I don't know if that was done. So all I can think about is what has been presented to us. I'm not speaking for the other five members here, but that's all I can do. I can't negotiate now. I'm not part of the negotiating team. I shouldn't be part of the negotiating team. I wasn't in the beginning with it. I'm only at the end listening to the final facts of life. And that's, I'm not trying to be hard and I'm not trying to be soft. I'm trying to be truthful. And the truth of the matter is what I hear is how I got to present my vote. And it's very, very difficult uh, when it comes to neighborhood because today 50% is going to leave not happy and 50% is going to be happy. If you come back two months ago, those who were happy are going to be unhappy. Those who are not happy are going to be happy. That's how it works. So we, we try to do what we can, but only on the evidence that's presented to us. Thank you very much. Thank Chairman. you very much, sir. We have a mo you have more? Oh, yes. 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 yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Go ahead. We can't ask more questions. The only reason is, yeah, yeah. yeah. so it's, it, well, basically we're not closing until there's all the questions. I'm sorry. Uh, I said that um, uh, we close um, when we're done with questions and then when we start want to start our conversation. Okay. Yeah. So we, we can have, always reopen. We've done it before. <laughs> we have a motion to close from Council Member Hertak. Second. We have a second from Council Member Vieira. Any discussion, Mr. Shelby? Just if there are any comments, uh, <laughs> final comments from, uh, based on the discussion before we close, from Ms. Mandel. I think she's not listening. I just want to make sure. Ms. Mandel, do you have any final comments based on this discussion before they close the public hearing? I do not. Okay, thank you. We have a motion from Council Member Hertak, second from Council Member Vieira. All in favor? Aye. 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 What is the pleasure of Council? Yes, ma'am. No. Oh, yeah. yes, sir. So to my friends at, at the synagogue, I just want to clarify, because we heard an awful lot of folks talk about the concern about the future of the synagogue this evening. But the competent substantial evidence the financial impact of whether they sale or not sale or the myth of, you know, whatever the, the mystery of where, where that leads us is really not something that we can consider tonight mm -hmm. as evidence. And I just wanted to make sure my, my friends that are on the side of the debate understands that as, as we're weighing the evidence of the development of just the zoning and what's before us tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Um, I will go ahead and make a motion and see where it goes. Um, I move to deny REZ 22-93 for the property located at 2713 Bayshore Boulevard due to the failure of the applicant to meet its burden of proof to, prov to provide competent and substantial evidence that the development as conditioned and shown on the site plan is consistent with the comprehensive plan and city code and the applicant's failure to meet its burden of proof with respect to the requested waivers. Um, I find that it's not compatible with the surrounding neighborhood. Um, the, the amount that they're requesting, the, the um, increased density from 43 to 50, um, the need for a bonus, um, they can absolutely build within the current zoning uh, and don't need to go any further. Um, in addition, the waivers, um, we have, we've seen some waivers that, uh, that, um, that we haven't seen before. Um, I am uh, specifically concerned about the reduction in the requ required vehicular use area, landscape buffer from eight feet to two feet along Isabella, and providing um, the alternative buffer within the right of way, which is city property. Um, mm -hmm. I am concerned about the reduction, um, section 27, 284-3-1, to reduce the 50% of tree retention on a non-wooded lot over one acre to 20%. Um, also concerned about the waiver, section 27, 284-2.5, to remove three non-hazardous grand live oaks, um, as shown on the two reasonable reconfiguration um, design alternatives. It seems that, uh, that there's certainly a way to save at least um, one or two of those, even looking at the reasonable reconfiguration. Um, I'm, again, there seems to be an ability to, um, to build uh, without 
needing all of these waivers. Um, and when looking at our, so many papers, sorry. Uh, when looking, oh man, where did it go? Uh, oh, there we go. When looking at um, what we have to look at. So when we have a plan development, when we have a code criteria that we're looking at, it's the competent and substantial evidence part of this. So I see that section 27-136, the purpose, um, I'm, I disagree that this uh, PD <coughs> promotes the efficient and sustainable use of land and infrastructure um, because it doesn't carefully consider the surrounding impacted neighborhood and the cultural resources in the area. I also find that it does not um, can encourage compatibility in overall site design and scale. I also don't find that it um, maximizes uh, the preservation of natural resources. And I don't find that it promotes and um, uh, encourages development where appropriate in location, character, and compatibility with the surrounding impacted neighborhood, built environment, and existing geography. Um, and I find that the waivers um, do substantially interfere with or injure the rights of others whose property would be affected by allowance of the waiver. And this is section 27-139-4 um, under waivers. And I do not find that the waivers, waivers are in harmony with and serve the general intent and purpose um, of applicable city of Tampa land development regulations and the Tampa Comprehensive Plan. Second. Does anyone want to add to that? We have a motion from Council Member Hertek, second from Council Member Clendenin. Is there any discussion on this motion? I'll comment on it if I may. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. You know, this, this and, and I, I appreciate the motion, this has been a really um, interesting dialogue, et cetera. This is a very, it's a, for all of us, it's a very, very difficult vote. Uh, Councilman Clendenin, I think, said it best. You know, for me, um, the, the biggest challenge hasn't been the existence of the waivers, it's been the extent of the waivers that have been sought. Um, it, the, something is coming to this area. Maybe this comes back to us in a different form in a couple of months and, and, and something changes, et cetera, for our consideration. But for me, the big challenge has been, number one, the extent of the waivers and where they're at. That's been my big challenge. Um, I, I always say in supporting things or in opposing things, um, land use developments that come before us are like a stool, right? And you, got, you need some leg on that stool that can either support it or support the opposition to it. And when I see this, the, the waivers, the extent of the waivers sought uh, don't form a stool where I can reasonably support it at this time. That's my thinking on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else? We have a motion and a second, and I echo... First, I agree with the motion in, in great detail uh, uh, by Councilmember Hertak. Um, and, and something that you said, uh, Councilmember Vieira, it's not the existence of the waivers, it's the extent of the waivers. Is it the necessity of all these waivers? And again, the motion went into very specific detail for this denial uh, and, and a very good explanation, and I agree with that. So with that said, uh, we'll take a roll call vote, please. Carlson? Hertek? Yes. Clindenin? Yes. Henderson? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Miniscalco? Yes. Motion to deny has carried. <laughs> with yes, sir. Thank you very much. I know this was a long meeting. Please stop. Wait. Stop. Stop. Shh. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Motion to deny has carried with Carlson being absent. Thank you very much. And please, if you exit, exit quietly. We're still uh, in the meeting. And if we could take a five minute recess. Yeah, and if you'll. <laughs>
muted. Unmuted.
a roll call, please? Carlson? Hertek? Here. Clinton? Here. Henderson? Vieira? Here. Miranda? Here. Maniscalco? Here. We have a physical quorum. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Item number four. Yes, thank you so much, Council. LaShawn Doc Here. Development Coordination. Present. <laughs> this next item is item um, number four. This is for REZ 2318. It's for the properties located at 2500 and 2510 North Tampa Street, 106, 108, 110, and 114 West Columbus Drive, and 101 and 103 West Amelia Avenue. The applicant is represented by Tyler Hudson. Um, this request is to rezone the property from RM24 Residential Multifamily and CG Commercial General to PD Plan Development to allow for storefront residential <coughs> and commercial general uses on site. And I'll turn it over to the Planning Commission to give their report, and I'll come back and give my report. Thank you. I, yes, ma'am. Yes, I did receive a phone call. Um, this is in regards to ex parte communication. Yes, ex parte communication. I did receive a phone call from the developer um, during the time that I was city council elect. We did not get into a detailed conversation. I revealed that um, I was recently elected, but they were calling community members in the Tampa Heights area to explain the project and to get some support. But we did not extend the conversation. And you can be fair and impartial. And I can be fair and impartial. Thank you very much. Yes, sir, Mr. Collins. <laughs> Uh, good evening, Danny Collins with your Planning Commission staff. I've been sworn in. Our next case is within the Central Tampa Planning District and more specifically within the Tampa Heights Urban Village. Um, Robert C. Gardner Park is the closest public recreation facility located one, uh, 0.14 miles south of the site. Um, the subject site is in proximity to transit. There's a stop located at West Columbus Drive and North Tampa Street. Um, the subject site is, within, is located within the Coastal Planning Area and Evacuation Zone E. Here is, here is the, uh, an area of the subject site and the surrounding properties. You'll see the subject site. It's uh, generally located at the um, southwest corner of West Columbus Drive and North Tampa Street. This is West Columbus here. Uh, this is North Tampa Street. Um, you'll see there's predominantly residential uses to the south and west of the site. Um, up along North Tampa Street, you have some non-residential uses as well as along uh, West Columbus Drive. Um, here is uh, the adopted future land use map. Now this, is, this map um, is, is the old map. Um, this this uh, may look familiar. You saw this, there was amendment to the UMU 60 designation um, that you read uh, earlier in the year. And uh, it was, um, became effective on uh, March 19th through ordinance 2332. So um, the corridors up along Columbus Drive and North Tampa Street are now recognized under the urban mixed use 60 designation, um, which allows development up to 60 dwelling units per acre or up to a 3.2 FAR. 3.25 FAR it encourages a mixed use development pattern. Um, directly to the south, uh, the north and south of the site are, land, are lands recognized under the CMU 35 designation, um, as well as um, uh, to the west of the site. Um, to the east of the site, you have land recognized under the CC35 designation, and then to the south of the site, you have land recognized under the residential 35 designation. Due to the site being within an urban village, the site is eligible to utilize land use policy 5.1.6 to proportionally weigh the density and intensity throughout the entire site through a PD. Per notes 10 and 12 on the site plan, the project is utilizing this policy to weigh the intensity permitted under the urban mixed use 60 designation onto portions of the site designated CMU 35. Um, the applicant has entered into a bonus agreement with the city. The proposed intensity is consistent with the underlying land uses. Planning Commission uh, staff reviewed the applications and determined the request would have minimal impacts to the surrounding area. The comprehensive plan promotes development that is sensitive to the surrounding area. The comprehensive plan also encourages the use of the alley. Um, a vehicular access point is provided from uh, North Tampa Street via an alley that divides the northern and southern parcels. The proposed access will help preserve the right-of-way and provide a safer and more pleasant streetscape for pedestrians. The Planning Commission staff finds that the proposed density and uses will not alter the character of the neighborhood. The comprehensive plan promotes pedestrian safety and encourages building entrance to connect to um, public rights-of-way. West Columbus Drive is an arterial roadway and the PD proposes the structure to be uh, 
orient, orient it toward the right of way, including, I'm sorry, West Columbus Drive is an arterial roadway and the PD proposes the structure to be um, uh, oriented towards uh, the right of way and entrances are also oriented to the right of way and connect to the sidewalks. The proposed sidewalk will help uh, ensure that sidewalks interconnect with existing and future sidewalks on adjacent properties. The applicant is also providing shade trees along the perimeter of the proposed building. Overall, the Planning Commission staff finds the request uh, addresses the mixed use uh, centers and corridor policies. The Planning Commission staff reviewed the application and found the request comparable and compatible with the surrounding area. While the portion of West North A Street between um, North Tampany Avenue and North Armenia, I'm sorry, this is a carryover. Finally, the, uh, the support, the request supports policies and comprehensive plan as it relates to the uh, housing the city's population. Uh, the comprehensive plan encourages new housing on vacant and underutilized land to ensure an adequate supply of housing is available to meet the needs of Tampa's present and future populations. Further, furthermore, the request will provide additional housing opportunities within the Tampa Heights Urban Village. Um, Planning Commission staff request, if approved, the future land use delineation uh, be added to the site plan between first and second readings. Based on these considerations, the Planning Commission staff finds the request consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies of the City of Tampa Comprehensive Plan. That concludes my presentation. I'm available for any questions. Any questions for the gentleman? Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Council. LaShawn Dock, Development Coordination. And um, Council, this request for the, um, this PD request, which is REZ 2318, would allow for the development of the property with storefront residential uses. Um, this includes 252 residential multifamily units and 11,210 square feet of commercial general uses on site. The PD identifies two structures which will be placed on site. Um, this is the site plan. Um, and just to orient you on the site plan, this is Columbus. This is North Tampa Street. And then this is Amelia. This is Highland, and this is the alley that is located. So two structures are proposed on site, one at the north, and then the other is the parking garage, which will be located on the south, which I'll detail for you shortly. Um, also within that, um, on the parking structure that is proposed, that is a five-story structured parking garage is on the south. It is proposed to provide 259 parking spaces at a maximum building height of 65 feet. And the uh, main structure on the north that would contain the 252 residential units, the 11,210 square foot of commercial general uses, 1,935 square foot of leasing office at a maximum height of 87 feet or eight stories. Um, also the property as mentioned, as Danny has mentioned earlier in relation to the future land use designation of the UMU 60, which was recently adopted on the property. Um, the applicant has requested a um, bonus agreement. Um, through an agreement, the applicant will provide 10% affordable units um, on site. And this is, again, this is the site plan. So you can see vehicular access is proposed here on Columbus. You can also access the site from the alley. Two-way traffic is proposed. Um, also for the parking garage, you can access from the alley at this point. This is the residential, this is the leasing office, and then retail is proposed along Columbus for the street frontage. And there are elevations of the site. So the top elevation shows you the west. This is the west elevation, this is the south elevation. So this is the building on Columbus, and then this is in the foreground, the parking garage which is proposed, which would be placed on Amelia. This is the east elevation, this is the top, and this is so from Tampa Street. And then this is the north elevation, the building that is on Columbus proposed. Danny has shown you the site, the location on the aerial map. This is the zoning map, just to, um, show you the area again, but the zoning from a zoning perspective. So this is the property which is identified in red. This is Columbus Drive. This is Tampa Street. Mm -hmm. This is Amelia, and then this is Highland. So you can see surrounding the property, you have your residential multifamily zoning. Um, you have your commercial zoning running along Tampa Street to the east, 
and then you have some portions of it along Columbus. And I'll have pictures to show you of the site and the surrounding area. Um, and then you can see as you head further north um, and northeast, you have more of the residential zoning um, with commercial throughout. So our pictures of the site. So this is the site. Um, this is if you are on Tampa Street and you're looking west. This portion of the site, um, what you're looking at now is what would be the south parcel. And right now that is vacant. This is another view of that south parcel. This is on the south. This is if you're on, Ami on um, Amelia and looking north. This is a view of the alley as it exists today. This is the southeast corner of the site, which is at Highland and Columbus. This is the, um, this is the corner of the site. This is the eastern um, edge of the site. So this will be the north parcel at the corner at Tampa. This is north of the site. This is northeast of the site at the other corner at Tampa. This is east of the site on Columbus. This is west of the site. This is if you're on Highland. This is also west of the site. This is directly south of the site. This is the single family residential that exists. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in its location in relation to the project proposed. So the um, DRC staff reviewed the request and finds the request inconsistent. That um, inconsistent finding is in relation to the um, scale and massing and compatibility of the design proposed. Also, it's in relation to um, transportation related waivers and natural resources related waivers on site. So I'm gonna present in relation to the zoning, I'm gonna turn it over and let um, Aaron present to you regarding the natural resources findings on the site. And so there were um, three waivers on the site plan. There's another waiver that's required to be added, and um, Aaron will review that with you. I didn't want to take up a lot of time showing you the site and pictures of the site, um, just to talk a little bit about scale and compatibility with the area. So in staff's review, and understanding that this site has a UMU 60 land use category, which is the urban mixed use, allows up to 60 units per acre. But um, staff understands that. We also looked at the site plan and reviewed it in the understanding that codes must also be met. This is a PD site plan, which is before you, and there are criteria that must be met within this PD request. Within your staff report, what has been provided for you is an analysis of that criteria with the PD site plan, and I just want to review with you a portion of that. When we look at number six on page six of the staff report, this criteria speaks to compatibility, to character, um, to the built environment and any impacts on surrounding neighborhoods. So with this on the site plan, what I've done is blown up the site plan for you. So again, um, this is the north, this is Columbus, this is Highland, um, this is the east, which is Tampa Street, and this is Amelia. So the single family residential I showed you in the picture is located here. Single family residential exists through the remainder of the block. But you'll see within this site plan, this, this boundary, which is at the south. Could you move that? Could you move that up, please? I'm sorry. It can't be. It's not seen on the screen. There we go. I'm sorry. So this boundary to the south is roughly 185 foot. So what's proposed here on this south parcel is the garage, a five-story garage, which would have the five stories at the width of 185 feet. What's proposed as a setback on the west for this single-family residential, which exists here, is a 10-foot setback. And this is where the garage would start. To the north, this property boundary, which is located, has a building placement at the maximum height at the width of 380 feet. So keeping in mind that the RM24 zoning district is what exists on the block. The RM24 requires a 25 foot setback, which will put it approximately here at a setback. 
for the remainder of the block. And what is proposed here is a setback of six feet. So to the south would we'll provide 6.2, to the west is 10 feet. So to the south is six feet, to the west is 10 feet provided. So staff has concerns regarding the scale and compatibility of the proposed development. Um, any structures which are on site currently would have to be demolished and new construction would occur. So what we're starting with here is a blank slate. The, the site would be empty. They're proposing new development. So staff feels that additional buffers could be provided um, to be able to meet the code. But one thing I want to show is just quickly before I turn it over to Aaron. So this is on Amelia and this is looking west. This is showing this residential street which exists. The development would occur to the right in this picture. So you have next to that the single family home. Which is to the south which is next to the proposed garage. What I did was I looked around. We tried to find a development which has a parking garage, a structured garage, adjacent to a single family residential home. I could not find an example. So what I did was find just to be able to show you in relation a scale. Something that will show you the scale of what would exist next to a single family residential home. So that is a parking garage which is at, I can't, this is approximate, I can't say the exact height of this, but this gives you the stories. This is another parking garage. So this is, um, this parking garage was, for, was developed. To the west of this garage, is to the south actually, single family residential homes exist. This is Carver City. Yeah. And what they have provided with this garage is a 25 foot, and it is West Shore, within the West Shore overlay, a 25 foot setback is required. 25 feet was provided, a masonry wall was provided along with landscaping. So when you're out on site visually, it creates that buffer for the residential that's adjacent to this. But I couldn't get a good picture of it because the wall is there, there's tree canopy that's there, it just has a different look and feel, but this gives you an idea <clears throat> of what would be placed at that buffer of 10 foot. This is another garage. This is um, downtown. Across the street. Exactly, yes. In the CBD, in the Central Business District, but that also gives you an idea of the scale. And this garage also drops down in height. What is proposed, proposed is no step back it is all at that same height across. This is on Cypress. So this is a parking garage that exists there. Interstate is directly behind this. And you can see the tall building that's behind it on this side. So that just gives an idea of the scale that is proposed um, on that residential street. And what I wanted to do, Council, is to um, turn it over to Aaron and have Aaron discuss the natural resources. Wait, Waivers? Councilman Hurtak mm -hmm. and then Council Member Hunter. Um, can you please put the uh, picture of Amelia Street back up? Um, the, just the yeah. houses and, yes. So that looks like a giant right of way uh, to the right. What, what is That's, the right of way? The right of way, um, that, that looks like at least 10 feet. Let me see what the width of the right of way is. It is at least 10 feet, the road, the road itself? No, 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 the right of way. It just oh, looks like right a giant right of way. The depth in the right of way. Maybe, maybe six feet, but it's. It's more. It's more it's than more six than feet. It's more than that, okay. I think. I don't see the dimension here on the. No. So, but. My question is... I mean, identified as a sidewalk also. I'm sorry. Um, my question, though, basically is that the building would have to start, or the parking garage would have to start on the other side of the sidewalk, so we would still have the, the buffer or no? Correct. So this is the property line, uh -huh. which is identified here, this dark line. Okay. So... When we're talking setback, we're talking from the property line itself. Okay. We're not including the right of way. Okay. 
Thank you. That's what I thought. I just I wanted to double check. Thank you. Absolutely. Council yes. Rotunda. Councilwoman Hertek actually and, and asked my question because I saw the oh. same thing. I was curious about the same thing. Yes, from the property line. Yes. Any other questions? No. Aaron. Okay. Oh, Thank you, Council. Wait, Mr. Shelby. Thank you. Uh, just a minute, if I can. Um, Councilwoman Henderson, can, can we have just a short dialogue just to put this in the record and, and, and um, um, uh, address this issue? Um, you do live in this area, is that correct? Yes, I do. And um, did you receive any notice in the mail about this, that, that you were in the noticed area? You're not within 250 feet, are you? I'm not within 250 feet. Yes. Well, how far away would you say you would be? I am exactly three blocks. Okay. Uh, one block, one block um, toward Columbus Drive, and then three blocks <laughs> to um, Tampa Street and Columbus Drive. And you don't have any financial interest in this matter whatsoever, is that correct? I have no financial interest. Okay, and based on that, um, and the fact that you may you do live in, in, in proximity, um, would you be able to be fair and impartial and base your evidence, excuse me, base your decision solely on the evidence that you hear, the competent substantial evidence at the hearing? I believe that I can be fair and impartial on this on this issue. Yes, I do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Aaron Mayor, Development Coordination. I am the forester examiner who reviewed this project for natural resources, and I'm going to touch on a few of the reasons why natural resources is, in is inconsistent. I do want to add that additional waiver that's required after some further review for the multifamily green space. Um, and that waiver should state per 27284.3.3a to reduce the required green space of 6,485 square feet to 5,718 square feet subject to landscape and lieu fees at the time of permitting. Okay. And so I'm going to just show some slides here. Okay. So this is... Um, on the overhead, you can see the dark moss arborist inventory of the site. Again, to the east is Tampa, the north is Columbus, south is Amelia, and to the west is Highland. As you can see from the image, it's not a densely treed site. However, every tree on site is proposed for removal, as well as there are five trees in the alley that also are required to be removed for the development of the site. Um, the project has requested a waiver of the 50% code required retention down to 0% for a non-wooded uh, lot over one acre. That, I just want to draw attention that the required tree mitigation for all these trees is 39 type 1 shade trees on the, on the site. So on this next image, I just want to point out this is the green space and waivers our green space and buffers image. Um, and so I just want to show you here, these green squiggles everywhere are where the green space is provided um, on the parcel. There's no right away green squiggles, but this is where it's located on the site. Um, and down here, right along the parking garage to the west of it, next to the single family home is a 10 foot buffer, uh, 10 foot wide use to use landscape buffer. And the code actually requires a 15 foot use use landscape buffer with a six foot tall masonry wall, which the, the project is requesting a waiver to reduce that landscape buffer. <coughs> the, the <laughs> okay, so, the, so this 10 foot width is the largest buffer or setback on any location on the entire site. So I just want to draw your attention to those 39 type one shade trees that are required for mitigation. Um, nowhere on the site can these trees really be accommodated um, in any of these setbacks or buffers. So as soon as a tree is planted, it becomes a protected tree. A protected tree requires a 10 foot protective radius. In addition to that, um, according to an IFAS peer-reviewed publication, UF IFAS um, peer-reviewed publication in 2020, for a live oak to reach its 25% of its maximum genetic potential, the tree needs at least 13 feet of planting distance. To reach 75% of its max maximum potential, genetic potential, it would need 27 feet. So as, can be, as you can see on the plan, 
um, before you, there aren't any buffers or setbacks that could really accommodate any of these type one shade trees. Um, that's, I gave you information for a live oak, but other shade trees are, are pretty similar to that. So the only trees that can be accommodated are either type three short and wide trees like crepe myrtles, or you can place palms, of course. Um, and just to let you know, so with the code, they do allow reciprocation of trees. So for this many type one uh, trees, you're able to have 117 type three trees. So 39 live oaks is equal to 117 type three trees. However, you can only switch out 50% of your trees that you are removing or you're required to mitigate. In addition to that, 234 palms equal that amount of trees. So that's just trying to show you what is required on the site and that none of it is really, a lot of it cannot be provided on site. Um, so palms could be planted. However, the benefits that are come along with palms in comparison to shade trees, which we need in our city, um, is quite inferior, especially along the long term. So as the reasons that I just enumerated, natural resources found the project to be inconsistent. Thank you, and I'm here for any questions you have. Any questions? Thank you very much. Okay. Next up, um, well, before we begin, I saw a lot of new people come in the room. If you could please stand if you are going to speak so we can uh, swear you in. <laughs> Yes, sir, go ahead. Please state your name. <clears throat> my name is Tyler Hudson, and my address is 400 North Ashley Drive. In light of the hour, um, we put our presentation on a little bit of a diet, and we're going to try to get this through a little bit faster than we anticipated. It's an honor to be here on behalf of this project, which has been well over a year in the making and which has attracted a significant amount of support in the Tampa Heights neighborhood, including that from the Tampa Heights Civic Association Board. Uh, we have about 22 letters of support that we're going to enter into the record. I imagine it was probably a heavy email inbox uh, week for you all, so some of those might have gotten missed, but we want to make sure those are all on the record. The reason this project is so well supported by this neighborhood and this community is because of the hard work of the developer. And I'd like to, to introduce the developer. It's a really a, a two developer team, uh, both of Chicago developers, Campbell Street Asset Management, and Josh Kruger is here with us this evening. And uh, the tandem group with Dimitri Nassis out of Chicago, joined by their local development partner, Lauren Campbell, who is here with me as well. Um, to save again a little bit of time, we've got about a, a whole football team worth of various experts, uh, architects, engineers, developers, arborists. I'm gonna just go ahead and skip the intro of each one of those so we can move on through this. And before we talk more about the building, because you're approving a building, you're approving a project, I want to go back a little bit in recent history about this particular block in this particular part of Tampa Heights. Back in 2002, the neighborhood adopted a plan for Tampa Heights, and it designated certain areas as activity centers. It envisioned a sort of a, a, almost an urban core on the stretch of Columbus that runs between Florida and Tampa. It designated other areas as should say predominantly single family, but it really zeroed in on this area right here as the town center of Tampa Heights, saying that it should be a thriving mixed use residential and commercial area. It's worth noting that Florida Avenue and Tampa Street along with Columbus are all arterial roadways, Tampa Street being a road run by, uh, run by the Florida Department of Transportation Oddly and somewhat frustratingly for residents in Tampa Heights, Columbus Drive is a county-owned portion of the road. This is what the subject block looked like in 2002, and this was, it's, it's, it is blurry. This is the best uh, I could get from Google Earth. And that's the block in 2023. So 20 years went by. Satellite images got a lot better, that's obvious. 58% population increase in this census tract, which is census tract 24 in the city, or sorry, census tract 42, which is mostly southwesterly Tampa Heights. But this block hasn't changed. 
one of the anchors of the town center that the Tampa Heights neighborhood adopted in 2002. And this council, this, your predecessors 20 years ago, 20 years ago adopted, there hasn't been a lot of change on this block. But there have been some changes that are coming and it's not just this PD rezoning that's before you. In February, this council adopted a comprehensive plan map amendment to designate portions of the site UMU 60, which matches, as you can see on screen, this is one of the many shades of purple on the, the Planning Commission's future land use map. And it talks, it says, this is the preferred land use category to delineate community center activity centers, intensive and general commercial service office and residential uses. And you, so UMU 60, for a comparison, a lot of Ybor City, a lot of the historic district along Ybor City, that's UMU 60. Encore is UMU 60. Um, it's, it's sort of like a warm, the warm bowl of porridge from Goldilocks. It's not too dense. It's not RMU 100. It's not downtown. Um, but it's also not the CC35 that you might see in portions of um, North Hyde Park or more interior. This, this is a fairly heavy-duty urban category. The Planning Commission, and I think one of the reasons why they support this application, the, the comprehensive plan which they regulate talks a lot about corridors. It talks a lot about transit emphasis corridors, talks a lot about mixed-use emphasis corridors. Some of these corridors are both. And the com comprehensive plan, which guides development decisions, is replete with references to corridors being the place to focus dense development, to focus a mix of uses partly because the infrastructure we believe can, can accommodate it, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in one second, actually right now. We talk a lot about transportation funding, which is a problem in this community, everyone knows that. There is a raise grant that's been obtained by the city of Tampa to do significant improvements along Florida and Tampa Street. This isn't hypothetical funny money, this isn't the money we wish for, this is real money from the federal government, from our tax dollars coming back to this community that will pay for significant improvements along Tampa Street. And I believe on yesterday, the TPO, I think, accelerated some of the funding yes, uh, for the orange portions that you see on Tampa and Florida, which again, it, that's just great. That's going to make more of a connection. But the blue is funded with the raise grant. So there are going to be significant street level and stormwater improvements on Tampa Street, which is exactly where this project fronts. So this is what the block looks like uh, right now. The uh, the. The Cura family that owns the Gold Ring restaurant and oper have operated it for a long time, um, no longer wish to operate it. The project, uh, that piece of property is for sale. Uh, we are in the process of uh, terminating that billboard as well, which is um, candidly a bit, bit unsightly there. This is what it looks like now. That's what we are proposing. We believe that a project of this density is appropriate for this block. It is an appropriate Western anchor for the town center of Tampa Heights that was called for 20 years ago and for which there has been no real movement on any of the blocks that comprise the Tampa Heights Town Center, though I would suggest that this is probably not the last one that this council will see. LaShonda well, did a great job walking through this, but just to reiterate, this is the project from the ground. This is the project from the sky. North is up. The project will be accessed off of Columbus Drive. There's currently six curb cuts, two on Columbus, four on Tampa Street, which make this an absolutely terrible place to walk in a terrible place to ride a bike. We're gonna be eliminating a total of six curb cuts. We are using the alley, we are keeping the alley, we are not seeking to vacate the alley. That alley will be improved as part of this project. <laughs> and what I think is the most exciting about this project is the ground floor commercial. We have heard for a long time, this community wants retail along this corridor and it seems so obvious that it is a corridor where retail should go. And to the developer's credit, and retail is hard. Retail is hard for residential developers to do. It's a little bit apples and oranges. But there is a very significant commitment for a significant portion of the Columbus frontage wrapping around to the Tampa frontage to be commercial. It's about 11,000 square feet. Don't know exactly how that's going to get chopped up. It likely is going to get chopped up into multiple uh, retail units. It's likely not going to be one. But it's going to bring much needed residential uh, retail and provide a proof of concept for future developers to follow. I think we went through the stats, 252 multifamily units. We are doing a 10% affordable housing uh, set aside. Um, that's not out of charity. That's because we are using bonus density. We're proposing that 26 units be set aside, half at 80% AMI, half at 120% AMI. The Planning Commission report, I thought, had some really instructive comments. And, and I think it's, it's worth noting that there's a, there's a disagreement. It's a very respectable one. But between, I think, the Planning Commission's view of this on compatibility and development and growth management. The, the Planning Commission notes 
better utilization of the land, that their request will have no adverse impacts to the surrounding area, the density and uses will, will not alter the neighborhood's character. This is the type of project this neighborhood has been waiting for. Is it perfect? No, I have yet to bring a perfect project before this council. There are areas where it cannot meet the code requirements because it is dense and our code struggles, as you will see tonight, and as council has seen on many nights with the projects we bring in the urban periphery with strictly applying the codes against the density that the comp plan anticipates. We are uh, pleased to have the Planning Commission support. We believe that the record contains, and I'll talk more about this in rebuttal, a lot of evidence that this project is consistent with the comprehensive plan and is consistent with the land development regulations either on their face as they're written or through the waiver criteria. There's a substantial waiver justification memorandum in the record along with a memorandum outlining our compliance with each of the PD criteria. I'm not gonna go through all of those, but I would ask that Ricky come on up and talk through some of the natural resources waivers. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you, Council. Ricky Pederica, 308 East 7th Avenue, I've been sworn. Um, the waiver I'd like to speak to is the retention waiver. Um, the site, uh, the trees on this site have been in, located in a previously disturbed site for a very long time, or assembly of lots. Um, on, a pro on any project, to speak to kind of continuing patterns, any project with 2.5 FAR proposed results in a retention request. In this case, we're going to 50 to zero. Recently, the uh, landscape code was revised, or the tree code was re revised. Um, that would, if those standards were applied to this request, the 50% would amount to nine trees, eight of which are laurel oaks, a faster growing, they're shorter living, more sensitive uh, tree species. And there are two live oaks, granted in good condition, that would be an unfortunate loss, but um, the majority of the trees that are the nature of this um, uh, of this request are um, less desirable and have already been impacted by the previous development. I'd like to hand it over to Alex Schiller for the second. Good evening, Council. Alex Schiller, 400 North Ashley Drive. I'm going to take over with the rest of the waivers. Um, the next request we have before you is a green space waiver, and I think that it's important to look at this in the context of the development and not as an individual waiver itself. Um, with development, and we've said this time and time again, and we'll say this again in the future, um, development is a trade-off. Um, and I think that when you're looking at urban infill sites, um, such as a site like this, there's major site design components, all of which have to be considered. Um, this site specifically, this was green space and this was parking. Um, two, two different things that we were trying to balance. Um, the neighborhood was vocal about wanting sufficient parking, not necessarily parking per the suburbanized code, um, but parking sufficient for the development in, in what we felt like would not cause overflow parking in the street and, and abrupt their pattern of, of how they park today. Um, so with that, we, we're proposing what we feel to be a very moderate reduction in green space. This is about a 12% um, waiver request is what it adds up to. And, and we also feel like this is a conservative request. Um, I can't guarantee that we're, we're going to capitalize on this waiver. Um, our parking garage today, has the design hasn't been finalized, given this is so early on in the process. I think there's definitely a potential when we submit for building permits that that garage layout can absorb some of these surface parking stalls currently shown on the north, and, and we could add a little bit more green space there. But again, in an effort to be conservative, we thought a reduction request of 700 square feet of green space was one, like I said, that was reasonable, and that allowed us to capitalize on some other different design components um, that I'll speak to in just a second. Um, the next waiver request um, before you is a buffering waiver, and Aaron mentioned this earlier um, and, and pointed out the same exact section. And I would like to say, I mean, this, this rendering that we've provided on the plan here, so I, I think that although we're requesting a five-foot reduction in the width of the buffer, mm -hmm. I think that what we're providing in terms of quality and quantity in this buffer far exceeds a five-foot reduction. Um, we are providing three-inch caliper trees um, here, where, or four-inch, excuse me, um, where three inches required. Um, and as you can see, we're also reducing the spacing between the trees, so it's 20 feet is, is code required. We're providing a spacing of 10, so we're effectively doubling the number of trees that we're gonna put in this buffer um, because we understand that, that this is important given it's adjacent to residential. Um, and the one final note I would like to make on this specific waiver is we do have a letter of support from the directly adjacent neighbor um, to the west. So they are in support of this development. They have no issues with this buffer reduction request and they are the ones that are obviously most affected um, by a reduction in this buffer width. So we felt like that was, that was a really important point and we have those to submit into the record as well. Um, 
Council um, member Hertek had a question. Yes. Just real quick, if you could go back to that slide. Yes. <clears throat> um, I just had a question about when you increase the density of trees, and this might be better for Ricky to, a to answer, how does that impact the growth of the tree? If they're, if they're really that much closer together, is that really better? Oh, it def uh, Council, it definitely depends on the species and where we're proposing um, this denser palm buffer, essentially, uh, in, on that side. Oh, palms. Well, type two. Type two, sorry. Type two buffer. To the type two trees are tall and narrow, specifically. OK, okay. thank by, you. By definition. Just, just wanted to make sure when you were talking about, I'm like seeing bunched, I mean, I know they're not oaks, but I'm seeing bunched trees and I'm thinking, I don't know, they're going to survive. So, okay, and and we you. did, th this is, although this is a rendering and conceptual plan, we, we did make sure that the calipers that we were providing would fit with that, with that quantity. Um, the next waiver request is in regards to parking. Um, as I foreshadowed this a little bit earlier, um, we feel like this is a very, very justifiable parking reduction. Um, I think you guys have seen greater in the Tampa Heights area. I, I know you've seen greater. Um, but, but given the specific location of the site and some other different factors, um, we felt that a 9% reduction, which is 362 required um, to 330 provided, was something that was reasonable um, and something that made sense for the neighborhood where it is today as well as where it's going. Um, as you can see, I, I know Tyler said there was not this site was not very bikeable, but, but the Tampa Heights community itself is relatively bikeable. Um, it received a 79 um, bike score as well, as well as a, a decent walk score too. It's also serviced um, by transit, so the Heart Route 1 runs along here at 15 minute intervals. This is the highest frequency in the city. Um, the next point I'd like to make in regards to parking is that this is a true mixed use development. There's 11,000 square feet of ground floor commercial. That's relatively high number compared to some other projects we've seen in the Tampa Heights community. Um, and so there will be somewhat of a, quote, trade-off or peaks and valleys in the different uses and in the parking demand that they required. So as you can see in this heat map, the peak commercial parking demand time is during normal business hours. It's 9 to 5. However, with multifamily, that, that peak demand is actually switched, and that's overnight. So people want to be able to park their cars overnight um, where they live because they'll be there overnight. Um, so as you can see, those hours peak between 9 p.m. and 4 a.m. So we do feel as if, you know, that those spots will be used for, quote, dual occupancy for both commercial and multi, and I think that justifies um, a little bit of a trade-off that the current parking code um, doesn't necessarily absorb. Um, I'd also like to note, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, we did a couple other projects recently in Tampa Heights that this council approved, um, REZ 2186 as well as REZ 22116. And these had, were approved for parking reductions of 13% and 25%. Although they're similar in location, they're not exactly the same. Those projects were south of Palm. They're located within the CBD periphery. This is a bit north. As I said, I think that our proposed reduction of 9% is, is relevant to where, where the site stands today. I mean, that people still drive up there, people still drive. Um, but where it's also gonna go in the future, um, about the improvements, what? Okay, um, I will move on from that. And then um, the last waiver request is a loading waiver. Luckily, this is very familiar to you all. We're requesting a reduction from four to two, allowing maneuvering in the right of way, because as you can see, our site is surrounded by right of way as well as bifurcated by the existing alley. Um, very proud to have community support. The letters are now submitted into the record. Not only um, some of the community stakeholders you see on screen, but actual individuals that live in the neighborhood were so excited about this project. The commercial aspect, the infrastructure, um, it, it's just a connectivity for the neighborhood. They've been waiting for this density, for this mixed use product to come to this center, and they're, they're excited to be here. So I'm gonna pass this on to Josh Kruger, um, the developer. He can talk a little bit more to neighborhood outreach. You, you run out of time. Council, we're, we're gonna, I think uh, the developer will speak in rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, any questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Aaron Mayor, Development Coordination. I just wanted to state for the record that we haven't received a landscape plan. It hasn't been submitted into the record, so we haven't reviewed that at this time. Thank you very much. Any questions from council? No? Do we have anybody in the public that wishes to speak on this item? Yes, sir. Please come up and state your name. Good evening, council. Um, Camilo Soto. I am a, an attorney and an urban planner, but I am here actually as a concerned resident. Um, good evening to Mr. Shelby as well, Madam Clerk and staff. Um, overall, I think this, this is truly a transformative project, no doubt about that. Um, but the concern that I have is in taking into account the context and how it Im impacts 
the rest of the neighborhood, especially the park downhill. Um, I live at 105 West Francis. I was sworn in. Yes. Um, and council members, we, uh, those of you that were in on council around June of 2022 uh, may recall uh, me mentioning the, the fact that the particular alleyway that is south of West Amelia, north of West Francis, it's on the last page of your staff report, the, uh, the land use map. That chunk that's between, it's red and uh, the abutting uh, part against Tampa Street and then the rest of it is, is brown. Um, anyways, that'll give you a visual of, of the block that I'm talking about. So as Mr. Hudson, my colleague, has indicated, the particular block where this project is located really hasn't had much development. However, the full context is south of that, the RM24 portion has been, has experienced a, a significant increase in residential development. Not only has it increased uh, residential development, but we also have two new pools that have come along online. Um, and those two pools in particular are but the alleyway that I'm concerned about where my home um, lays. And so what I'm asking is, uh, in particular, uh, as it relates to <clears throat> development coordination has already indicated uh, that they are not compliant with the land development code and the comp plan as it is. They've asked for additional conditions uh, prior to the second reading of this ordinance. Natural Resources has also asked for additional conditions and transportation has done the same. I'm concerned uh, with stormwater and its evaluation of the site specific impacts not only to the block, to the block that I live on, 105 West Francis. The preliminary site plan indicates that they are to comply with the standard technical specs of stormwater attenuation, which is generally 100% stormwater attenuation. In light of the increased flooding that we've had, in particular that rain event, June 2022nd, um, it's only gotten worse, and we have additional pools that are there. And so what I'd like to see is the applicant commit to volunteering or proffering to greater stormwater attenuation from this project, or alternatively, I'd like to see stormwater in Tampa um, review the flood impacts based on contemporaneous data, contemporaneous development patterns that extend south of this particular project. Now, if you're waffling or a little concerned about putting an onerous amount of, of, of work on this developer, I'd like to remind you, they're asking for no tree retention, blended intensity and additional density, and reduced green space. All of this creates more impervious surface area. And so they're asking for value from the city. And we're asking, or I'm asking, for them to take into account their stormwater implications and return the value back to ensure that we don't have worsening storm fl uh, flooding in Thank the area. Thank you very much, sir. Anybody else? All right, we had a registered individual, Ariel Milligan. She's gone? Okay, yes, sir. Please state your name, you have three minutes. Sure, Ruben Bryant, um, 515 East Florida Nebraska Avenue, resident of Tampa Heights. I just wanna speak on behalf of the project. Um, I'm excited about what I see. I've uh, been living in the neighborhood since 2016. And what I've noticed is that um, with any new development, whether it's on a mom and pop level with uh, someone renovating a home or refurbishing a, a building in order to have a, a cafe, there's additional dollars that are brought into the neighborhood. And from what I've seen in 2016 to what I've seen now has been a huge uh, influx of cash coming into the neighborhood, which is literally fixing homes one by one and the, the remainder of the neighborhood. And so a project like this, I think, will continue that same pattern and also create a trend on and set precedence for Columbus. And so I'm hoping that whatever the variances that they need, are, if they're reasonable, that they're, um, that they're given the variances in order to take care of those, uh, in order to have that project move forward, as well as take care of concerns like his. Uh, I think that the, the developer is, is being mindful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else? I see no one else. Councilman Miranda, would you like to And the, the only thing, I, we talked about stormwater, isn't there? A, a uh, factual thing that uh, any new development's got to contain their own storm water on their own property. Can we address that? Jonathan Scott, you're absolutely correct. Uh, the new development will have to contain its storm water and provide retention. 
so they won't be allowed to have any impacts to the surrounding neighborhood. And how is that done? They'll have to follow the transportation technical manual for stormwater, and that has all the requirements they have to meet. All right, thank you very much. Anybody else? Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, sir. I have a question for the developer. Are you guys undergrounding these utilities that are running along Columbus? And yeah, I think they have to. Tyler Hudson, for the record, uh, power lines, no, but the other utilities will be subsurface. The stormwater will be under the site in a, in a vault. Okay, thank you. I had a question. Yes, ma'am. The um, trees that were presented today, you indicated that they're not in the original plan that was presented. Can you, how, do we, how, how will we know if that's going to happen because it was presented for the first time today? I'm, I'm so... Aaron Mayor Development Coordination, landscaping is reviewed at the time of permitting. Mm -hmm. We look at the space right now just to see what can be, you know, provided on mm -hmm. the site based on our experience. Um, but so they, they don't, they're not required to submit okay. a landscape plan, but we sometimes ask for one just so we can see what they're proposing. Yeah, they can change it at the time of permitting. Quite, I have a question, Mr. Chairman. Councilman and I guess this question would be for, for, for legal or for, um, uh, in terms of the, um, the waiver, does the granting of a waiver by this council affect what ultimately they would be required to have to bring in? In terms of, in terms of, in terms of landscaping, I, that, that's the question in terms of, my concern is that this was just brought to council today. You have not had an opportunity to review that. Uh, if you'd like to address that, Mr. Hudson. Council, this can be a difficult issue, and it might be <laughs> worth looking at the code on. Landscaping plans aren't required. There's something, though, that's really informative for you all to see. Landscaping plans are, are approved and finalized in connection with permits. There are things we do have to provide in terms of natural resources. Um, Ricky and Aaron have been in touch daily, if not multiple times daily, in the past couple of days, trying to uh, improve where we can on the, the natural resources. So what... I would propose is that between first and second reading, we'll work to present a conceptual landscape plan, but I wanna be very clear that that is something that's typically done at permitting. Um, we are asking for you to approve the waivers today. There's a, there is an element of trust but verify with this, but um, I, I will say, and, and I, I think Aaron would agree, is that, that we're in very close touch with natural resources to maximize the opportunities where we can on the right of way, trees. Is there a community uh, benefit agreement for this plan? Um, no, ma'am. We're, we're we're not really receiving any city resources, and this isn't a development of, of public mm -hmm. land. That's a great question. I think the, the, the most uh, there is an agreement between the developer and the city, which is that in exchange for us being able to build more of a building, we're gonna set aside 10% of the units in that larger building um, with rent restrictions. Half of them rent restricted for households that earn 80% of area median income and half that earn 120% of area median income. And those numbers will probably be updated by the Florida Housing Finance Corporation in the next couple of weeks for 2023. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Council LaShawn, Doc Development Coordination. There are a couple of things I'd just like to put on the record, and one is the community plan that was mentioned is not adopted in the comprehensive plan. Um, the other item is the parking waiver that was mentioned and presented um, would not be required. Um, the development is actually overparked, and one of the changes you will see on the revision sheet is for the applicant to recalculate the parking based upon the use proposed of the storefront <coughs> residential. So I just wanted to put it on the record. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, is there anybody else for public comment? If not, no other questions. We go to rebuttal from the applicant. Thank you, Council. Again, Tyler Hudson for the record. I'd like to ask Greg Roth, uh, who's a licensed civil engineer with Bowler, mm -hmm. to address briefly the stormwater comment that was made by my uh, current friend and former neighbor, Mr. Soto. Uh, the townhome developments that have been developing in that area have stormwater attenuation requirements that are very different than large projects like this, and being near Tampa Street is also relevant. So, with that, Greg. Uh, good evening, Greg Roth with Bowler, um, 600 West Shore Boulevard. Tampa, Florida, and I have been sworn in. Um, 
as mentioned, and, and as Jonathan, Jonathan Scott came up here and mentioned, we will be meeting the city's requirements for stormwater in addition to um, the stormwater approval we have for the PD. We also have to meet FDUT uh, requirements, which are more stringent because we're tying in um, to the DOT system on Tampa Road. So we'll be meeting the DOT's storms, which are 100-year uh, storms versus the 25-year storms that the city has required us to design to. So we will have additional attenuation designed into our system. Council, th thank you for your patience and for your questions. I think, legally speaking, every decision that you make when you're in this quasi-judicial capacity, you're, you're not wearing robes, but it's, it's quasi-judicial. It's based on, really, like there's a stool reference maybe in one of the prior hearings. It matters first, were you consistent with a comprehensive plan? And I think there's abundant evidence in the record that we are, namely your, your own planning commission staff, <laughs> says it's consistent with a comprehensive plan. Second, then that second question is, are you consistent with the land development regulations? On their face, may, it depends. Some of them, yes, and others we believe are justified by the waivers and the waiver justifications that we have put into the record. As this council has seen on this site and other urban peripheral sites um, that have, we've had the opportunity to bring before you and, and obtain approval, it's a, it's a little bit square peg round hole to make development regulations that might apply to a, a Publix on Hillsborough Avenue apply for a really urban, dense, mixed use site like this. And so I do believe that the waivers are justified. And one of the best tests for that is the third leg of the stool, which is the community support. Um, this group, and Josh is based out of Chicago, they have met with the Land Use Committee of this Tampa Heights Civic Committee, Civic Association, probably three or four times, the board three or four times. There has been an extensive community outreach effort, which is something that I think this council is seeing more of because developers watch these hearings and know that it's expected. And I think it's noteworthy for a project of this ambition, of this scope, and introducing really a new level of density to an intersection that while it needs it and it's expected under the comprehensive plan is new. Ch growth is change and change is hard. And the fact that 22 residents, stakeholders, and the Tampa Heights Civic Community, Civic Association itself, all endorse this project is a testament to the work of the developer in listening to them and incorporating their feedback in this plan. It's not perfect, but we think it's an excellent plan, and I believe it uh, merits your approval this night. Thank you very much for your time. Councilman Clendenin, then Councilwoman Henderson. Yes, sir. Is it time to discuss? Um, Should we actually close? Yeah, I just have a couple of questions. The, no, um, okay. The 26 affordable units, um, are they going to have the same amenities as the other um, areas in the building and um, will they be mixed throughout or isolated to a particular area? They're, they're, they're mixed throughout. The, the mm -hmm. bonus provision agreement requires that they right. be uniform as to amenities and finishes. That's okay. in the bonus provision agreement. Mm -hmm. um, the, the intent is absolutely that they're stacked. And, and there is a requirement in this bonus provision agreement that it, it is confidential. There, there, there is absolutely, right. I mean, there's certainly no <laughs> labeling or anything like that. It's the property, the leasing manager will know which units um, have, you know, for which the tenant has to fill out a household income certification form, but they're absolutely going to be blended in. It's going to be the, one community. Okay. Does that same concept apply to retail space when it comes to small businesses and affordability for the retail space that's going to be on the ground level? Yeah, that's a great question. Currently, there's no affordable retail okay. requirement. It's, it's, it's something worth considering. I, I think it's probably been implemented in some situations where the, there's a public land contribution, and so perhaps the city can can ask a little bit more. I'm candidly not sure how, how that would, would work for this site, but just for clarity, there, there is not any rent restriction on, on the retail. We'll, we'll have to see how that comes in. All right, Councilman Clendenin. Motion to close. Second. We have a motion to close from uh, Councilmember Clendenin, second from Councilmember Vieira. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Councilman Clendenin, would you like to read item number four? If I could find it. Here. <laughs> <laughs> Too many papers in front of me. <laughs> File number REZ23-18, an ordinance rezoning property in the... Yeah, yeah that's what I'm reading. <laughs> An ordinance rezoning property in the general vicinity of 2500 and 2510 North Tampa Street, 106, 108, 110, and 114, 
West Columbus Drive and 101 and 103 West Amelia Avenue in the city of Tampa, Florida, and more particularly described in section one from zoning district classifications RM24, re residential multifamily, and CG commercial general to PD plan development storefront residential and commercial general uses provided an effective date. Second. We have a motion from council member Clendenin, and second from council member Vieira and discussion, council member Hurtak. Uh, may I add uh, to you? I'm, I'm gonna, um, I'd like to amend that motion to I say, um, <laughs> I, uh, I would like, because the, um, I would like to see, um, because they, they said they would, um, I wanna put that in the, the potential landscape plan between first and second reading. Um, <clears throat> and I wanted to add a couple of findings of fact that the proposed development is consistent with the anticipated intensity of the CMU 35 and UMU 60 future land use designations and will provide new housing on vacant and underutilized land to ensure that an adequate supply of housing is available to meet the needs of Tampa's present and future populations consistent with housing policies 1.3.1 and 1.3.4 and infrastructure policy 1.1.17 and 1.1.18. Uh, and um, it is compliant with land development code uh, section 27-136 that the proposed development as shown on the site plan promotes or encourages development that is appropriate in location, character, and compatibility with the surrounding neighborhood and that um, the waivers in compliance with section 27-139-4 um, is that the design of the proposed development is a unique and therefore in need of waivers and that the waivers will not substantially interfere with or injure the rights of others whose property would be affected by them. And if I can, can take a chairman. Thank you. I, I also agree with you, Yes. So I, that as well that taken, I'll take it as a, uh, I'll accept that as a friendly amendment. Thank you. And with regard to that, there's also a revision sheet, and a, frankly, an extension oh. revision sheet. Uh, Mr. Hudson, would you just uh, affirm the fact that between first and second reading, you agree to make those changes on the revision sheet? I so affirm. Thank you, sir. Would you include that in your motion, then, please, to include the review, revision and, sheet? And, to include and the revision include, sheet yeah. between first and second reading. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We have a motion from Council Member Her uh, Clendenin. Taken from Councilmember Vieira with some additional information uh, from Councilmember Hertak and the revision sheet. Revision sheet between first and second reading. May I have a roll call, please? Hertak? Yes. Clinton? Yes. Henderson? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Carlson? Maniscalco? Yes. Motion carried with Carlson being absent. Second reading and adoption will be held on June 1st, 2023 at 9.30 a.m. Thank you very much. All right, as the, uh, as the folks leave, we will go to item number five. Thank you, Council LaShawn Dot Development Coordination. Item number five is REZ 2325, is for the property located at 10 Ladoga Avenue. Um, the applicant is being represented by Rebecca Kurt, and the request is to rezone the property from RS75 Residential Single Family to P Plan Development PD for Residential Single Family Detached Use. And I'll turn it over to Danny to present. Danny Collins uh, with your Planning Commission staff. I've been sworn in. Um, our next case in the Central Tampa Planning District, and more specifically in the Davis Islands Urban Village. Uh, Davis Islands Park uh, is the closest public park. The, uh, the park is approximately one mile from the subject site. Uh, uh, closest transit stop is approximately 1.2 miles north of the site near the intersection of Davis Boulevard and Arbor Place. Uh, the subject site is within the, within the Coastal Hazard Area and Evacuation Zone A. Here is an aerial map of the subject site and the surrounding properties. Uh, you'll see the surrounding area uh, is predominantly developed with single family detached uses. This is the subject site uh, just uh, northeast, um, just uh, north of Ladaga Avenue. 
Here is uh, the adopted future land use map, the subject sites uh, recognized under the uh, residential six future land use designation, uh, which allows uh, development up to six dwelling units per acre. Um, the residential six uh, surrounds the property uh, on all sides um, to the west, uh, south, and east of the subject site. Uh, the Planning Commission staff reviewed the application, found uh, the request comparable and compatible with the surrounding area. Uh, this portion of Ladaga Avenue between West Davis Boulevard and Formosa Avenue, excluding the subject site, has an existing density of 3.27 units per acre. That's based on 26, or 26 sample sites. The request would allow for two single-family detached residential units at an overall density of 4.16 units per acre, which is comparable to the block density and is consistent with the density anticipated under the R6 uh, future land use designation. Um, lot widths range, uh, lot widths along the sub, the segment range from 50 feet to 400 feet um, along Ladoga Avenue. Uh, the subject site is approximately one, 150 feet wide. The PD proposes lot widths that are within the range of lots uh, along this uh, segment. Taking into consideration the existing block density and range of lot widths along the segment of Ladoga Avenue, uh, Planning Commission staff finds that the request will provide for residential development that will be built within the existing street block and lot configuration in the neighborhood. Um, the proposed rezoning supports many of the policies in the comprehensive plan as it relates to housing the city's population. Uh, the comprehensive plan encourages new housing on vacant and underutilized land to ensure an adequate supply of housing is available to meet the needs of Tampa's present and future populations. Um, furthermore, the comprehensive plan directs uh, the city's greatest share of growth to the urban villages. Um, the request will provide additional housing uh, or additional housing in the Davis Islands urban villages. Um, based on these considerations, the Planning Commission staff finds the request consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies of the City of Tampa comprehensive plan. That concludes my presentation. We're available for any questions. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you again, Council LaShawn, Doc Development Coordination. And um, this petition, REZ 2325, this PD request would allow for the um, existing lot to be um, split and with the creation of two lots for the use of two single family detached um, dwellings. The total site area is 21,940 square feet. Um, the site plan um, depicts the existing structure, um, which is on site, um, and it's with the setbacks of a front setback of 25 feet. The rear is at 20 feet. The sides are at seven feet um, on the east, and then the west side is at three feet. On parcel B, so the site plan identifies a parcel A and B. On parcel B, that would um, contain the newly created lot. The setbacks are 25 feet in the front, 20 feet in the rear, and seven feet on um, both sides for that lot. Um, the subject site is located on Davis Islands. Um, it's um, important to note that the precedent in the immediate area is the single family residential detached structures and I'll show you in a minute on our um, conforming map. Because this is a request to divide the lots, you'd, um, the site plan shows that there's one lot which would measure 70 feet approximately in width and the other lot would measure approximately 71 feet in width. Based upon the analysis which was conducted, um, staff finds the request inconsistent with the immediate and surrounding area and a staff analysis has been provided within the staff report and I'll review that analysis with you um, and first I'll orient you on the zoning map with the site. So this is the zoning map. Um, the site is identified in with the red dotted line which is located here. So this is the site. Um, it's on Ladoga Avenue, and you can see um, that this is Davis Boulevard that's located here. Um, the site, you can see, has the RS-75 zoning. You have a couple of, you've got RS-60 that's further north, across the canal. You've got a PD that's located um, further east, and the remainder um, is RS-60 when you look northeast of the site. And so I will show you, I'll put up the conforming map, and then what I'll do is um, while this map is up, I'll read the analysis um, as a result of this map. So on this map, just to orient you, this is Davis Boulevard. I'm going to pull it down some so that way you can see the legend also for the colors. So this is the site, which is outlined in black, and it has the hatching on it. This is Davis Boulevard, and this is Ladoga. 
So the, the area of analysis is um, the area which is shown with the um, parcels which are in color. So within the staff report, um, just one second. Within the staff report on pages um, four and five of the report, the analysis is provided. Um, so I'll just give within summary um, what is part of this analysis. So in relation to reviewing the existing development pattern, the subject block, which is Ladoga <coughs> Avenue from West Davis Boulevard to the end of the street, it contains 19 total zoning lots. That's including the subject site. 14 or 74% of those lots have been developed with a width of 75 feet or greater, and five or 26% of the lots have been developed with a width of 74.99 feet or less. On the subject block face, the north side of Ladoga Avenue, there are nine zoning lots, including the subject site, and seven or 78% of those lots have been developed with a width of 75 feet or greater and two or 22% of those lots have been developed with a width of 74.99 or less. So pursuant to the analysis that's provided, the majority of the lots within the study area have been developed with a lot width of 75 feet or more. And analyzing the subject block and specifically the block face, seven or 78% of the lots are developed at a lot width of 75 feet or more. With one lot developed at a width of 75 feet to 79 feet, two of those lots are developed at a width of 80 to 99 feet, and four of those lots are developed at a width of 100 feet or greater. Therefore, staff finds the request to create two lots to be inconsistent with the existing development pattern of the block face and the block. In addition, this PD site plan request is inconsistent with the surrounding area and is not compatible with the built environment. Um, and that is staff's um, analysis. And let me show you also photos of the area of the immediate. So this is directly east of the site. That's at the corner of Davis. It's another view. This is the site itself. So this is the site that has the existing home and this is the portion of the site which is currently vacant but would be split and that's where the new proposed structure would be placed. So this is another view of the site. No, this is the existing home and that will remain. And then the lot next to it, the area next to it. It's kind of hard to show on this picture. There, were, there was landscaping that day, so this is a big trailer that's in front. So I had to get kind of a side view. <coughs> And then this is west of the site, directly west. This is further west. This is just showing the single family residential homes. It's hard to show the exact lot widths on the, um, in the pictures. This is west also, heading further down. Then we're coming back around southwest of the site and then heading back south. This is south of the site. Southeast of the site, another home to the southeast, and then this is going back down. So these are all across the street from the subject site. And there are site plan revisions to be made to the um, site plan between first and second reading. Um, should council vote to approve the site plan? Um, this evening, and so those have been provided um, to the applicant, and we do agree to make the changes between first and second reading. Thank you. I'm available if you have any questions. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Doc, the, um, the two yellow um, parcels across the street from the um, checkered box, did you show the, that house? Because that was two lots together, but it looked a lot smaller. These two? Yeah, on the uh, were they one of the pictures of the houses that you showed? All the houses that you showed in that area? Yes. South. I just was curious as to oh, oh that is that two houses? No, this is oh one okay home. that's this is one home. Okay. Okay. 
this is David Sarno. I know. I'm Sarno. sorry. <laughs> and that's another cell. Okay. They, that's okay. Home. That's that. They just have two garages on both sides. I see. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. And it's, okay. Really. Any other questions? No. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Rebecca Kurt um, with Brooks Rocha at 400 North Campus Street. I have the privilege tonight of representing John and Karen Hotchkiss for this rezoning at 10 Ladoga Avenue. And before I begin to um, explain the case to you, I would like to have them have the brief opportunity to introduce themselves to you. Thank you, Council. I'm John Hotchkiss. Welcome new members as well. Uh, we own 10 Ladoga Avenue, my wife Karen and I. And now uh, we currently reside at 68 Bahama Circle, also on Davis Island. Just wanted to give you a little bit of background. Um, there's been just kind of a lot of talk we've heard, so we wanted to clear some of the things up about our love, basically, for the city of Tampa, and uh, just just kind of set it, you know, set it forward that way. Uh, my family, including some extended cousins that got here in the in the late 1800s, uh, we laid down roots in in 1910. Um, have been on Davis Islands uh, since the 1930s, and, and my, uh, my family, grandparents, have, have owned uh, various buildings there. Um, and, and then some really cool structures on, on Bayshore Boulevard as well. We, we love old structures. We love architecture. Um, I've been called a frustrated architect many times, and, uh, and, and we have won some design awards with some of, the, some of the projects, both commercial and residential, that we've had the pleasure of, uh, of both living in and, and uh, being a part of. In 1969, uh, Camille and Johnny McWhorter, my maternal aunt and uncle, uh, bought 10 Ladoga Avenue. And it has um, really since that time been, uh, been, been the reunion central for the Hotchkiss, McWhorter, Hebel, Bierce, and Crockett families uh, and extended families for, for over 54 years, since longer than I've been alive. I mention these things just to display that, that we do have deep roots in this community that we love, um, neighbors that we love. We've built our lives here. We're very committed to our community. Karen will share more. Thank you, Council, for your time, especially at this hour. Um, Karen Hotchkiss, owner of Tin Ladoga and resident of 68 Bahama. Um, our story with Tin Ladoga started in the fall of 1995. John and I were students at the University of Florida invited to Tampa for a Thanksgiving holiday. We quickly knew that Tin Ladoga was a special place and fell in love with the community. After graduation, Davis Islands was a natural fit, and we bought our first home on the island in 1999. We've been fortunate to raise our children on the island and participate in the local community. In 2021, when John's aunt was ready to transition from the Ladoka house, she called us first, and our dream of owning the property became a reality. We moved to 10 Ladoga September 2021, aware that major renovations were needed. At the recommendation of the city, we pulled a demolition permit to, in order to facilitate, uh, excuse me, we pulled a demolition permit over an alterations permit in order to plan for an addition to the master area of this 1920s style home. We then proceeded with the first stage of renovation, spending more than $150,000 to upgrade electricity, plumbing, and the guest house. As the renovations progressed, we realized our dream was quickly outpacing reality. The cost of the second phase renovation for the main house was had more than tripled in cost. We also could not ignore the mounting emotional toll the current construction was playing on our family. So we made a pivot. We looked for a buyer to carry on the dream of renovating the home. This was met with little success, which brings us to our current situation. We've been honored to work with Rebecca Cart, and we'll let her take you through the next steps. Thank you. Thank you, Council. At this point, um, there are two things that City Council normally looks for when you're looking at a lot split. You want to see what is going to be the effect, and hopefully there's no adverse effect to the, to the neighborhood, and what is the precedent that it's going to set in the neighborhood. And what I'm going to do during this presentation is give you the substantial competent evidence for which to review this. This is a general location map. It's about half an acre. Um, you've been oriented. It's um, slightly to the west of Davis Boulevard and currently has one single family home on it. It was originally platted um, as part of Davis Islands as three lots, um, a 40, a 50, and a 50 lot. I want to make it very clear that this request is not, as you typically see, to reestablish the original plat. We are not asking for three lots on this, on this property. We're asking for two lots of generally equal width. On Davis Islands and some of the older homes, you often see um, on very large lots, a side lot or a garden, and when they come to you for a lot split, you end up with one very large oversized lot and a side lot which is undersized for the neighborhood. But that's not what's happening here. The original home 
was built on one and a half platted lots and it was sold by Davis Islands Incorporated and I will present that deed to you um, when we're at the conclusion um, as one and a half platted lots. And I mentioned that because some of the neighbors have written in their opposition letters that they feel that this is not consistent with the original plan of Davis Islands. This is actually exactly consistent with the plan, original plan of Davis Islands. At some point, <coughs> these lots came into common ownership and as you know, that makes them one zoning lot and that's why we're here today. Um, this is a plan development. There's been a lot of talk about what a plan development is and what a plan development isn't. A plan development is actually a tool that the city provides, which provides the greatest level of assurance that what you see is what you're going to get. It provides that greater assurance than a Euclidean district because you set in the plan development what you're going to see. Um, we are setting as near as we can to the RS-75 standard so that the neighbors will feel minimal, if any, difference at all. The lot size um, for uh, RS-75 is 7,500. We far exceed that. What we do not meet is the front lot width because of the irregular shape of the lot. Um, we, there's no rear lot requirement, but we far exceed um, what the front would be. The lot depth is 100 required in RS-75, and we are somewhere between 124 at the smallest point and 168 at the largest. Um, there's been a lot of concern about what the setbacks are. We are setting our setbacks at RS-75 standards, which is 25 in the front, 7 in the side, 20 in the rear, except for the existing structure, which was built at a 3-foot something lot line, and so we were required to ask for a 3-foot setback. However, I want to make it very clear that the conditions of this plan development state that if the existing home goes away or is destroyed in excess of 75%, that then we will go to the seven feet, which is consistent with the RS-75. The existing home is a legal non-conforming structure. As with all legal non-conforming structures, if they go away, then you will meet regular setbacks. And that is what we are committing to in this plan development. So what are we really asking for? We are asking for a lot width reduction of around 5%, a little bit around four and one, a little less than six on the other. Um, and we are providing a lot size that is 154% greater than is required under the code. And on the smaller lot, it's 138% larger than is required under the code. We're throwing a lot of numbers at you. I know that can be kind of hard to track what that actually feels like. So we had the architect drop some drawings. Um, this is the overall lot boundary. The green area is the area required for an RS-75. And the peach is all the excess property that is not required that will be part of these lots. And I want to make it very clear, each one of these is an RS-75 lot. Two of these lots fit very cleanly in here, but for the irregular shape of the lots, which leads us to my next illustration of, well, what, is that, what does that reduction in the side setback look like? What is that going to feel like to the neighbors? So I have in here the arrows because it, they're so small, it's almost hard to see. And over here. And I also want to call to your attention that we have them drawn at the front of the lot. They're actually not required to be at the front of the lot. They're required to be at the front setback, which is um, at 20 feet, or is it 25? And then halfway up until you meet um, half of your required lot um, area. So. We just wanted you to see the minimal impact that this is going to have in the neighbor, neighborhood. If you're walking by, biking by, running by, and or boating by, as the case may be in Davis Island, although this fronts a road, you're not going to feel this difference. Um, we were disappointed not to get um, support from staff, but we, we do understand that staff has to be consistent in how they analyze all these cases. And what they have is a very general tool that works really well in your 60-50 lot splits in the grid system that you have in much of, not all, but much of South Tampa. It doesn't work as well when you are dealing with the curvilinear um, nature of Davis Islands. Um, as you can see, you know, they've analyzed this portion, but we're losing a lot of our neighborhood. We're losing our canal neighbors. We're losing um, the people um, over to the east of us, which are also RS-75 properties. Over here is RS-60. This is RS-75 with a couple pockets of um, RS-60 very close to us. Um, 
and we're not criticizing the tool. We understand that that's a tool that they use. It's just not an effective tool in illustrating what's going on in this neighborhood. We would suggest that 1320, which is the walkable distance, um, is a better tool in this neighborhood. And I know that Than has um, asked City Council to consider revising the regulations to actually have, you have the 1320 be what you look at when you're looking at these rezonings that go for a lot split. Um, some of these um, numbers are, are kind of confusing to me, and I'm not sure exactly where they're getting their numbers from. I don't know if they have the actual number at the setback, but at some of these lots, I know that they're platted lots, and they should, um, they're two platted 40-foot lots, and so that would be 80. It looks like they may be using lot averaging, which again, in a grid system where everything's rectangular, what you have in the front of the lot is gonna be pretty much what you have at your front setback, but that's not the case in Davis Island. And if we were able to use lot averaging, we would have, we have 151 foot lot average and we would be able to split these lots administratively and have an extra foot to spare. Um, what this lot does, what this map does show is that there is a large, diverse amount of lot sizes, lot areas, and lot types in Davis Islands. Um, if you were to update this map after the lot split, we would be this brown color, which is directly across from us. We would be exactly the same color as these two properties right here. And with all the different colors on the map, if I was to hand it to you quickly, I'm not really sure you would be easily able to quickly identify what that change was. And the most important thing that this analysis that staff does, and again, it really works well in your 50, 60 grid areas of the city, is it's not taking into account the difference, the percentage difference that we're asking for. When you're going from an RS60 to an R50 or, an, or a PD with a 50 foot with RS60 standards, you're doing 16.6% .6 difference every time, every time. So you're not necessarily taking into account the difference that we're asking for here. And what we're asking for, as I showed before, is not just 5%, but 5% on a very large lot um, as I think was noted earlier in the pictures. Um, again, we would suggest that a better comparison would be the 1320, which um, I took this from the staff report. This circle is a little hard to see. Um, and I also have, we, we did pull that information from the property appraiser, and I will submit that also into the record. The lot that is there now is 95% larger than the rest of the lots in the area. If anything, the existing lot is the one that does not fit the typical format of what you see in this general area. The new lots that we're creating are larger than approximately 50% of the lots in the area. They will not be out of place. Um, I did wanna also mention that um, Mr. and Dr. Hotchkiss have done a lot of community outreach in addition to the mailed and posted notice. They made phone calls, they knocked on doors, they met with neighbors as far as the neighbors were willing and able to do that. Um, I would like to thank the Davis Island Civic Association, although they are not supporting this request, they were incredibly gracious with their time and allowed us time on their agenda to meet with them. Um, and they also had, um, my client also had a community meeting on site and although it was disappointingly sparsely attended, um, we were able, I think, to change some hearts and minds by actually explaining what the PD does. And when we had the opportunity to do that, we felt good about doing that. And I'd like to reserve any other time that I have for rebuttal because I know that we do have some neighbors who are here in concern. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? No? Anybody in the public wish to speak on this item? This is item number five. Anybody in the public? Yes. I see that you are all sworn in, so come on up. Please state your name, you'll have three minutes. My name is Sterling McLemore. My wife, Melissa, and I live next door at 14 Ladoga. We're asking this council to, to consider voting against the rezoning request for the following reasons. We've made a significant investment by purchasing and restoring our historic home. Splitting this lot would negatively impact our investment and we're counting on this board to protect us. Two, the PD is a work around the current zoning laws and allowing this request establishes a gateway for future development on Davis Island, which would destroy it, in my opinion. Our island is the crown jewel of Tampa real estate, being centered on all the amazing work the city of Tampa has done with the downtown waterfront. The island needs to be protected and preserved. Three, 
There's no guarantee to this board that should you accommodate the request based on the plea and their letter that it's necessary in saving the historic home, that it will in fact be saved. For the PD establishes a three foot setback on our property line, which would negatively affect our property value and our property rights. Um, in, in the letter submitted by the Hotchkiss family, it's being presented that it's necessary to split the home in order to raise capital, in order to restore this house and save the historic home that's on the site. Um, they purchased the home in order to do that, as they stated. After much deliberation, they decided to move on and not renovate the house. Uh, <clears throat> I understand why they want to split it. It's to recoup their investment. They made a significant investment purchasing the home. They've not had a buyer willing to pay that same price. The market's changed, and they're looking for this board to enable them to split the lot to recoup their investment. I'd like to ask you to consider, when you're considering this request, since, since they own nearly $12 million in personal homes, do they, need a reno do they need the money to renovate the house, or do they want the split for financial gain? If they wanted to save the home, why didn't they renovate it instead of moving? Why did they pull and recently extend, they recently extended the demolition permit on the home if they want to save it? Why do they accept an offer on the whole property based on this split going through? Is this story a ploy to pull on the heartstrings of your board to save the home in order to get a development deal done? If you are going to consider the request, then at least demand assurances that the home be saved, like putting it on the National Historic Register. Moreover, please consider the people in opposition to this are the actual surrounding neighbors who will live with the consequences of your decision today. Please protect us. Please vote no. This lot is not legal enough, legally large enough to split, and the surrounding neighbors do not want it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Next speaker, please say your name. You have three minutes. Hi, I'm Michael Pallori. I reside at 56 Ladoga Avenue. Uh, my grandparents, my great-grandparents built homes. They all lived on Ladoga Avenue. I grew up on Ladoga. My dad grew up on Ladoga. And now my two kids, age two and four, are lucky enough to grow up on our wonderful street. To say this project is unpopular on our streets is an understatement. No Ladoga residents I've spoken to support this. Granting the request to PD this property and develop two homes is an unnecessary burden on my Ladoga neighbors, the residents that actually live on the street and drive and walk by this proposed project <clears throat> every day. This lot is one house off of a very sharp corner, and we really don't need to navigate any more lawn care companies, trucks, and service vehicles than we already have to. There's no hardship with this request. What is proposed is a development project. In respect to the existing homes on the block, two homes do not fit on this property. Two homes are not permittable on this lot. Beyond this, to the best of my knowledge, there's no actual safeguard to save this historic home and restore it to its grandeur. Granting this request to PD would set up a horrible, horrible precedent for our quiet street and Davis Islands as a whole. I would like my kids to continue growing up on a street that at least slightly resembles the Ladoga of my childhood. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Yes, sir. Please state your name. You have three minutes. I'm Rob Nation. I have resided at 7 Ladoga Avenue and uh, moved in uh, 1998. I've been there 24 years. My wife, Christy, and I, we raised two kids there, and uh, we live directly across the street from 10 Ladoga Avenue. Um, you know, and as y'all know, Ladoga's always been one of the more beautiful streets on the island, larger lots, larger green, green space, and I Feel to, to subdivide the current location would have an adverse effect on the islands. Um, you know, just the winding streets, more, more cars in the street, um, it just makes it more unsafe. I mean, when I moved there in 1998, you could lay out and sunbathe in the street. Um, my kids, I'd put cones out and they could ride and learn to ride their bikes. And I mean, you can't do that today. And it's only going to increasingly get worse. Um, as we build these lots up um, and it just it's going to set a precedent that you know 
I mean, it's the densities. I understand about conformity and lots, and um, but you know, this is something we have to preserve and we have to look at the future. And uh, I just feel like it would have an adverse effect on on uh, the community. So anyway, thank you very much. Sir. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Please state your name. You have three minutes. Hi, my name is Christy Nation, and that was my husband. My husband and I have lived at 7 Ladoga for 24 years. I am opposed to the rezoning of 10 Ladoga. My husband and I have raised two children on Ladoga Avenue, one of whom still lives with us as she is autistic, and we have just had um, to take guardianship of her. We have stayed at Ladoga Avenue because of the quiet, lower traffic volume, and where our daughter feels comfortable day to day. Please don't let them build two homes on one official lot. It will set a bad precedence, and the safety will go down. Please save our neighborhood, as we are under the impression that it was supposed to be saved a lot because that was their, that was their dream house. And just please help us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, yes, sir. Please state your name. You have three minutes. Vincent Pallori, 58 Ladoga. I've lived on at 58 pretty much all my life with a very few years of exception through the college times. I believe the staff has got everything down pat. Our neighborhood, our inner neighborhood, the people that you've seen and, and the many that were here earlier that couldn't stay, we're within our, I don't know, eight, eight house boundary that were very against this. Everyone nearby is against it. Maybe you have letters from people, Carewood, gosh no, or other parts of Davis Island, possibly. But the people in our immediate neighborhood do not want this, do not feel it's right, and we're asking the council to, to not approve it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am, please state your name. You have three minutes. Cynthia Holloway. I live at 184 <clears throat> Baltic Circle. I don't live on the Doga, but I do live on Davis Island. And I would be here tonight to speak for the rest of the island that when this property owner acquired this property, they knew what the zoning was, R75. I ask that you keep that to keep the integrity of the island and for the rest of the island. I don't live on Ladoga, but I have other houses around me that will be facing this same issue soon, and I'd like to see you do the right thing and follow what the rules are. He knew what the rules are when he bought the property, and I think we should abide by them now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. If it may please the council, my name is Evan Rubinson. I live on 9 Ladoga Avenue, directly across the street from 10 Ladoga. Um, I would like to make a few points rather than bore you with a regurgitation of my letter. Um, all the people that are in opposition to this are directly affected by this matter. All the people that have written letters in support, aside from maybe one or two, don't have a vested interest in this neighborhood. Some of them live in different counties. Although John has a lot of friends and supporters, the majority of these people are not at all affected by this rezoning. We are, our community. I grew up in a 1929 home in Clearwater. It was built by the grandson of the guy that built the Brooklyn Bridge, Donald Roebling. He built this home and we put it on the historic trust list, not because it was the most economical thing to do, but because it was the right thing to do. And we preserved that home, my family and I. I would like to know why this home, if it does have historic value, why it has not been pursued and why it hasn't been put on this historic preservation list. In fact, to my knowledge, there's been a demo permit that's been pulled. So the narrative, or if I will say the fallacy, of this house being brought back to life, I think is just that, a fallacy. John, to me, has posited multiple different things. On one hand, he wants to keep the house and restore it, but like I said, he has a demo permit on it. On the other hand, he says he can't afford to restore the home and needs to subdivide it. 
but yet bought a $7 million waterfront estate on Davis Island. If this rezoning is approved, what's to stop anyone from buying multiple properties on Davis Island and then subdividing them for financial gain? Humbly in closing, I would ask that the City Council uses its wisdom and denies the rezoning of 10 Ladoga Avenue in the interest of preserving our neighborhood, its quaintness, its charm, its exclusivity, and its privacy and family-friendly nature for many years to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker. And then we have uh, one online individual. Yes, sir. Good evening, Mr. Chair, Council Members. I'm Bob Aberger, 540 Bosphorus Avenue, Davis Island. I have been sworn. I'm here representing the Davis Island Civic Association and its board and as their zoning chair. Uh, my smartwatch just told me it's time for bed, so I will be brief. And again, I appreciate your service and, and your patience. Our opposition is straightforward. We believe the use of a PD sets a bad precedent. I've spoken passionately in front of this body and the variance board of the challenges that you face once what we believe occasionally is a bad decision has been made. I have been approached by many residents asking me, would I support a PD? Would the Civic Association support a PD? Because there are very few regular lots on Davis Island. It, it's a series of pie shapes. Um, we believe that once this precedent is set, you will see a floodgate of requests by developers, by residents to do just this for the financial gain opportunity that a lot split affords. There is strong opposition from all of the adjacent neighbors. And Davis Island, it is unique. It's special. We fight hard to protect its character, but it's not homogeneous. This neighborhood is a special neighborhood. It's a grand neighborhood. And the people that invested in it invested in it for a reason. And we believe that our opposition is specific to help them protect their property rights and, and their property values. The many letters of support, I, was, I believe, copied on all of them, I don't believe were terribly relevant. They didn't have a vested interest. Finally, the use of this as a financial vehicle, we believe, is, is without merit. And I won't go into the details of that. A lot split is a windfall. It's a development opportunity. I request that you not open this floodgate, that you not set this precedent. There's no assurance of this home being saved. It's very difficult to save an historic at-grade home on Davis Island when you can't even insure them. So I believe that it's predominantly a precedent for setting further development plays. While the divided lots would be large, and I embrace that, it's the frontage that is not sufficient. It's the frontage that is the character of the neighborhood the character of the island, and the value that we're trying to protect with regard to the adjacent and, and proximate neighbors. None of these are easy decisions, and I appreciate the challenges that you all face, but we respectfully request you oppose this evening's PD. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, sir. Good evening, and I certainly thank you all for what you do after I've been here since five o'clock today. You were, you've you, been in here since five? Pardon? You've been here since five? Yeah. <laughs> Me too. Okay. <laughs> Harry Hedges, and I live at 574 Marmora. I bought that house with my sister in 1971. We talk about the character of Davis Island. We talk about the big estate homes. We talk about and first of all, I have done three historic properties. The good thing about a historic property, it's historic. The bad thing about a historic property, it's historic. And when we judge somebody else's motive for financial gain, I think we're losing perspective of the size of this lot. My, so my lot is 7,900 square feet. These lots will be 10,000 square feet. So if we're trying to keep people that are trying to move into Florida and spend top dollar for a home or a place to live, to try to keep them out of our community, you know, we need to think about this. I, my mind is thinking of the tax dollars that come in from this type of development 
because my background is affordable housing. And this just means we're going to be able to do that many more affordable housings in Tampa. <clears throat> I don't question the motivation of anybody that is spoken ill of this transaction. I'm just saying a 10,000 square foot lot is a lot of lot. And there are a lot of lots on Davis Island, half that size. So I don't think maintaining the character of the community is going to be disturbed by honoring this request. So I am asking you to look at the big picture. Camp Davis Island has been very important to me and Tampa, as you know, I've been here for 50 some years <clears throat> and very involved. So, you know, let's not try to keep people out of our community. NIMBYism is not what Tampa's about. And I thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you, sir. And we have one person registered online. We have to swear that person in and have them turn their camera on. I think that's me. Yes, please raise your right hand. We'll swear you in. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. You may lower your hand. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Well, good evening, council members. Uh, I'm very honored to speak in support of the rezoning application and especially in support of the character of the applicant. Um, I was a longtime resident of Davis Island. I actually grew up in the house at 10 Ladoga, and my parents lived there for 50 something years. Um, when they went to sell it, we were very excited to sell it to the applicants who are also family members and who also love the house. And they've had very extensive plans to restore the property. They encountered a lot of roadblocks in their attempts to um, restore this house. And they've gone to extreme measures and expenses, including this latest effort. The intention was to rezone the property in order to save this house, this 100 year old house, if possible, which is a jewel of Davis Island. It's, we call it the gingerbread house. <clears throat> um, I sense a misunderstanding on the part of my former neighbors um, of the intentions of the applicant. I, I think it's just really misdirected. Um, I, I sense their sincerity and I appreciate their coming down and, and um, passionately um, supporting their view, but I, I just feel like it's misdirected because the separation of the lot and the two parcels is gonna offer more green space and the construction of two more modest sized houses or, or one more modest sized house as opposed to another gigantic gargantuan mansion, which in my opinion is, is the modest houses are more in keeping with the character of Davis Island and this neighborhood in particular, having grown up on, on, on Ladoga. So um, I hope you will consider that side of things as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes our public comment. Yes, ma'am, Ms. Dock, would you like to speak? Thank you so much, Council LaShawn, Doc Development Coordination. And Council, I just wanted to state on the record and just to explain a little bit the conforming map um, that was provided. Um, there was uh, two analysis provided, um, well, that I ran for this request on the map. So one was the first that I showed you, and that contained, let me just put that map up. That was this area. And then the analysis that I read and provided for you is based upon this map. What we do is look at that area. If you're starting at the 1320, we looked at what's across West Davis, West Davis Boulevard, that as the divider, and then also the canal. So we look at the development pattern. This is that area. This is the complete area within the 1320. So. What was eliminated was east of West Davis Boulevard and then north of the canal, because you can see the development pattern that exists. With this analysis, 63% of the lots are greater than 75 feet in width. 
and then 37% of the lots are less than 74.99 feet in width. So this analysis was run, but then we also look at the pattern. You can see this block development compared to, sorry, the subject block. This is the subject parcel. So I just wanted to state that analysis was run. Thank you and I can much. submit that into the record. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, you have rebuttal. Thank you, Council. I want to say that we do appreciate the input from the neighbors. Um, I, I did want to have my, um, my client get up to introduce themselves. I know it's not, um, as you mentioned earlier, motives are not the sub substantial confident evidence upon which you base your decisions, but I felt it was important that they had their voice heard as well based upon some of the things that were written in the opposition letters so that you could hear from them directly. Um, we have presented the competent substantial evidence tonight um, for you to base your decision on that this will not have an adverse impact on the neighbors. Um, the only thing that staff found that we did not meet in the PD require, uh, requirement was the impact on the neighbors. And I want to once again show you the de minimis request that this is going to, to have. Nobody walking down the street is going to be able to feel this or sense this. There's a division on Davis Island. Um, some people don't want any change at all. Some people prefer to have the smaller lots turned into larger lots with the massive houses. And some people prefer that the original mix remain. And that's what we're proposing tonight. This was originally divided by the Davis Corporation, very similar along these lines. And that's what we're just asking to go back to. We're not asking to go back to the original platted lots. I do want to call your attention that we did have um, 29 letters of support from people on Davis Islands. They were from across the islands, but 12 of them were within the 1320, um, which is a walkable distance. Um, it was purported that, um, I don't think anyone said none of them were, but it certainly was implied that none of them were um, neighbors that resided in this area, and that's just not correct. Um, I understand, and I understand Davis Island Civic Association has taken the position that they do not support plain developments. Um, you know, I had my opportunity to change their mind on that, and I did not. I'm, I'm not sure I would ever be able to do that. Um, I will tell you that PDs do not create a precedent, particularly in this area where each and every lot is unique. I also, some of you are new here, some of you may have been here when this happened. City Council has denied um, an otherwise approvable lot split request in the past based upon the fact that there was a concern about PD setting a precedent. Um, that was in the Gulfview area. That case was overturned, um, and that was found as not a legal basis to support it. Again, if you look at, I, I hear the neighbor's concerns. They don't want anything to affect the life they love on the island. The island is a very special place. There are a lot of special neighborhoods in the city of Tampa, but this is definitely one of them. And, but the substantial competent evidence you have are the facts. And the facts are showing that this is not going to change. I mean, you can always have fear of change, but that does not mean that that's actually what's going to happen. Um, two of the people who wrote in opposition are actually in those houses in the ground directly across from us in lots that are less than 75 feet. And one of those houses doesn't even have a 75 square foot lot. And I am not at all um, trying to um, make anyone feel bad. I, I just want city council to be aware that you can be on a small lot in a wonderful neighborhood if you consider a 75 foot wide lot small. And these are certainly not small lots. The lots that are going to be created, again, are bigger than 50% of the lots um, in the surrounding area of 1320 square feet. Um, I am available if there are any other questions and we respectfully request your approval of this PD. Thank you very much. Is there a discussion? Uh, any questions? Yes, sir. You want to close it? Motion to close. We have a motion to close the hearing from Councilmember Clendenin with the second Councilmember Vieira. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody like to speak? Sir? Yeah, I'm, um, we have a lot of pressure in the city of Tampa to increase density to accommodate growth. 
but it's not density in every area of Tampa. All of our neighborhoods are special, um, and I think it's part of what makes Tampa a charming place for everyone to live. And as we look, and I think the comprehensive plan reflects this to a great degree, we look for places to develop density. We're looking in areas that are part of our transportation corridors um, and, and out of the coastal high, high hazard areas. And we know that Davis Island is particularly vulnerable uh, and its access in and out of Davis Island is particularly vulnerable. So as we increase density there, it's maybe not the smartest place for our community to, to look towards. You know, I, I'm not, I'm not uh, against, again, development. I'm not against, you know, creative ways of, of achieving that, but I am against one, destabilizing neighborhoods and changing the character and the uh, scale uh, and the sense of community within those neighborhoods. And I said, and, and a lot of times we talk about neighborhoods, we talk some about our historic neighborhoods, but you know, it, like Ybor City and West Tampa and things like that. But these, these communities like Davis Islands are very special for the city of Tampa. So just my, my opinion, I'll be voting to deny this request. Just, Thank you, sir. Councilwoman Hertzak. Um, I'm going to go ahead, and um, I, I agree with with you on um, with Councilmember Clendenin. Um, I'm, I will move to deny REZ 23-25 for the property located at 10 Lagoda Av Ladoga Avenue. Um, due to the failure of the applicant to meet its burden of proof to provide competent and substantial evidence that the development as conditioned um, is, is uh, consistent with a comprehensive plan and city code. Um, mainly, uh, I do adopt the findings of uh, City of Tampa staff. Uh, <clears throat> while the proposed rezoning may be allowable for consideration under the existing future land use category, and the Planning Commission staff concluded that the pros proposed rezoning is consistent um, with the development pattern uh, anticipated under residential six future land use category, I find that the proposed rezoning is not compatible with the existing and predominant pattern of development categorized by the residential lots that equal or exceed 75 feet in width. Um, as noted in the staff report, 76% of the zoning lots within the area of analysis have been developed with a width of 75 feet or greater. And the existing development pattern within the subject block establishes that 74% of the lots are developed with a width of 75 feet or greater. Um, <clears throat> this percentage increases to 78 when you study the development pattern on the subject block face, which is the north side of um, Ladoga Avenue. Uh, <clears throat> overall, <clears throat> This is, this is not about precedent setting. This is about st sticking with the feel and um, encouraging um, development where appropriate in location, character, and compatibility with the surrounding impacted neighborhood built environment and existing geography. And I find that this is not compatible with that. Yes, sir. And is that consistent, um, uh, your decision with uh, Section 27-136? Oh, I'm sorry, I, sh I, didn't, I didn't read the um, uh, okay. code. I apologize. So yes, with, um, with the Plan Development Code Criteria, Section 27-136. Thank you. Do we have a second to this motion? Second. We have a second from Council Member Henderson. Roll call vote. Plan Dinan? Yes. Henderson? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Carlson? Hertek? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Motion to deny has carried. With Carlson being absent. Thank you very much. All right. Thank Two you more know. items. Mr. Hedges, good night. We love it. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Council LaShawn Dock Development Coordination. This next item is um, REZ 2326 it's for the property located at 1236 Channelside Drive. The applicant is represented by Tyler Hudson. 
Um, this request is to rezone the property from um, CD Channel District 2 to CD2, and this is to allow storefront residential and commercial general uses and hotel uses on the site. I'll turn it over to Danny with the Planning Commission, and I'll come back and give my report. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Danny Collins with your Planning Commission staff. I've been sworn in. Um, our next case is in the Central Tampa Planning District, more specifically in the Channel District Urban Village. Um, Deputy Khalifa Memorial Park, Dog Park is the closest public recreation facility located a quarter mile to the west of the subject site. Um, so several transit routes uh, run within proximity of the site. Um, Heart Route 8 runs along Channel Side Drive and provides connections to downtown Tampa, Westfield Brandon Mall, and the neighborhoods of Palmetto Beach Progress Village in South Brandon. Um, additionally, the Tico Streetcar runs adjacent uh, to the subject site along uh, Channel Side Drive. The subject site is uh, located within the coastal planning area and uh, the coastal hazard area and evacuation zone A. <clears throat> Here's an aerial map of the subject site and the surrounding properties. Uh, you'll see the subject site's outlined in this purple color. Um, it's uh, just on the west side of Channel Side Drive. Um, there are predominantly um, uh, a mixture of multifamily and um, mixed use development uh, found uh, within proximity of the site in the Channel District. Uh, this is Port Tampa uh, to the east. Here is uh, the adopted future land use map. Um, I do want to uh, make note uh, that this is, this is uh, outdated. Um, on April 20th, uh, 2023, City Council approved TACPA 2225, um, a plan amendment that recognized the subject site under the Regional Mixed Use 100 designation. So while it's showing um, heavy industry on the site, uh, the site is uh, currently uh, Regional Mixed Use 100. The RMU 100 is to the north and west of the subject site. Um, to the south and east of the subject site are, uh, is land rec res recognized under the heavy industrial designation. Uh, the Regional Mixed Use 100 designation allows consideration up to a, um, for multifamily uh, commercial uses and, and mixed use development up to um, a 3.5 FAR. The subject site is also within the CBD periphery, uh, which is eligible, eligible for a bonus um, up to a 7.0 FAR. The applicant is utilizing the Central Business District periphery bonus to attain additional intensity on the subject site. The PD proposes a 7.0 FIR, which is consistent with the maximum intensity anticipated under the RMU 100 designation through the CBD, CBD periphery bonus. General note 10 acknowledges that the PD shall comply with the provisions set forth in sec section 27-140 regarding density and floor area ratio if the intent of the CBD periphery bonus in the comprehensive plan is met. Planning Commission staff request if approved that the proposed um, square footage be corrected to two 204,295 square feet as it inc is incorrectly recorded uh, on the site plan um, between first and second reading. Planning Commission staff uh, finds that the proposed uses and intensity are consistent with the urban development pattern anticipated in this area of the city. The comprehensive plan encourages residential mixed use, retail service, commercial, and other pedestrian oriented uses along mixed use corridors to be oriented to the street by placing buildings uh, close to the public rights of way and uh, orienting the entrances to the public right-of-way. The applicant has provided three entrances to the proposed mixed-use building along Channel Side Drive, meeting the intent of this policy direction. Sidewalks are provided along all adjacent public rights-of-way. Overall, the Planning Commission staff finds the PD addresses the mixed-use centers and corridor policies of the plan. The proposed rezoning supports many of the policies in the comprehensive plan as it relates to housing the city's population. The Tampa Comprehensive Plan encourages new housing on vacant and underutilized land to ensure an adequate supply of housing is available to meet the needs of Tampa's present and future populations. Uh, the request will also um, add additional housing in the Channel District. Finally, the request is consistent with the comp Compact City Forum strategy, which seeks to promote housing at densities that promote walking and transit near employment concentration, uh, residential services and amenities. Um, based on those considerations, the Planning Commission staff finds the request consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies of the City of Tampa Comprehensive Plan. That concludes my presentation. I'm available for any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions? Nope. Thank you. Ms. Dark. Thank you again, Council LaShawn, Doc Development Coordination. 
And um, this item, Council, which is REZ 2326, is the request, um, which is the Site Plan Control District for <coughs> CD2. This would allow for um, residential multifamily development of 225 units for hotel and storefront residential and general commercial uses on site. The applicant proposes to construct um, one building on site, and this would include a building footprint of 25,485 square feet. Um, and I'll show you the site plan um, shortly. There's one point of vehicular access proposed. It is on Channel Side Drive. A circular drive is proposed at the ground level um, near the building entrance. And I'm going to um, the site plan up on the Elmo here. So this is the site. It's located on Channel Side Drive, which is located here. This is the entrance to the site. Um, and this shows you that this is contained within, this is one building that is the building footprint, um, which is proposed. The retail space is located here, ground level, with building entrance located here um, on site. So the applicant um, has re received recent approval, as Danny has mentioned, for the future land use designation of RMU 100, regional mixed use 100. Um, the developer has entered into a bonus agreement. This does allow for the increased um, FAR on site. Um, and the developer has agreed to provide 10% of the rental units um, as affordable to achieve that additional um, FAR for the bonus. And what I'd like I to do is show you pictures of the site. Mm -hmm. I'll show you the zoning atlas first. Mm -hmm. So this is the zoning map. Zoom in a little bit. So this is the parcel that's um, identified here in red. This is on Channel Side Drive. And you can see that the um, surrounding zoning is um, CD. You have CD2 and CD3 that's to the west with um, PDs that are further north. Um, this is the recently adopted gas works project, which is located north and northeast of the site. You've had a few rezonings come through um, recently um, for mixed use development within that area. This is the site located on Channel Site Drive, on Channel Side Drive. This used to be Tampa Blueprint. This is a view, this is the site that's further here on the right. If you look at south, this is another view, just an expanded view. This is showing north of the site. This is further north. This is what's located east of the site into the port property. Let me turn this this way. This is west of the site. This is another view east of the site. The DRC staff has reviewed the request and finds the request um, inconsistent. That inconsistency is only in relation to, trans to the waivers, um, which are transportation related. Um, I, there is a revised revision sheet, which um, I will provide to you. Um, and these are changes which must be made between first and second reading. Um, and also, I want to mention that on the site plan, um, there is a waiver which is listed on the site plan, but it's not included on the report. But that waiver is in relation to the loading verse. So that waiver will remain, and that's a part of the revised revision sheet, just to clarify. And the applicant has agreed to make that change. So much. that concludes staff's presentation. I'm available if you have any questions. Any questions? No. Okay, thank All right, you. Petitioner, our applicant. Good evening again, Council Alex Shaler, 400 North Ashley Drive. For the record, I'm here before you with a rezoning request in the Channel District, an area that loves density. Not only is it encouraged, but it is expected um, with the trend of the neighborhood the way it's going today. I will do my best to make this very concise. I might skip over a few of these intro slides. Our development team and design team is here um, with us in the room tonight, as well as vir available virtually. Um, 
staff did a great job of setting up this location. I think LaShawn is <coughs> very familiar with where the site is. Um, same with the site plan. We're proposing 225 units, um, a multifamily residential on the site with a little bit over 1,000 square feet of ground floor commercial. This is a very small site um, in comparison to some of the other assemblages that you've seen um, that I'll detail in a little bit um, that have come up along this corridor, although same development team where we are providing 10% of affordable housing. That's half will be at 80% AMI, half at 120% AMI. That is to obtain the bonus density that we're requesting. And we will also be providing the channel district, um, standard public realm improvements, the curvy sidewalk that you see throughout the district and um, the wider side, uh, sidewalks for uh, pedestrian engagement along the frontage along channel side drive. Um, Precedent development-wise, um, the, the same design team, um, and being completely cr transparent, developed um, the assemblage to the north of this, um, or, or got it entitled, I should say, it's, it's, it's about ready to undergo permitting now. That was 1242 Channel Side Drive. That was approved um, by this council back um, in November of last year. This was a bit larger given, given the land area. This was for 532 multifamily units with 8,000 um, square feet of ground floor commercial that was approved just north with a lot of the same waivers and a similar development program here just on a little bit smaller scale given the land. We're proud to have staff support on this application as LaShawn mentioned. Um, the one department that did find this inconsistent is transportation. Um, that is the result of some loading waivers that we're requesting which again you all are very familiar with seeing, especially in an area like the Channel District that is so dense. And um, this is an auto turn exhibit. This is this is in the record. Um, this is showing how the loading will come in, the, the, the route that they'll pull, they'll, they'll pull into the site. This is all, all internal to the site, all internal to the building. Um, pull in, back up into the loading stall and reverse back out. Um, we are requesting a reduction in the number of bursts um, from two to one. Again, this is a pretty fairly standard percentage reduction, um, especially in the Channel District. Um, and we are proposing to use a bit smaller of a vehicle for loading. Um, the, the code requires a WB50, which is inherently unnecessary even for people with lots of belongings um, moving into a multifamily residential development. Um, this is a bit of, of a unique request in the Channel District. Um, the, the code was recently amended. Rick, you mentioned this earlier, the, some of the landscape code. And we believe there was an accidental exclusion and a footnote um, in a landscape table that, that's been in the code for quite some time, which excludes the Channel District um, from these strict use-to-use -use buffering requirements that you see elsewhere in the city. So. Um, Based on a technicality, we do have to request this buffer um, or a reduction in this buffer from 15 feet to zero feet and no wall. Um, as you can see in this aerial on the right side of the screen, the Channel District um, has very, very limited um, buffering because we, it's meant to be more of a dense um, district, which there's urban design principles that speak to integration um, that are in direct conflict with, with these large suburban buffers. Um, another request that this was also approved with 1242 channel side directly north. This is um, just this is unique to the channel district. They require setbacks based off of your roadway frontage. And we are located along channel side drive, which the standard setback that would be applied to the site between 10 and 15 feet is relatively reasonable um, for a frontage setback and inherently reasonable for a minimum side yard at zero feet. However, this table includes a note um, that is still in the code and it um, caveats that for each 10 feet of building height that you go above 60 feet, um, the required yards are increased by a minimum of one foot. So when you do the math on a building um, that is very, very tall, much higher than approximately six stories, um, the way that the channel district development used to be back when, when the code was derived, um, as you can see, we are now required to provide almost 39 feet a front setback from Channel Side Drive, which is just inherently unreasonable, um, and it is not pre uh, prevalent in the district. Um, same with the side property lines. Um, we're required um, to take that base of zero um, up to 24 feet is what's required. Um, so we're, we're providing some or requesting some slight reductions in these buffers, and, and this is a request, a waiver waiver request that is supported by Urban Design. Um, this has been thoroughly vetted through them for all of our projects that are located in the Channel District. Quick note on affordable housing. As mentioned, this is this is providing affordable housing to meet the bonus density. I, I'll be quick on this, but I thought it was really, really interesting. Um, I was diving into the um, community redevelopment plans um, that the CRA um, puts out, and I do read them. Um, and both of them have, it's, it's crazy because the original plan, um, when it was established back in 2004, included a section on affordable housing, and it included verbiage that mentioned direct developer incentives for developing affordable housing, mentioning that there is an absolute shortage of affordable housing in the district. Um, as you can see, the plan that currently governs today, 2022 um, redevelopment plan, same exact language regarding developer incentives for developing affordable housing, also noting that there is a current shortage. So while we've transitioned from an absolute shortage to a current shortage, a shortage exists 
nonetheless. Um, I think affordable housing is needed throughout the city, but I think it's um, inherently important in the Channel District where rents are sky high. Um, Meanwhile, it's a, it's a very desirable place to live given its proximity to downtown. You don't have to own a car. You can bike. You can walk to restaurants, to your job. Um, people want to live in the Channel District, so let's make it a bit easier for them to get there. And with that, I will conclude the presentation. I'm available for any questions. Any questions at this time? I hear no one. Oh, may I say something? Really? Yeah. Yes, sir. Believe it or not, I don't have a question. I was going to say, just by your, your presentation, I can tell that you prepared a lot for this and, and really worked hard on it. And... When I, when I saw you speak, I just, again, just seeing a, a lawyer work like that, you can just see it. So just good job. That's all. It's past midnight, so I'm just going to say I'm very good fast. Job. I speak very fast. You did really well. I mean that. Yes, sir. Council In fact, I had leaned over to Council Member to my right, and I said, I've heard of speed reading. I never heard of speed talking. <laughs> yeah, just from preparation. No. We appreciate that. Thank you. Anybody in the public wish to speak on this item? This is item number six. Do we have anybody registered? Motion to close? Motion to close. Motion to close from Councilwoman Henderson, second from Councilwoman <coughs> Vieira. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Councilwoman Henderson, would you mind reading item number six? Can I pass because I No, no, Councilman Vieira, would you mind reading? And remember to include the revision sheet. <coughs> the revision of the school credit. <coughs> Uh, I move uh, an ordinance rezoning property in general vicinity of 1236 Channel Side Drive in the city of Tampa, Florida, more particularly described in Section 1 for Zoning District Classification C2, CD2, Channel District 2 to CD2, Channel District 2, storefront, residential, commercial, general uses, and hotel providing an effective date, um, if I may. I've. Uh, uh, Yes, with the revised square footage, I find that this is in compliance with applicable goals, ob objectives, and policies in a comprehensive plan. I find this is compliance with Land Development Code Section 27-136, um, and I find that the, uh, well, that's it. There you go. It's going to be good enough for now. We have a motion from Council Member Pierre. Yes, ma'am. Can I just add an amendment um, yes, for not just uh, the square footage, but just the whole revised revision sheet? I, 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 um, I take that, yes. <laughs> yes. All right, do we have a second to this motion? Second. We have a second from Council Member Clendenin. This includes the amendment uh, from Council Member Hertak. Roll call. Henderson? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Carlson? Hertak? Yes. Clendenin? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. <clears throat> Motion carry with Carlson being absent. <clears throat> Excuse me. Second reading and adoption will be held on June 1st, <clears throat> 2023 at 9.30 a.m. Okay, last Thank item you. of the night. Thank you, Council LaShawn Dock Development Coordination. This last item this evening is REZ 2333. It's for the property located at 1509 North Morgan Street. The applicant is represented by Joseph Gibbons, and this request is to rezone the property from RM24, residential multifamily, to PD plan development for residential, single family, um, semi-detached uses on site. And I'll turn it over to Danny with the Planning Commission. Danny Collins with your Planning Commission staff. Uh, our last case is in the Central Tampa Planning District, and more specifically in the Tampa Heights Urban Village. Uh, Waterworks Park is the closest public recreation facility located within a quarter mile west of the subject site. Uh, the closest transit stop is one block west of the site. Uh, I don't think you're on the right case. Are you on Morgan Street? Yeah, Morgan Street, right? Yeah. It's item number seven. Oh, gosh, I'm sorry. I was thinking <laughs> somewhere else. <laughs> Uh, the um, closest transit stop is uh, one block west of the subject site at East Estelle Street and North uh, Marion Street. Uh, the subject site is within the coastal planning area and evacuation zone D. <clears throat> Here's an aerial map of the subject site and the surrounding properties. It's just north of uh, the interstate um, on the east side of Morgan Street, uh, just north of K Street. Um, there are some uh, single family attached uses on the east side of Morgan Street. Um, and uh, 
residential uses and as well as some multifamily uses um, north uh, east of the subject site. Here is uh, the adopted uh, future land use map. Uh, the subject site's recognized under the residential 83 designation, which is a high uh, density residential land use category, allows development up to 83 dwelling units per acre. Uh, that is the primary land use found uh, east of Morgan Street. Uh, to the west is land recognized under the community commercial 35 designation, uh, which encourages a mixed use development pattern um, up to a 2.0 FAR or 35 dwelling units per acre. Uh, Planning Commission staff reviewed the application and found uh, the PD comparable and compatible with the surrounding area. The character of the surrounding area is non-residential with parcels utilized uh, for light, com light commercial, public, semi-public uses and some single family attached residential uses. Uh, this portion of North Morgan Street between East Estelle and East K Street, excluding the subject site, has an existing density of 12.13 units per acre. Um, the existing density is 15% of the density that can be considered under the Residential 83 designation. The request proposes two single family attached uses at an overall density of 22.22 units per acre, which is well below the density that can be considered under the R83 designation. Uh, com the comprehensive plan encourages single family attached residential uses to be designed to include the orientation of the front door to a neighborhood sidewalk or street. Uh, both unit entrances are oriented toward and connect to the sidewalk on North Morgan Street, meeting the intent of this policy direction. The proposed sidewalk will help ensure uh, that sidewalks interconnect with existing and future um, sidewalks on adjacent parcels. Um, finally, the request uh, supports met many of the policies in the comp plans relates to housing the city's population. Camp Tampa Comprehensive Plan encourages new housing on vacant and underutilized land to ensure an adequate supply of housing um, is available to meet the uh, uh, Tampa's growing uh, population. Uh, additionally, the comp plan seeks to direct the greatest share of growth to the uh, city's urban villages. The proposed PD supports this policy by uh, creating additional housing opportunities in the Tampa Heights Urban Village. Um, based on these considerations, the Planning Com Commission staff finds the request uh, consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies of the Tampa Conference of Plan. That concludes my presentation. We'll be for any questions. Do we have any questions? Nope. Thank you very much. Okay. What's the floor? No. no, no, it's not that easy. Not yet, not yet. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Council LaShawn Dock Development Coordination. And um, this request to rezone um, the property um, that is before you would allow for the development of the property with two residential single family um, semi detached uses um, on the site. The lot contains 4,043 square feet. Um, this was this is proposed with one 4,500 square foot structure, which would contain three stories on site. And let me show you the site plan. Um, this is Morgan Street. Let me move it over. So this is Morgan Street. This is the proposed vehicular entrance. So this is the building, and you have unit one here. Unit two is located here. And this is the property line located here. So they are proposing front door entry. The front doors are oriented to Morgan Street. And then each unit contains a two-car um, enclosed garage. And there are no waivers um, with this um, site plan request, this PD request, and I'll show you pictures of the site. I'll go to the zoning atlas first. So this is the property. Um, let me zoom in a little bit. This is the property which is identified um, here in red. It's outlined in red. This is Morgan Street. This is 275, which is to the south. And this site, you can see just directly north is a PD. That's an office use that's there. Um, with the exception of that PD, the remainder of this block is developed with that same use, which is proposed. It's either single family. This is the single family semi-detached, but when you're out on site and you're looking, I have some photos, um, it's single family um, semi-detached. That's the remainder of the block. So this is actually consistent with what um, exists out on site. You have CI zoning and um, some commercial zonings to the west, and then you have further north a couple of PDs and commercial neighborhood zonings. So this is the site on Morgan. This is east of the site. Let me zoom out a little bit because it's not showing the whole photo. There we go. So this is located directly east of the site. 
This also is east of the site. Hold on just a second. I don't think it is. It is east of the site. This is east. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to write it. This is if you're on Pierce looking west to Morgan Street. The units are designed the same, so from the exterior they look the same. This is north of the site. This is the um, PD that I mentioned. This is the view if you're on Morgan Street and you're looking south. So you can see the interstate that's located there and you can see this other development that's here to the south. This is across the street. This is the vacant um, commercial lot that's across the street. The DRC staff has reviewed the request and finds the request consistent. And as I mentioned, there were no waivers with this request. There are site plan modifications to be made between first and second reading. Um, and I'm available if you have any questions. Any questions? Nope. Thank you very much. Thank you, Applicant. Council. <clears throat> Good morning. <laughs> I've been here so long, my girlfriend had a birthday while I've been here, so. <laughs> yeah, it is her birthday, it is her birthday. Um, my name is Joe Gibbons, I've been sworn in, uh, 708 West Ohio Avenue. I'm the applicant and the um, developer of the project. Um, the previous photos that you saw uh, was um, our project as well, this is the final uh, piece of the development. Um, we've previously done 20 units. Uh, this is the property that we had our construction trailer on and um, stored materials and stuff. Um, and uh, it's, it's late. I need to see these. <laughs> um, so it's it's one building, two units, semi-detached. Um, we're proposing zero lot line duplex. Um, each unit has a uh, garage, uh, parking, the front doors are oriented to the, um, to Morgan Street. Um, during the construction, the phase three of my previous development on Pierce Street, we improved um, the alleyway here, which is unusual that we came in and wanted to improve the alley, uh, which allows the um, circular motion of the uh, waste trucks and, and whatnot. This is the proposed um, construction, similar to what uh, we did on the other uh, three phases. We did change them up a little bit, um, modernized them a little bit. We've added some additional windows. Um, we're doing a, a wider deck um, on the second floor here. These are the front doors oriented to the, um, to the street. Uh, the rendering showed the sidewalk going to the driveway. We've, um, during staff meetings, the sidewalk will now continue all the way out and we're gonna rebuild the sidewalk along Morgan Street. Just another rendering. This is the sidewalk I just mentioned that will come out to this new site. There's an existing sidewalk there, but it's in bad shape, so we're gonna be replacing the entire sidewalk. Um, from the alley that we built to the north property line, or to the north property. This is a side rendering. Uh, this is the alley here. Um, the Pier Street building that we com just completed uh, last fall is back here. This is the elevation, uh, the north elevation. Uh, this is the area of the um, existing um, office building. And then the rear of the building, um, got a covered lanai. And uh, this is backing up to the Pier Street uh, property that we just finished. And uh, I guess I'm, Fortunate, I'm asking for kind of a down zoning. I didn't realize this until we had meetings with staff, but I was entitled to build six units and we're requesting to, to build two semi-detached. Um, and the site does not have any trees, but we will be planting trees during the course of construction. I'm available for questions. 
Any questions? No, wait, wait, wait. We have to ask for public comment. Anybody in the public wish to speak on this item? We have to, we have to ask anyway. Anybody online registered? No. Motion. Okay, now can I have a motion to close? Motion to close from Council Member Fernandez. Second. Do we have a second? Second from Council Member Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Council Member Miranda, would you like to read? Are you okay? Are you yeah, I'm fine. No, no, no. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. File number seven, uh, REZ 23-33. Ordinance being presented for first reading. An ordinance rezoning property in Denver City, 1509 North Morgan Street in the city of Tampa, Florida, more particularly described in Section 1 from Zoning District Classification, RM24, Residential Multifamily to PD, Plan Development, Residential Single Family Detached, providing an effective date. Second. We have a motion from Council Member Miranda, second from Council Member Hertak. And uh, this meets every uh, it's uh, compliance. Uh, the purpose of the rezoning will allow better utilization of the land that is considered with a density application R20. Well, I don't even think this meets. I think it's a, it's a done deal here. Yep. All right, roll call vote. And the revision sheet, sir. The revision sheet? The revision sheet, yep. Yes. All right, uh, go ahead now. Okay. Vieira? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Carlson? Hertek? Yes. Clendenin? Yes. Henderson? Yes. Meniscalco? Yes. Motion carried with Carson being absent. Second reading and adoption will be held on June 1st, 2023 at 9.30 a.m. All right, thank you very much. Now we go to- <laughs> Motion to receive a file. No, 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 no. We got something else? No, uh, Council Member Vieira has a walk-on resolution, I believe. <laughs> Would you like to? Yeah, uh, I, I, I sent it out. Does anyone have any questions? Um, no, do we have on it? Yes. Um, do we have I just, oh. I just wanted to say thank you. Um, I have a very close family member mm -hmm. who uh, is a stutterer, and I think it's really fabulous that you mm -hmm. are um, uh, focusing on this week. And I just wanted to say thank you. Yes, ma'am. My pleasure. And our president obviously has dealt with that as well. So thank you. Yes. All right. We have a motion. For this resolution from Councilmember Vieira, is that a second from Councilmember Hertak? Yes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. We'll continue down. Uh, Councilmember Hertak. Councilmember Clendenin. I make a motion to present a commendation to Kathy Bartolotti for her contributions to the City of Tampa, particularly through her involvement as a member and serving as an officer of La Damas del Centro Estoriano. This will be presented off-site at the Centro Estoriano at an upcoming event in June. Second. A very, very good motion to a wonderful person who's been so involved in the community uh, for many years. Uh, motion from Council Member Clendenin, second from Council Member Miranda. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Yes, ma'am. Do you have anything? Motion to, have, motion to go to bed. I don't have anything. <laughs> I don't have anything. All right, Council Member Miranda or Vieira, do you have anything uh, else? Really quick, if I may, um, with the, um, I had to supplement the motion I did at CRA today on um, areas that are without uh, grocery stores uh, for the same um, uh, motion, uh, which is to find that under feasibility, the city and or CRA assisting these areas. And I want to include in there FMA Sulphur Springs since it's not in the CRA, um, but I can at CRA. Yeah, I have to do it here um, to be on October 19th. Second. Motion from Council Member Vieira, second from Council Member Hertek. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Anything else, sir? Um, and then just one really fast, if I may, July 13th of 2023, to have city staff come back on a report on the possibility of making um, um, Ahmedabad, A-H-M-E-D-A-B-A-D -A 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 in India, one of city of Tampa's sister cities. I could go through the history of the city, but I shall not. Uh, I had a request from some in the Indian American community on that, and I make for that motion. Is there a second? Second. Second from Council Member Clendenin. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Thank you, Council. That's it. Council Member Miranda? I got six, but I'll hold them to later. No, no, yeah. please. <laughs> please. Please. <laughs> motion yeah. to receive and file. Motion to receive and file second. all documents. <laughs> uh, motion from Council Member Henderson. Second from Council Member Miranda. All in, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Lisa? I can't sure. believe you're still here. We are adjourned. Are you the sole survivor? She's got a, she's got a flight in five hours.